Hello everyone, welcome to another amazing video. If you enjoy the content, I ask that you subscribe to the channel and turn on the notification bell so you don't miss the upcoming parts and new videos. Now, without further ado, let's get into today's video. Are you ready? Let's go. In a city called Tianfeng, inside a classroom, we find some students desperately trying to awaken a rank A talent. While everyone is talking, one student captures our attention by remaining completely silent, staring at his phone. The other students continue discussing their talents and combat skills. We observe the same student holding his phone, looking a bit disheartened and worried. This is because the inheritance his parents left him is running out, and he may need to sell his house. Despite this, he fears it might not be enough to sustain himself, so he sighs and thinks that the only way might be to enter the magical domain tonight. This boy's name is Zhang Zhe. Ten years ago, he came from the earth to this new world. Zhang Zhe is the name given to him by his adoptive parents. The Zhang couple treated Zhang Zhe as one of their own children. Without them, Zhang Zhe wouldn't be able to survive in this new world. And that's why he is truly grateful to his parents. His father cared for him with great love, his mother provided unwavering support, and his sister loved him deeply. It was a beautiful and perfect family, but all of this was about to change. Twelve years ago, mysterious demon caves arrived in this new world, bringing a new era of suffering, chaos, and fear to the people living there. These caves randomly appear anywhere in the world, releasing demons that bring with them misfortune and destruction wherever they go. Weapons created by humans were completely useless against these demons. Consequently, there was no way to stop them, leading the world into a true hell on Earth. Amidst all this chaos, we see Zhang Zi completely terrified by everything happening right in front of him. Monsters destroying cities and devouring people. A man who was lying down gathers his last bit of strength and shouts for Zhang Zi to flee. This man was Zhang Zi's father, on the brink of death. His father pleads for Zhang Zi to take care of his sister with all his strength and begs again for them to run away. Seeing his father in this situation, Zhang Zi can't contain himself and starts to cry. Zhang Zi and his little sister try to reach their father to help him in some way. However, a gigantic demon is approaching in the direction of their father, who is trapped in the debris. The monster crushes their father before their eyes, leaving Zhang Zi completely desperate. Humans were brutally massacred by demonic beasts for a long time. That was the reality they lived in. The remaining humans, desperate to try and stop this chaos, rushed to the entrances of the magical domain. Upon entering, they discovered that people who entered became stronger than an ordinary human, and even after leaving the magical domain, those who entered still retained their newfound powers. This brought a spark of hope to everyone there, encouraging them to fight for their lives. With positive results, nations began creating magical domain fighters in an attempt to combat demons and restore peace to the world. And it was successful. The international organization known as the Magical Domain Fighters Association was soon established. The school implemented a level system for fighters, ranging from 1 to 5, the first level, the second level, the third level, the fourth level, and the fifth level. To fight high-level demonic beasts, only fifth-level magical fighters are capable of killing them. Among the five fighter classifications, there are seven talent rankings that can be awakened, ranging from rank D to rank SSS. The higher the ranking of their abilities, the greater their power, making it easier to defeat demons. According to the rules, only people with rank A talent can pass the evaluation to become first-level magical domain fighters. Classes had already ended, and it was getting late. As Zhang Zhe left the classroom, he thought that tonight he would need to awaken a rank a talent in any way possible and pass all the evaluations. Upon arriving home, his sister was preparing something special for him as it was his 18th birthday. Looking at the dish his sister made for him, Zhang Zhe smiled and invited her to eat. Apologizing, his sister explained that she wanted to do something special for him since, besides his birthday, it was also the day Zhang Zhe would enter the magical domain to awaken his talent. Unfortunately, the chicken thigh turned into charred coal. Zhang Zhe approached her and mentioned that it seemed she had some problems today. Trying to take care of his sister as much as possible, he scolded her, saying she didn't need to cook every night because he had offered to do it for both of them. He emphasized that his sister's studies were their priority, so she shouldn't waste time on such things. 
Zhang Zi took his sister's plate, removed the burnt part of the chicken, and said that the meat was very tender and delicious. His sister's mouth watered at the thought, and she tried to grab the plate, asking Zhang Zi to leave some for her, making everything right between them. As night fell, his sister mentioned she would go to a friend's house to study. She asked Zhang Zi to be careful when entering the magical domain later. Zhang Zi told his sister that she could go, but should be back before half past nine at night, not to worry him. As soon as his sister left, Zhang Zhe looked at his watch, which warned him that he had only ten seconds left to enter the magical domain. Zhang Zhe prepared himself, thinking that regardless of whether it ended in glory or disaster, he would give it his all. His watch began emitting rays, and a portal opened around him. Upon entering a fairy appeared, welcoming him and stating that she would be his guide. Nervously looking around, Zhang Zhe asked the fairy if this was the testing ground for newcomers. The fairy told Zhang Zhe to choose a name and appearance to use while in the magical domain. Zhang Zhe had already thought about it, and he chose the name Asura and the appearance Masked. While picking the name and appearance, Zhang Zhe thought that his friends had mentioned this was addictive, so he needed to stay alert and protect himself. His fairy guide agreed with Zhang Zhe and used her magic on him, causing him to levitate and suddenly, a new outfit appeared on his body. The fairy's speech informed Zhang Zhe that they were ready to activate his talent. All he had to do was place his hands on the crystal ball in front of him, and his talent would appear automatically. A bit worried, Zhang Zhe placed his hand on the crystal ball thinking that it had to be a rank A. He concentrated as much as he could and shouted for an A to come. A yellow light began to appear inside the crystal, and a huge flash occurred. Suddenly the light disappeared, and a bit of smoke came out of the crystal, leaving Zhang Zhe puzzled about what was really happening. Zhang Zhe asked the fairy if it was over and what his talent was. The fairy, looking at the crystal in astonishment, simply said, E, in a surprised tone. This left Zhang Zhe completely scared, asking the fairy what she meant by A, and urging her to quickly explain what was happening because Zhang Zhe didn't like to feel fear in moments like this. The fairy took a closer look and said that Zhang Zhe had awakened an SSS-ranked talent. This astonished Zhang Zhe, who couldn't believe what he was hearing. He asked the fairy if this was really true or if he was seeing things. The fairy confirmed that the talent Zhang Zhe had awakened was indeed SSS-ranked, legendary. No one in that world had awakened it before. Completely overjoyed, Zhang Zhe said that if his awakened talent were S-ranked, he would already be recommended to a renowned academy with unlimited prospects. However, he awakened an SSS ranked talent. Zhang Zi couldn't even imagine what this could offer him. Finally, Zhang Zi would be able to change his and his sister's lives. The fairy told Zhang Zi that this was the manual explaining his talent. He could read and consult it whenever he wanted. Zhang Zi's talent specifications were zero experience to a thousand, 10 MP consumption, 60 second cooldown effect. After killing your target, you can summon a replica of it. The replica and the original are completely identical, with no time limit, and it can reach a maximum of five levels. Note, level one summoning art can summon 10 replicas. Level two art can summon 30 replicas. Reading this, Zhang Zi thinks that his ability is truly sinister. He pauses for a moment to reflect and considers that if he kills a monster, he can summon it. This means Zhang Zi could create an army of monsters and lead a legion of bosses. This is really exciting. Zhang Zi decides to take a look at his character panel, which reads, Name, Asura, number C24, 751176, HP 100, MP 110, Damage 1 to 10, Speed 10, Attributes, Strength 10, Common people have 10 points. Physique, 10. Common people have 10 points. Spirit, 11. Common people have 10 points. Agility, 10. Common people have 10 points. Points that can be allocated to attributes, 0. Skill, level 1. SSS summoning art. Overall rating, beginner novice. Zhang Zhe wonders why spirit is one point higher than that of other people. He imagines it might be because he came from another world. His fairy guide tells Zhang Zhe that he can officially enter the magical domain. The fairy wishes Zhang Zhe good luck. Then, the space around Zhang Zhe begins to change, 
and a large arena appears where several people are gathered. A man and a woman call all the beginners, as they are instructors and responsible for explaining the theoretical part of the magical domain. Zhang Zi is surprised by the number of people present with him, but deep down, he is happy to finally be in the real magical domain. There is a small commotion among the people, and in the midst of them, a man announces that he awakened an A-ranked talent, the Celestial Fist. Some people comment on this, expressing envy for the man who truly awakened an A-ranked talent. The other guy next to him says that his talent rating is only B, but he is already happy with that. All of this surprises Zhang Zhe because his talent is SSS ranked. Another student falls to the ground completely devastated and crying because his talent is only ranked D. His friend tries to cheer him up, but suddenly, one of the instructors interrupts everyone, telling them to form a line so they can get their weapons. Once everyone is in line, the instructors begin explaining that the magical domain is not just a game. When you die there, you are really dead. The instructor emphasizes that he has seen many enter thinking it would be fun and a game, and all these people met a tragic end. The instructor says it's a lawless battlefield, so they must be careful and protect themselves from beasts and other people. Liars and murderers are everywhere there, so don't trust anyone easily. The other instructor adds that everyone should remember that. To leave the magical domain, they should return to this same place, the altar, as only with the altar could they return home. After the explanation, they began to distribute the weapons, and it finally came to Zhang Zi's turn. The instructor says that Zhang Zi needs to register before choosing his weapon. So, she asks about his talent and ranking. Zhang Zi answers that he is ranked D. The people behind him start laughing. Zhang Zi thinks that there are many people there, so he hid his true ranking. People are cruel and have evil hearts. No matter the strength of your talent, you still run the risk of being stabbed in the back. So Zhang Zi chose to keep a low profile until he really becomes a fighter. While Zhang Zi chooses his weapon, the other men in line start mocking him. The instructor offers a long wooden bow with the following specifications. Class D, damage 10 to 20, no special effects, durability 100 out of 100. The instructor says that this bow would be good for Zhang Zi since his attack is not particularly strong. At least the bow would keep him safe due to its long range. Before Zhang Zhe leaves, the instructor says that cautious people always live longer. After finishing the distribution of weapons, the instructor sighs with relief as it has come to an end, feeling quite tired. The instructor approaches her and asks how many people awakened A-ranked talents or higher. After analyzing the list, the instructor says that only three of them were able to awaken an A-ranked talent or above. She emphasizes that each time the newcomers get worse than the previous ones. Meanwhile, the newcomers are enthusiastically heading for their first hunt. Someone is shooting at a target, and as the instructor looks, she sees Zhang Zi practicing alone. At that moment, Zhang Zi thinks that a bow is indeed more challenging to use than he imagined, as he has shot numerous times at the target and hit only once. Zhang Zi thinks that in a real fight, he couldn't afford to miss so many times and still doesn't have a creature to summon. Therefore, Zhang Zi believes he shouldn't fight recklessly. Zhang Zi thinks he needs to improve his aim, move quickly, and find the best opportunity to defeat a monster and use his talent. As the hours pass, the pile of arrows increases. Zhang Zi remains completely focused and shoots another arrow, hitting the center of the target precisely. This makes Zhang Zi level up to 4 as an archer. His current accuracy is 80%, and his hand is completely injured from so much training. Zhang Zi puts on his hood and mask, deciding it's time to put everything he trained into practice. He advances into the forest, where there are various monsters scattered everywhere. A brief explanation about magic demons. First floor of magic demons, we can find the violent rabbit, which has high speed, high agility, and low defense. The lava turtle, with high defense, high HP, and low speed. And finally, the boss of the first floor, the dark wolf, with the ability Shadow Claw, unleashing a combo of five attacks against the target, causing burns and bleeding. Wheelis Shang Zi is on his way. The other participants are running desperately, asking for help as they have encountered a lava turtle. The turtle attacks the two participants, who fall before it. Just as the turtle is about to deliver its final blow, an arrow hits its head, causing the turtle to stop the attack and look at Zhang Zi, who was standing with open arms. 
Zhang Zhe said the turtle was adorable and wanted to be its friend. The turtle apparently did not appreciate that and looked enraged at Zhang Zhe, who realized something was wrong. The turtle starts running after Zhang Zhe, who runs away screaming. Zhang Zhe says it's very scary, but suddenly he spots the altar and runs straight to it. When he gets close, the altar towers identify the turtle as a threat and unleash a beam that deals a critical damage of 191 points to the turtle. The turtle has 10 life points left, and Zhang Zhe takes this opportunity to launch his arrows at the turtle, which is already falling to the ground, defeating the monster that begins to transform into energy and turns into a blue orb. This blue orb is a low-grade demon soul orb. Zhang Zhe thinks that his idea of using the altar's defense worked perfectly. Quick explanation. The guide of the magic demon. After the monsters in the magic domain die, there is a chance to drop a demon soul orb. The demon soul orbs are classified as low-grade common and high-grade. The color of the demon soul orb represents its attributes. Red represents strength. Green represents physique. Blue represents spirit. Yellow represents agility. Absorbing corresponding demon soul orbs will increase attributes to a certain level. Low-grade demon soul orbs will increase by 0 0.01 points, common orbs will increase by 0 0.1 points, and high-grade orbs will increase by 1 point. Zhang Zhe thinks that since the low-grade demon soul orb only increases attributes by 0 0.01 points, he will save it for now, as this orb can be sold for about a thousand yuan. The system notifies Zhang Zi that he defeated a lava turtle, and now he can summon a replica. The system asks Zhang Zi if he wants to summon it, and Zhang Zi chooses to summon the turtle to experience his talent. A portal opens in front of him, and the turtle appears before his eyes. Zhang Zi is extremely happy with his talent, saying that he finally summoned his first beast while touching the turtle on its face. Zhang Zi smiles satisfied with what he just did and can't contain himself, happily hugging the turtle. Meanwhile, deeper into the forest, other participants are getting beaten up by a violent rabbit. One of the participants asks Ming to stay back. Ming is lying on the ground with his face bleeding after the punch he took from the rabbit. Ming complains about the pain he's feeling, while his companion is dismayed that even with three of them, they can't defeat the rabbit in front of them. The day was coming to an end and they were still fighting, but suddenly they hear a noise and look back to check what it could be. As soon as they see a lava turtle approaching them, everyone is startled because now they would have to deal with two monsters and were surrounded. As the turtle gets closer to the three, they notice something strange on the turtle. Once they realize that there is a person mounted on the turtle, they are astonished. Zhang Zhe smiles and asks if they are okay. Ming questions why the turtle isn't attacking Zhang Zhe, as all the monsters in the magic domain are extremely aggressive. The other two participants wonder if it's really possible to tame a monster like that and express envy for Zhang Zi. Ming says there's nothing to envy. It's straightforward to solve. They just need to tame that violent rabbit, and when the time comes, Ming will climb on the rabbit's back and have it carry him through the forest. Even before Ming finishes speaking, the rabbit beats him up again. His two friends step forward and ask Ming to stay behind while they fight the rabbit. Ming is crying again saying that the rabbit has no martial ethics. Ming's friends try in every way to catch the rabbit, but the rabbit is very fast and manages to dodge all the blows. One of the blows ended up hurting the rabbit, which became extremely angry, and its body changed quickly, growing muscles, its eyes turning red, and its teeth sharper than ever. This was the berserker mode of the rabbit. Ming says that now they're screwed. The rabbit got mad. Still, his friends try to control the situation saying not to fear because the rabbit only has half of its life left. So, if the three combine their attacks at the same time, they could defeat the rabbit. But suddenly, two more rabbits appear behind the enraged rabbit, leaving the three surprised at what was happening there. Meanwhile, a little distant from there, Zhang Zhe was walking with his turtle, watching the sunset and saying how beautiful and relaxing it is. A little behind Zhang Zhe, we see three people running desperately, screaming and saying they were going to die. Yes, these people were Ming and his friends, who flew past Zhang Zhe, who didn't understand what was happening. As they ran in front of Zhang Zhe, one of them calls Zhang Zhe Master Splinter and tells him not to stand still there. Ming emphasizes that if Zhang Zhe stays there, he could end up dead. Zhang Zhe looks at all of this without understanding anything and decides to see what the three were saying. As Zhang Zhe looks back, 
he sees the three rabbits running furiously towards him. This terrifies Zhang Ze. One of the rabbits tries to hit Zhang Ze, but he manages to dodge quickly and asks the turtle to use its tail to attack the rabbits. The turtle obeys and strikes all three rabbits at once, while Zhang Ze uses his arrows to attack. Zhang Ze realizes that his damage is not as high as that of the beasts attacking him, and even though the turtle is very strong with its defense, it is still quite slow. This means that the turtle would not withstand the various attacks of the three rabbits for long. Zhang Ze had to do something to resolve this quickly, or the worst could happen. Zhang Ze decides to give his best, while the turtle strikes the three rabbits again. Zhang Ze jumps and shoots several arrows at just one of the rabbits, defeating one of them which starts to transform into energy. The turtle continues to bravely attack all the rabbits. Even though it is close to being defeated, Zhang Zi, seeing this, tries to motivate his turtle and says that it is doing very well. He asks it to hold on just a little longer. The turtle hits one of the rabbits and throws it into the air. Zhang Zi takes advantage and again shoots several arrows, finishing off another rabbit. While Zhang Ze was focusing on the rabbit he just defeated, the last rabbit jumps and punches the turtle in the head. This makes Zhang Ze very angry. Zhang Ze grabs his bow and shouts that he wouldn't let his first beast die. He shoots several times against the last rabbit. While Zhang Ze was fighting the rabbit, he tells his turtle to return to the matrix so that it doesn't die there. The turtle lowers its head for a moment and closes its eyes. Suddenly the turtle rises again, leveling up from one to two. The system shows that now the turtle is at level 2 out of 5, experience 1 out of 30, life 400, damage 80 to 100, defense 70, no skill. This leaves Zhang Ze a little shocked. The turtle quickly strikes the last rabbit, defeating it quickly. This gives Zhang Ze three more orbs. Zhang Ze happily shouts that they finally won. The system notifies Zhang Ze. Now that you have defeated three violent rabbits, you can summon three replicas. Do you want to summon them now? Zhang Ze, with a smile on his face, summons the three rabbits again. A portal opens in front of him, and the three rabbits appear before him. Zhang Ze is extremely excited about what he has just achieved. Now, Zhang Ze has a lava turtle and three violent rabbits under his control. The night passes, and the day begins to dawn. The system notifies Zhang Ze that he received a message. Upon opening the message, it said that all students should gather at the altar for an important announcement. Zhang Zi wonders what all this urgency could be. Everyone is already at the altar. A man begins to say that it has been a few days, so everyone should be familiar with the first floor. However, the boss of the first floor is something different that beginners wouldn't be able to defeat easily. This man says that for this reason, the academy invited a fighter from the magic domain. This woman would lead everyone so that they could defeat the boss of the first floor and open the doors to the second floor. The man asks everyone to applaud the fighter present. The fighter introduces herself, saying that her name is Liu Yueying, and her name in the magic domain is Yueying. The newcomers begin to comment on Yueying, saying that she was one of the people who awakened an s rank talent and was recommended to the prestigious Qing Martial Arts Academy. The newcomers say that she is indeed very talented, Yu Ying begins to explain that the boss of the first floor, the Dark Wolf, is extremely difficult to deal with. Thus Yu Ying hopes that no one underestimates it. She emphasizes that as soon as they go on the hunt, everyone there will have to follow her orders. Should anyone wish to act on their own, they will face severe punishments. After Yu Ying finishes speaking, the system of everyone shows an invitation from Yu Ying for them to join her team. The system displays that her name is Yue Ying, number C2475, 10, 12, name, life, MP, damage, and speed, all are unidentified. Attributes, strength, physique, spirit, agility, points that can be allocated to attributes, all are unidentified. Overall evaluation, experienced swordsman. Zhang Zhe seeing this begins to think that all key information is restricted. This makes Zhang Zhe think that she might be really strong. Zhang Zi wonders if she is stronger than all of his summoned beasts. Zhang Zi thinks that this would be a good test for him to try to defeat the Dark Wolf with his summons. After a few hours, everyone gathers in the forest. As everyone walks, Zhang Zi thinks that for now he should hide his real talent and not summon his beasts, because that could scare the other participants present. Suddenly, three beasts appear. 
Two of them were violent rabbits, and one was a lava turtle. A novice girl is astonished and tells everyone to get ready to attack, but Yueying calmly takes her sword and goes after the three beasts, defeating them all quickly. This leaves the other participants amazed at Yueying's incredible strength. With just one sword, she was able to defeat all of them at once. The novices wonder if this is the power of a person who awakened an S-rank talent. After Yueying defeats all the beasts there, she turns to the participants as if it's nothing and tells them not to stand still there because they should keep moving forward. Zhang Zhe, after witnessing such a feat, thinks that Yueying is really amazing. Zhang Zhe thinks that maybe it would be better not to try to steal her boss. Night falls, and on top of a mountain, we hear a wolf's howl. The participants hear this and stay alert. A portal opens. Yueying explains that this portal is called the checkpoint and warns that the wolf is about to appear. Yueying emphasizes that if the newcomers don't want to die, they must listen carefully to the orders given to them. Yueying tells everyone that they should always keep a safe distance and not try to attack alone. After Yueying's explanation, the wolf starts coming out of the portal. Yueying is on high alert and prepares for the fight. The newcomers behind her are nervous about everything that is happening. Finally, the dark wolf appears before them, and with the wolf comes a heavy mist that impairs the participants' vision. Yue Ying, at the forefront of everyone, remains calm and focused. The wolf quickly begins to move alongside Yue Ying, running from side to side with impressive speed. The novices are scared because they can't even see the dark wolf, let alone fight it. The novices are dismayed by the difficulty of the first floor, trying to imagine how the next floors would be. The wolf finally makes its first attack, trying to hit Yue Ying, who easily dodges it. Taking advantage of the wolf's low guard, Yue Ying prepares to counterattack, smoothly turning her body. Yue Ying applies several consecutive blows to the dark wolf, causing significant damage to the wolf, which falls to the ground already defeated. The novices still don't understand how it ended so quickly, but they are happy to have won. One of the novice girls says that she managed to see what happened and explains that this is Yue Ying's S-rank talent, the light cut. Zhang Ze, upon hearing this, wastes no time and immediately opens his system to check what this move called Light Cut would be. The system shows that the move is called Light Cut, S rank, level 1, 378 experience, consumption, 10 MP cooldown 60 seconds, effect attacks the target with fencing skill. Each damage cut is doubled. The last cut will use the doubled effects as a base to release a critical strike and cause immense damage. Note, level 1. Light Cut releases three consecutive cuts against the target, Level 2 releases five consecutive cuts against the target, Level 3 releases ten consecutive cuts against the target, Level 4 releases twenty consecutive cuts against the target, Level 5 releases fifty consecutive cuts against the target. Yue Ying asks if everyone there had the key to move on to the next floor. The novices respond affirmatively and thank Yue Ying for her feat. Yue Ying opens her system in the chat channel and explains to her team friends that she was helping the novices pass through the first floor, but was already returning to the fifth floor to assist her team. Her team members say, it's okay, and will wait for her to move forward and face the boss of the fifth floor, as Yue Ying was the team's main damage dealer. Yue Ying disconnects from the system and informs the novices that they have to pass through the door as soon as possible because the boss would regenerate in an hour. Yue Ying says her job there is done, she will return to the fifth floor to help her main team defeat the boss of the fifth floor again. The novice notices something strange and asks Yue Ying to look back. Curious, Yue Ying turns around to see what was happening. The portal begins to behave differently. Yue Ying identifies this and realizes that it means the boss has already regenerated. Yue Ying is confused because it hadn't been an hour since the Dark Wolf was defeated. But Yue Ying begins to feel a murderous aura, something unusual for the dark wolf. Then, another wolf appears, but this is a different wolf, belonging to the elite of the dark wolves. The novices are scared by this and start questioning how it could look like an elite boss. The novice tries to reassure the other novices, saying that Yue Ying was there to protect them. Yue Ying tells everyone to run away, because if they stay there, they will only hinder the fight. While everyone is running away, Zhang Zhe turns around and looks at Yue Ying, starting to wonder if Yue Ying would really be fine, as it was an elite boss. 
Yueying is a bit apprehensive because an elite boss is equivalent to five common bosses. Yueying thinks that because the boss is from the first floor, she probably can handle it. Yueying thinks that the first thing to do is to delay the elite dark wolf so that all the novice players can get out of there. The wolf quickly jumps and tries to hit Yueying, who dodges its attack and again applies her light cut move to the elite dark wolf. This time, her attack did not cause significant damage to the wolf, making Yueying wonder about the defense of this elite wolf. The wolf touches the ground and quickly turns to Yueying, advancing towards her again with incredible speed. This time Yueying can't dodge enough, and the wolf's attack ends up injuring Yueying, causing cuts and bleeding throughout her body. The system appears and notifies Yueying. You are bleeding. 115 points of life have been lost due to bleeding. Every 10 seconds, 1% of your total life will decrease. If the bleeding continues, you will bleed to death. Yue Ying is frightened by the speed of the elite wolf. Even though she tries to dodge in every way, she was still wounded by the wolf. Yue Ying thinks that she cannot admit defeat there, so she tries to attack the wolf again, but the wolf dodges her attack and stands right in front of her. The wolf starts moving quickly and attacks Yue Ying again, hitting her once more. This time, the attack was accurate and threw Yue Ying to the ground, wounded and defenseless. The wolf prepares for its final blow. Yue Ying just looks at this situation without the strength to defend herself from this attack. However, suddenly, some arrows hit the wolf, causing it to stop the attack and focus on Zhang Ze, who manages to save Yue Ying. Zhang Ze starts waving his arms and, calling the wolf a little puppy, asks it to come to Zhang Ze. Yue Ying just looks at all this without understanding very well what is happening there. Yue Ying lowers her gaze and remembers that Zhang Ze was among the novices. Yue Ying wonders what he was doing there, and why he didn't run with the other novices when he had the opportunity. The wolf tries to bite Zhang Ze, but he easily dodges, making it seem like a game and mocking the wolf that just missed the attack. Yue Ying tries to call Zhang Ze with her shaky voice, and tells Zhang Ze not to provoke the elite wolf and to get out of there as quickly as possible, because Zhang Ze wouldn't be able to defeat the elite dark wolf. However, Zhang Zi continues to draw the attention of the wolf to himself while moving away from Yue Ying, who is lying on the ground without understanding why Zhang Zi, a novice, is doing this. He will end up dying if he continues like this. Zhang Zi, who is running from the wolf, thinks that the wolf still has half of its life, and facing it would be suicide. But Zhang Zi couldn't just stand there doing nothing while watching Yue Ying in that situation, so he had to do something to make the wolf stop attacking Yue Ying. While running, Zhang Zi thinks that he can't die there because he has to take care of and protect his little sister. He needs to find an open area so that his summoned beasts can have some advantage over the wolf, but Zhang Zi is almost out of energy. From running so much because the wolf is extremely fast, the wolf finally catches up to Zhang Zi, and as it jumps to attack him, Zhang Zi realizes in time and, with a quick move, dodges the wolf's attack, shouting for his beasts to appear. A portal opens again, and his summonings come out standing between Zhang Zhe and the wolf. Yue Ying, still lying on the ground, begins to think that this is absurd, a novice wanting to defeat an elite wolf. Yue Ying thinks that she needs to do something immediately to save him, so she begins to get up and tries to stop the bleeding while thinking about Zhang Zhe, asking him to hold on a little longer. Suddenly a woman arrives and uses her green blessing power, starting to heal Yue Ying. When Yue Ying turns around, she sees that it's the little princess who is helping. Yue Ying asks her how she got there. Suddenly the rest of her team appears. The little princess says that everyone came. Yue Ying's teammates say that what she did was complete madness because you should not face an elite monster alone. She took a great risk doing that. They emphasize that even if the monster is from the first floor, it's still not something Yue Ying could defeat alone. Yue Ying looks away a bit upset with what happened, and apologizes to everyone, saying, I thought I could handle it alone. Another member of her team interrupts the conversation and asks where the wolf went. Yue Ying panics, remembering that the dark wolf was after a simple novice. Yue Ying shouts for them to hurry and save him. The members don't understand how a novice attracted the wolf to himself. Meanwhile, Zhang Zhe was facing the wolf with all his summonings. Zhang Zhe thinks that, Although the wolf is very fast when surrounded by three violent rabbits, the wolf's movements would be restricted. 
Additionally, this helps the turtle, which is very slow, to land a fierce attack on the wolf. Nevertheless, the wolf is still very strong and quickly counterattacks, causing damage to all summoned beasts. Seeing this, Zhang Zhe realizes that the wolf's damage is extremely high. Zhang Zhe needs to do something quickly so that his summonings don't die during the battle. One of the violent rabbits also reaches level 2. This leaves Zhang Zhe very satisfied. After seeing this, Zhang Zhe devises a fighting strategy and orders his summonings to do exactly what he was commanding. Then, Zhang Zhe orders them to surround the wolf, while the turtle holds the wolf's attack. Once the wolf is surrounded, Zhang Zhe shouts for all the violent rabbits to enter berserker mode, but the fight drags on and one rabbit is killed. Shortly after another rabbit is killed, seeing this, Zhang Zhe becomes furious because they had been fighting for a long time and the wolf wouldn't die at all. Zhang Zhe thinks that if he doesn't kill the elite wolf soon, it will become a one-man army. Zhang Zhe orders his turtle to attack with all its strength and shouts for the wolf to die. The turtle hits the elite wolf head-on, finally defeating it. Zhang Zhe sighs in relief and thinks that this was extremely dangerous. Only two beasts and little life remain for Zhang Zhe. As soon as the wolf dies, it drops some items, namely, Common Grade 4 Demon Soul Orb, Wolf Tooth Necklace 1, Wolf Bone Dagger 1. Zhang Zhe, seeing this, thinks that it was expected from an elite wolf. Zhang Zhe thinks he will keep the Wolf Tooth Necklace, but the Wolf Bone Dagger isn't very suitable for him. Although the dagger deals good damage, Zhang Zhe doesn't like melee combat, so it wouldn't be as useful for him. The system shows that the Wolf Bone Dagger has the following specifications. Grade C, damage 50 to 90, no special effects, durability 100 out of 100. The system also shows that the necklace has Grade C, Spirit plus 0.5, no special effects, durability 100 out of 100. Zhang Zhe decides to sell the dagger so he can go back and use the money to pay for his sister's treatment. Zhang Zhe gets up, pats the head of the last violent rabbit, and thinks that, although he had two losses, it was necessary for him to capture the elite dark wolf. Then, Zhang Zhe looks forward and summons his new toy, the elite dark wolf. A huge portal opens again, and the wolf appears. The system shows that the wolf has the following data. Level 1 of 5, experience 1 out of 10, life 3000, damage 260 to 380, defense 1500, skill shadow claw. Zhang Zhe, seeing this, is extremely happy because its attributes are absolutely incredible. Zhang Zhe thinks that the existence of this wolf on the first floor is certainly a miracle. Night falls again and Zhang Zhe decides to go back since he still has classes in the morning. After some time, the little princess finds something and notifies her entire team. Finally, they reached where the battle between Zhang Zhe and the elite dark wolf took place. Analyzing the ground, they see several marks left by the fierce fight. They definitely know the novice was around. One of them goes searching but quickly returns, saying that they found nothing. Another member says there isn't much they can do. After all, the boy was just a novice. There's no way he could have survived that. He emphasizes that the novice was able to sacrifice his own life to save another person, showing a kind and brave heart. After hearing this, Yueying hangs her head in thought. Yueying simply starts walking and says that she will personally go to the school to find Professor Liu Wei. Certainly, he is the novice's teacher, so if something happened, he will know how to answer. While leaving, Yueying blamed herself for all this, thinking that if the novice really was killed there, the blame was all hers. Zhang Zhe was already at his home, and apparently, today was a great day, because Zhang Zhe managed to gather several orbs to sell on the trading website. Zhang Zhe looks at the system and sees that he has collected 61 low-grade demon soul orbs and 25 common-grade demon soul orbs. Zhang Zhe decides to take one of his strength orbs and consume it to increase his strength a bit. Zhang Zhe thinks that, as the magical domain guide says, if his strength increases there, it will also increase in his real life. Zhang Zhe decides that he will test this tomorrow in the school gym. The next day, as soon as Zhang Zhe wakes up, his sister is already finishing setting the table for breakfast. She asks Zhang Zhe to go wash up while she finishes everything. Zhang Zhe tells his sister that he asked her not to spend her time cooking because he could do it. But his sister, smiling, replies that it's just breakfast, no problem. While Zhang Zhe brushes his teeth, he thinks that his sister's artificial kidney was depleting. Zhang Zi needed to pay the rent as soon as possible. 
He also wonders if he should tell his sister that his awakened talent is SSS rank. But as soon as he comes out of the bathroom, he thinks it's better not to say anything to avoid worrying his sister. While Zhang Ze is drying his face, his sister notices that he came home late last night. She imagines that he didn't awaken such a good talent. So, to protect her brother, she tells Zhang Ze that the magical domain is very dangerous and says that he doesn't need to go anymore because she has an idea to pay the rent. Zhang Ze is curious about this and asks his sister what that idea would be. His sister simply says that she has a plan for it. Zhang Zi finishes his coffee and heads to school, but before leaving, he tells his sister that at her age, she should focus more on studying and not worry about rent. His sister bids him farewell and asks him to be careful at school. In the fifth building, students are discussing their awakened talents. One of them mentions only getting a D-rank talent, while his friend responds that he got a B-rank talent. Meanwhile, Zhang Zhe quietly walks past without drawing attention. While the students chat, Zhang Zhe sits down and takes out his phone again to check his sales. Upon opening his app, he realizes that all the items have been sold. The total sales amount to 198,000 for Zhang Zhe. He decides to withdraw this money and plans to get more orbs when he returns to the magical domain later today. The money he earned is almost enough to buy the kidney for his sister. However, Suddenly, the teacher asks everyone to be quiet and inquires if everyone is present. The students notice that Yue Ying is right in front of them. The students start commenting on her, praising her beauty, but Professor Liu Wei interrupts them and mentions an unexpected event during the intense battle against the first floor boss. Professor Liu Wei asks who helped Yue Ying attract the wolf that day and requests the person to stand up, as Yue Ying would like to express her gratitude personally. The students begin to wonder who could have done such a thing, while Zhang Zi simply thinks that he doesn't need thanks because he doesn't want to expose himself in front of everyone. As no one in the classroom speaks up, Professor Liu Wei tells Yue Ying that the person who helped her probably isn't from this class. Yue Ying agrees and asks the teacher to inform her immediately if he learns anything. Professor Liu Wei agrees and suggests that Yue Ying should return to her classroom for now. While the two talked outside the classroom, students speculated about the hero who saved Yue Ying. One student near Zhang Zhe says he knows who saved her. Worried, Zhang Zhe tries to disguise it and asks who his classmate was, saying that while all the novices were running, one student stayed behind, and if he remembers correctly, that novice's name was Asura. Zhang Zhe tries to navigate the situation by asking if he is sure, because Asura might have just gotten nervous and run the other way. His classmate says to forget about it and invites Zhang Zhe to hunt some monsters tonight since he had already invited two girls. Zhang Zhe smiles and says he can't go because he has to work at the martial arts salon. His classmate notices something and asks Zhang Zhe if his sister needs money again. Zhang Zhe says yes but assures that everything is fine because he is taking care of it. His classmate is reassured and says it's okay, suggesting that if Zhang Zhe enters the magical domain tonight, he should look for him. His name in the magical domain is Chubby Hunk. Classes come to an end, and Zhang Zi goes to the gym to work. While cleaning, Zhang Zi thinks that if he can sell a few more orbs, he probably won't need to work there anymore. While Zhang Zi was cleaning, a group of people was looking at someone named Zheng. Everyone was praising him because Zheng had just lifted 507 caddies. Seven caddies more than required to be admitted to the prestigious Qing Martial Arts Academy. Moreover, Zheng's awakened talent is ranked A, so his future was almost certain. Zheng says that this is nothing yet, as there are many stronger people out there. His friend says he's being too modest, except for the goddess Yue Ying. Zheng was the strongest there, and he dares not compare himself to the goddess Yue Ying. Zheng says she was blessed by the gods with an S-rank talent and was recommended for admission to the prestigious academy. At the Qing Martial Arts Academy, Zheng emphasizes that he would be happy to have half of Yue Ying's strength. Once everyone leaves, Zhang Zi is alone in the room, wondering if he is really strong. Zhang Zi punched the machine, scoring 497 points, leaving him very pleased. Even when he trained every day before, his strength never exceeded 390. Zhang Zi thinks that absorbing only one high-quality orb has already brought such a significant breakthrough, making him very excited. So, Zhang Zi decides that he will definitely enter the magical domain tonight. 
Suddenly a message arrives on his phone from his sister, saying that she would be going out again to study at a friend's house and would return late. She asked her brother to prepare dinner tonight. This leaves Zhang Ze a bit intrigued, thinking that his sister has been doing this every night, but for now, he doesn't have time to investigate. The most important thing at the moment is to quickly go to the magical domain and obtain more demon soul orbs. Again, we are in the arena, where several students are gathered. Zhang Zi opens the system, which shows that he currently has three beasts. The elite dark wolf, a lava turtle, and a violent rabbit. He has seven empty slots for new beasts. Zhang Zi thinks that it's not a good idea to go directly to the second floor, as it is quite dangerous. First, he should master the ten beasts on the first floor. So, Zhang Zi begins his hunt and calls his little friend to accompany him, the elite dark wolf. Zhang Zi, all happy next to his wolf, thinks that with the dark wolf's damage, he will definitely be able to defeat any monster on the first floor. But what he really wants is more lava turtles. The first lava turtle is found, and they start to fight. Zhang Zi sends his wolf to attack while he stays back with his bow and arrows. Quickly, he defeats several monsters one after another, and about an hour later, he already has an army of monsters at his command. Finally, he is ready to move on to the second floor. Suddenly, he hears some screams for help. Upon closer inspection, it's some rookies running out of a portal, and one of these rookies is his classmate Wang Yang, or if you prefer, the chubby hunk. As Yang ran, he shouted to the older brothers, chiefs, not to kill them, for they were just novices. Thus, there was nothing of value with them. However, the two brothers continued to chase them, saying that they already knew they were novices and also knew there was nothing of value with them. Yet the brothers wanted to kidnap them and ask for money from their closest relatives in the real world. Meanwhile, Zhang remained hidden, watching all this and thinking, once someone's identity is exposed in the magical realm, criminals can take advantage of their fake identities to kidnap them. Through blackmail, it's hard to discover who these guys really are, even if the police are called. When this happens, it's difficult to rescue the hostages, even after the ransom is paid, as the criminals still choose to kill them to keep their identities hidden. Yang screamed, saying his family was poor and had no money. Thus, he pleaded for the bandits to leave him alone. However, the bandits didn't care, thinking Yang was just lying to them. As a few hours before, Yang was with two girls and had said his family owned a luxury house and expensive cars. Then, one of the bandits decided to use one of his powers, and all the ground below Yang turned into quicksand. The three found themselves trapped, wondering which talent ability this could be. Suddenly Yang felt something on his neck. It was one of the bandits who, with an axe in his hand, told Yang to give up his parents' contact, or he would die right there. But Yang, even though terrified, said in a trembling voice that he would not give them any contact. The bandit began to laugh and said it's always the same story. Everyone is brave until they lose a hand. Then they become very obedient. Then he raised his axe, but out of nowhere, an arrow came in his direction and hit his arm, preventing him from doing anything. The bandit turned around and shouted that there was a hidden archer around. However, the bandit was extremely furious and asked who dared to attack him from behind. Thus, Zhang appeared next to a tree. The system showed his name as Asura. He looked directly at them and asked how a bunch of trash like them dared to commit such a terrible act. Another bandit, as soon as he noticed Zhang's presence, warned the others and started running towards him. Then, Zhang began to run. The leader of the bandits went into the woods after Zhang. He said Yang and his friends would be stuck there for an hour, so they had time to catch Zhang, as he wanted to cut him into pieces. Zhang kept running while the bandits chased him, until finally, Zhang arrived where he really wanted. A place where the terrain is surrounded by three mountains and has only one exit. Zhang continued running into that path. But suddenly, Zhang stopped and turned to the bandits who were laughing at him. For Zhang had run into a dead end and now was trapped with no way to escape. The bandits began to smile and say that just killing him was a waste of time. First, they should take everything he has. The leader said for his group to count themselves as he wanted to savor the torture. Zhang looked at them and asked if killing people in the magical realm prevents people from the outside from finding out. The leader of the bandits started walking towards Zhang and told him to relax as no one would know he was going to die there. Zhang crouched down and thanked them for clearing up that doubt he had. Then, energy began to emanate from his hand. Zhang summoned his monsters and asked them to give a warm welcome to the guests. Then, several circles on the ground started to appear around the bandits, and in a few seconds, an army of monsters appeared and surrounded them. 
The leader of the bandits was astonished by this, wondering how all these beasts appeared out of nowhere and all together. The thieves said there were too many beasts, and the terrain they were on put them at a complete disadvantage. Then the leader yells for everyone to run away, but as soon as they start running, a dense fog begins to cover the path. And in the midst of this fog, only a pair of eyes shining with blue flames appear. Then, the wolf emerges from the mist. They begin to tremble, for it was not just any dark wolf, but an elite dark wolf. Zhang from behind them loudly says, as they themselves had said before, no one will know that he killed everyone here. Then, Zhang orders his beasts to kill everyone there. The bandits start to run and scream in desperation, but it's too late. The dark wolf begins its attack, wounding several of the bandits quickly. The lava turtles also begin to attack, one by one, mercilessly. And lastly, the violent rabbits surround the leader of the bandits, and without mercy, quickly finish him off. In a few seconds, several bodies were lying on the ground everywhere, and among them, there was only Jiang. Standing, Zhang says that they had committed various crimes and terrible things, and therefore, did not deserve to live. Zhang takes advantage, and starts to collect the items the bandits had, as there was much of value there. Zhang finds a letter, and the system window opens and notifies that this item is the Berserker Talisman Grade C. The special effect is to allow a person, within three meters, to enter rage mode. The durability is 100 seconds and it can be used only once. Zhang thinks this could be very useful in the future, so he decides to keep it. Zhang starts to walk and says that it's enough playing around. It's time to head to the second floor. Then he goes to the portal, but before he could enter, Yang and his friends come running, calling him hero. Yang says he knew he was all right, and thanks to the help Zhang had given them before, everyone there was fine. One of the girls, smiling, says she wanted to thank him personally, for he had saved their lives. Yang, crying, grabs Zhang's hand and says that kind-hearted heroes like him are very rare nowadays. Then, Yang offers a million yuans as a reward, and asks if that was enough. But Zhang responds that he doesn't need to pay him anything, for he just didn't want to see those trash harming anyone. Zhang asks them to be more careful next time, but in reality, Zhang was thinking that Yang really was very wealthy. However, if Zhang accepted that money, his identity would be revealed as soon as the transfer was made to him, so it's better to leave it as it is. Zhang says goodbye and starts to enter the portal. Meanwhile, Yang thought he was a hero. One of the girls was in love with him, thinking he was very handsome. Finally, we are at the entrance of the magical realm, second floor. Zhang, seeing this, thinks he could never have imagined that the second floor of the magical realm would be a cavity. Zhang was right in the middle of the arena, surrounded by other people who were shouting to form teams, but Zhang remained silent. While people were still shouting trying to form teams, Zhang starts to read a book and thinks it's still better for him to continue alone. The book shows that the monsters on this floor are poisonous spider, skilled in the use of its venomous fangs, spits threads to make webs. Once caught in the spider web, it's impossible to move for a period of time. Vampire bat, although its damage is not high, it comes and goes like a shadow and can suck blood to recover its life. The boss of this floor is the Sky Devourer Frog, has a huge constitution, with hard skin and thick flesh. Common attacks tend not to damage it. Skills, thunder, can force a target, within a certain distance, into a stunned mode and, simultaneously, cause damage. Zhang was walking through a cave while reading his book and thinks that, apparently, the monsters on the second floor are relatively stronger than those on the first floor. Zhang was distracted reading the book, and a venomous spider web was very close to his head, but he quickly realizes and manages to dodge it. As soon as he looks up, he sees a poisonous spider. It was ready to attack him, but Zhang quickly summons his beasts again, and two violent rabbits come out of the portal and charge at the spider. But the spider quickly throws its web at one of the rabbits, immobilizing it. Then, the spider uses its venom on the rabbit, which begins to inflict damage rapidly. Seeing this, Zhang thinks that the spider's damage is not strong, but as soon as the venom comes into contact with the body, the health points start dropping quickly. So, Zhang orders all his beasts to attack at once, and they easily defeat the spider. The system appears and notifies that the venomous spider has been defeated. Zhang doesn't seem very pleased as he sacrificed a rank 2 rabbit for just a venomous spider. And on top of that, it only left behind two low-grade demonic soul orbs as a reward. Zhang summons his spider. As soon as it appears, the system shows its specifications. Name, Venomous Spider, Level. 1 of 5, Experience, 1 of 10, Life, 300, Damage, 100 to 150, Defense, 
200, ability, none. Zhang thinks that, as expected of the monsters on the second floor, their attributes are more notable than those of the violent rabbits and the lava turtles. Zhang continues walking through the cave and starts to think that, so far, he has only defeated two venomous spiders. Although the monsters on the second floor are stronger than those on the first floor, there seem to be far fewer monsters. But, without Zhang realizing it, there are four red eyes right behind him. Then, suddenly, two vampire bats attack Zhang from behind. However, Zhang notices and quickly turns around, summoning his beasts again. His beasts start emerging from the portal again. Zhang thinks that, fortunately, his summoning ability has improved, allowing him to summon his beasts faster. Otherwise, the surprise attack by the vampire bats could have ended very badly. Zhang orders his beasts to kill them all. Then, the battle begins, and apparently, Zhang's beasts are doing well. But one of the bats bites one of his beasts and almost completely restores its life. Seeing this, Zhang thinks he needs to change his strategy and focus on one bat at a time. Otherwise, this would never end. So Zhang summons his venomous spider and orders it to use its venom, which hits both bats at once. Zhang starts to smile, as the venom causes damage over time, and because of this, interrupts the bat's blood sucking. Zhang orders again that everyone attack, but this time the same bat. With that, the bats start to take several hits and can't retaliate. Then, Zhang defeats the two bats. But he notices that, to defeat the two bats, he had again suffered losses among his beasts. Zhang starts to analyze that only his strongest beasts would really be able to survive there on the second floor. Zhang summons the bats and says he now has eight relatively strong beasts. So, he decides to face the second floor's boss. But as Zhang gets closer, he realizes that everyone is there, including several people arguing over who would try to fight the second floor's boss first. Everyone there was just arguing among themselves and saying that the experts and stronger ones were on the higher floors and didn't care about a bunch of novices. Zhang just watches all this in silence. Suddenly a group of people yells for everyone there to shut their mouths. A man says he had already reserved the right to fight against the sky-devouring toad. He emphasizes that anyone who could read should just read what was written on the sign. To fight the boss, pay ten demonic soul orbs. He adds that those who are poor wouldn't be able to fight so they should leave. But this ends up generating more discussion, as people find it very strange. They want to charge for such a feat. However, the group that was charging says they also had to pay fees, so they ask once more if anyone else would like to fight, as there was still one spot available. Zhang raises his hand and says he would fight. Zhang says that unfortunately, he does not have the ten demonic orbs, as he had entered the magical domain just yesterday. However, Zhang offers payment in gold, offering ten gold bars. The man who was charging asks if it was really gold. Zhang confirms, saying his family is wealthy. So if they allow him to enter and fight the boss, payment would not be an issue for them. The man hugs Zhang and says it's good this story isn't a lie, because if it turns out to be false at payment time, the consequences would be unimaginable. Zhang tells him not to worry, as he wouldn't dare lie about something so serious. Then, the man agrees and calls Zhang, saying he would show him where the second floor boss is located. Zhang thinks it's been too easy to deceive them. So the group starts moving through the cave. As they reach the end of the cave, there's a man standing there. The group leader calls this man captain and says that since everyone is here, they could proceed to face the boss. The system opens up and reveals this man is named Super Money Machine Man. His rating is that of an experienced fighter. People start thinking that, from what they've learned, anyone with experience in their rating can't be weak. Another man beside him emphasizes that it's better for everyone to stay close when the captain is fighting the monster, to pay attention and obey every command of his. With the whole team formed and together, they advance again. Zhang is surprised by the place, as there's another tunnel on this side of the cave. The captain says this is a world of its own, and right ahead of them there's a huge frog, which is the boss of the second floor. Zhang is stunned by what's in front of him, as the frog is indeed large and has a terrifying appearance. Zhang can't believe the size of the monster. The captain starts to take off his shirt and asks others to keep their distance as he's going to start the fight. The captain jumps towards the frog, and fire begins to emanate from his hands. He starts a fierce and quick sequence of punches on the frog. Those watching think the captain is truly extremely powerful. Another group member says that with just this sequence of punches, the frog's life dropped by a third while the captain fought. His specifications appear in the system window. Flaming Punch A, Level 1. Experience, 612 of 1000, MP consumption, 10, cooldown time, 60 seconds. Effect, 
unleashes numerous consecutive attacks in a short time. Note. Flaming Punch Level 1 unleashes 10 consecutive punches in a short time. Flaming Punch Level 2 is 30 consecutive attacks in a short time. Flaming Punch Level 3 is 50 consecutive punches in a short time. Flaming Punch Level 4 is 100 consecutive punches in a short time. Flaming Punch Level 5 is 300 consecutive punches in a short time. Meanwhile, the fight continues, and the frog launches a giant fireball, but the captain easily dodges it. The explosion from the attack as soon as it hit the wall behind startled the other group members. The captain uses his flaming punch again and starts rapidly striking the frog's head. Zhang, seeing this, thinks the frog still has half its life. So he needs to calculate perfectly to land a fatal arrow and deliver the last blow to the frog. The captain prepares to kill the frog and shouts for it to die. While the captain was finishing off the frog, Zhang saw the opportunity he had been waiting for. So he takes his bow and arrow, aims carefully, and fires. The arrow hits the boss frog's eye, but it wasn't enough to kill it. However, the frog becomes enraged and knocks down the captain. The boss frog is now focused on Zhang. The group leader said they were supposed to stand aside and do nothing. So, why did this boy try to do that? Another group member from behind shouts, saying they shouldn't let Zhang kill the boss frog, because if that happens, all the rewards would go to him. The frog starts chasing Zhang, but as the group was about to do something, the captain stands in front of the portal and crosses his arms, saying no one should do anything because a novice tried to steal the rewards. So, he should die. The captain orders everyone to stand still there while the frog burns Zhang alive. Zhang hears this and becomes a bit apprehensive. The members obey their captain and stand still, commenting that this guy, with just a bow and arrows, is overestimating himself, trying to face the boss alone. Clearly, he is asking to be killed. The difference in strength between them is obvious. Any fool can see that it's not worth taking such a risk. Greed will kill him. Even if, by some miracle, he manages to defeat the frog boss, he won't make it out of here alive. While they just watched, Zhang was fiercely fighting the frog boss, easily dodging the boss's fire attacks. But as soon as the frog boss would be killed, the captain and his team would not let Zhang leave there alive. Tired of hiding, Zhang decides to use his innovations. Then, his crossbows appear surrounding the boss. This surprises everyone there with such a skill. The captain starts to watch attentively, as he had never seen or heard of a talent as strong as this. The monsters start attacking the frog boss. A notification appears saying the frog boss is weakened. Zhang takes advantage of this situation and starts firing several arrows that hit the frog boss right in the face. The system notifies that the boss has been defeated. Zhang starts to laugh. This leaves people astonished that Zhang actually managed to defeat the boss without even a scratch. They thought this impossible, for Zhang was just a novice. In front of Zhang there were several orbs, but as he was collecting the rewards, the whole group comes close to him saying, now it makes sense why he had tried to steal the boss, because he really had a trick up his sleeve. The whole group surrounded Zhang, saying he should return all the rewards he had collected, and still give the ten gold bars. Otherwise, he wouldn't leave there alive. Zhang says he can't believe what he's hearing. How they dare say something so ridiculous, since they blocked the entrance and charged an exorbitant amount for people to enter. If you hadn't done that, clearly Zhang would have defeated the monster alone just the same. So why should Zhang comply with what you want? Zhang points out that he had a great loss in this battle, as a lava turtle, a venomous spider, and a vampire bat died. However, there is still the elite shadow wolf. So defeating all of you won't be a big problem. The captain catches Zhang's attention, saying his talent really is something incredible. But unfortunately, it's useless. Then the captain jumps and with just one strike kills Zhang's vampire bat. The captain says it doesn't matter how many beasts Zhang can summon, when facing a true expert, they are worth nothing. Zhang gets angry and says he just wanted to kill the boss, grab the key, and go back. But now things have changed. You are forcing me to do what I didn't want to do. But when the fight was about to start, someone from the back shouts for them to stop what's happening. This person shows a badge saying he is a member of the disciplinary committee of the Magic Domain Administration team, and for that reason he has the order. The system shows that the name of this person is Divine Retribution Network. Zhang thinks it's strange to see this man there, as the disciplinary committee is a senior administration team. They conduct secret investigations to collect evidence and look for non-compliant teams. Although his position is not very high, they possess great authority. Seeing this, Zhang thinks he can relax a bit. One of the captain's subordinates says that if this guy reports everything they did there to the senior section chief, they would be lost. So they should fight with everything they have against them. 
The council agent says he had already recorded everything they did and would pass it on to the superiors. Then, he asks for everyone there to surrender peacefully. The captain smiles and says that unfortunately they wouldn't have that opportunity. The Magic Domain Administration agent gets a bit scared and asks if they intend to cover up the case by killing them there. And suddenly, Zhang and the agent were surrounded. The agent takes his weapon and tells Zhang not to be afraid, as he would protect him. The agent tells Zhang that the talent he has shown is something unparalleled and very promising. As soon as they manage to get out of there and arrest everyone, the agent says he will introduce Zhang to the committee. Then the fight begins. One of the captain's henchmen rushes forward, but the agent uses his ice beam and freezes him instantly. Another henchman is surprised, as the agent has an A-rank talent. However, the captain says they need not worry, as they have the numerical advantage and the recharge time for that ability is 60 seconds. This would give them the upper hand. The captain orders all his henchmen to attack at once. They charge fearlessly, but the agent skillfully dodges one of their blows and counterattacks with a kick that sends the henchmen flying. The agent smiles and says he was an honor student who graduated from the Tongchuan Martial University. Did they really think he was just a four-eyed nerd? The agent emphasizes that reinforcements would soon arrive. So, it's better for everyone there to surrender at once, as none of them can escape legal sanctions. But they continued mocking, saying in their wildest dreams they would not surrender. Then, this man named Lao San uses a spell on the captain's body, who thanks him for it. The captain then quickly jumps with his hands on fire towards the agent, who uses his ice beam again. But it has no effect, as the spell Lao San used on the captain is a B-rank magical resistance spell. For ten seconds, nothing that is magic will cause damage or effect on the user's body. The agent can't believe it. He then asks Zhang to run away while he can, as the damage from the flaming punch is too high. They wouldn't be able to withstand that attack, but the captain says none of them would escape there alive. The captain prepares his strike and yells for them to die. The agent, with no defensive reaction, just screams in fright. But something stops the captain's strike. As the agent looks, it's a lava turtle that had appeared right in front of him. On top of the turtle, a venomous spider had thrown its web at the captain to hold him for a while. Zhang says the agent could rest now, as he himself would take care of everything. The agent is startled and asks if Zhang is crazy to want to face them head on like this. But Zhang smiles and says he wouldn't even need to move to defeat them, as others would fight for him. Then, Zhang begins his summoning, and again a dense fog starts to spread throughout the place. The other subordinates ask where it's coming from. Then, an elite shadow wolf steps out of the portal, walking. This leaves them completely frightened, as right in front of Zhang there was a shadow wolf under his command. The captain finally manages to free himself from the venomous spider's web, but as soon as the fog passes behind Zhang, the second floor boss frog is right behind him. People there start screaming that this isn't possible. They wonder if it was really Jang who summoned them, while others thought it was a glitch in the magical domain, as two bosses appeared in the same place. But in the end, people understood that it was indeed Jung who had called the bosses there. And this left them even more surprised, as they thought he was only capable of summoning lesser beasts. A man says this is unfair. How can a talent be so unbalanced as to summon bosses, the woman next to him says the talent must be an A rank, but the man says it's clearly an S rank talent or even higher. Lao San asks the captain what they should do now. The captain, with a serious face, says they have no choice but to fight. Then he focuses and says they could leave the two bosses to him, and the rest of the members should kill Zhang. The agent and the captain leap to attack. The agent tells Zhang to be very careful, but Zhang does not move and only orders his beast to attack. Then the two bosses begin the battle against the captain. The captain manages to dodge the wolf and lands a blow on the frog that takes away a third of its life. The frog tries to hit the captain again, but he dodges and lands another blow, leaving the frog with only a third of its life. Zhang, analyzing the situation, thinks that he expected this from an expert. He plans to eliminate the frog before dealing with the dark wolf. Lao San starts laughing and shouting at Zhang, asking if he really thought he could defeat their captain like that. Lao San emphasizes that the captain had already killed many frogs like that, so this little power Zhang uses is nothing. The agent seeing this, thinks that the captain really is very strong, as the defense of the sky-devouring frog is weak, so it won't be able to last much longer. Zhang, still very calm, says that since that's the case, then he will have to really show them something powerful. Zhang takes out his berserker talisman card. This shocks the agent. Zhang throws it to the elite dark wolf and orders it to kill everyone there. As soon as the card touches the wolf's skin, it starts to disintegrate and a red aura begins to cover the wolf. 
Then the wolf opens its eyes, which now glow red, showing a murderous and cold look. The wolf roars, shaking the entire cave. The captain realizes that the wolf's killing intent is uncontrollable. Lao San and his friends realize that the wolf is clearly out of control and has entered berserker mode. The wolf, standing in front of the captain, drooling with the desire to kill. The captain, looking at the wolf, starts to think about how it entered berserker mode without the captain having attacked. He starts to run. As he runs, he looks back and thinks that clearly, an elite dark wolf in berserker mode would be impossible for him to defeat. So, to save his life, the captain decides to flee. Zhang looks at this and asks if the captain really is going to try to flee, as now it seems a bit too late to try to escape. The wolf catches up quickly, and a strong fog covers all of the captain's vision. Then, several attacks begin, and the captain starts to take damage, one after another, without the slightest chance of defense. The captain continues to receive all the hits from the dark wolf. Lao San screams for his captain, but their captain falls to his knees, and with a trembling voice, begins to wonder if this kid is really that powerful. The captain understands that all this is his fault, for he completely underestimated his opponent. Then, the captain begins to fall, and the system notifies that he has just been killed. Lao San and his friends are trembling with fear, and say that this kid is terrifying. They need to get out of there as fast as possible. So they start to run, but the red eye of death is behind them. The wolf begins to attack one after another. Then, Zhang calls his beast back and says that this was just a lesson for everyone there. The agent thinks that Zhang's talent is something scary. Such a talent must be controlled by the government, otherwise the consequences will be unimaginable. After everything is over, the agent's reinforcements arrive at the location. The agent says that they were there, and now all those who remained would be arrested. Then Zhang doesn't want to know, and immediately goes to see the items left by the captain. And as expected, he had many good things. The system opens again, and shows that the loot from the money-making Superman were two high-grade demonic soul orbs, 18 common-grade demonic soul orbs, and 77 low-grade demonic soul orbs, two blood tonics, an invitation card, and three pieces of armor. As soon as Zhang picks up one of the armor pieces, he sees something underneath. He picks it up in his hand and wonders what it is. The system opens again, saying that this is an invitation card to the death zone, grade C, level 1, a one-time pass to enter the death zone. Zhang doesn't understand very well what this death zone is, as there was nothing written about it in the magic domain guide, but Zhang decides to leave it for later. First, he needs to absorb those high-grade orbs. The agent runs up to Zhang, saying that he had been amazing just now. The agent asks Zhang if he has any interest in joining the magic domain management team to serve the nation. Zhang apologizes, but declines, saying that unfortunately, it doesn't fit into his plans at the moment. The agent is a bit confused by this response, but understands and says that everyone has their goals in life, so he would respect that decision. The agent writes down his contact number on a piece of paper and hands it to Zhang, saying that if he changes his mind, he just needs to contact him through this number. Zhang thanks him again and says he will think it over. As Zhang turns to enter the portal, the agent shouts that he needs to say one more thing before he goes. Zhang turns around. The agent says that no matter how strong Zhang becomes in the future, he should always remember that the blood of Great Xia flows within him. So the agent hopes that Zhang won't do things that would disappoint the nation and its people. Zhang turns back to the portal and says he can rest easy, because he is also a citizen of Great Xia. After that, Zhang enters the portal that leads him to an ecosystem entirely different from the previous one. In the center of the arena, Zhang looks around and thinks that apparently, there are far fewer people here compared to the first two floors. He figures that the higher the floor, the more powerful the monsters and the greater the dangers. So without sufficient power, one naturally shouldn't take unnecessary risks. Zhang picks up the book again to see what monsters are on this floor. Goblin warrior, goblin thrower. Apparently this floor deals with more humanoid monsters, instead of beasts or insects. Zhang thinks that things are finally starting to get more interesting. But Zhang notices that it's getting quite late, so he decides to head back. Back at his home as he enters, Zhang notices that all the lights are off. He goes to Xiao Feng's room and knocks on the door, but no one answers. So he decides to open it and realizes that there's no one there. It's late at night, and she still hasn't returned. Then, Zhang remembers she had mentioned going to a friend named Pan Pan's house. So he decides to pick up his phone and call her, but as soon as he picks up his phone, he sees that there are 15 missed calls. He calls back immediately. As soon as Pan Pan answers, Zhang says he's Xiao Feng's brother. Pan Pan asks why he took so long to answer the phone. 
She tells Zhang to rush to the Yunding Dance Club because his sister is in danger. This leaves Zhang in a panic. He runs out, thinking along the way that this is the most luxurious club in the city. What was his sister doing there at this hour? As he arrives, two security guards at the door ask what he thinks he's doing there, dressed like that. Zhang starts to get irritated. Several things go through his mind at that moment. He thinks she was working in that place, but that doesn't matter at the moment, because if anyone dares to touch her, no one would be spared. Quickly, Zhang knocks down the two security guards in a matter of seconds and continues running into the club. Inside the club, there are some people, and a man is telling them to stop the nonsense and accompany young Master Chung for a drink. So why was she making all this fuss? The man offers a card saying there's 10,000 in it, so she should just get on with it and start drinking. He throws the card on the ground and says that if she works there, she's a nobody. So it's better to stop joking and do what he's telling her. Her friend steps in front of Xiaofeng, saying she would accompany Chung instead of Xiaofeng. But the man pushes the employee, saying Chung had already chosen the other girl. So that's what he would have, period. The man touches Xiaofeng's face and starts yelling at her, saying she should serve their distinguished guest well. Otherwise, suddenly, someone from behind asks what would happen if she didn't do that. That person was Zhang, coming in with a look of terror. Zhang says he doesn't care who he is or where this is. If anyone dares to touch a hair on his sister's head, he would break both legs of anyone daring to do so. Xiao Feng screams for her brother. A man from behind asks Zhang how he dares to offend the Tianxing group. Does he not fear death? The people around think that now Zhang was screwed as he was messing with the Tianxing group. Xiao Feng's friend thinks that things are definitely out of control, as the Tianxing group has a lot of influence in Zhang Bei, not to mention that they have hired many fighters from the magic domain. Zhang bends down and picks up the card from the ground. The man smiles and says he likes obedient people, but Zhang holds the card and asks if he really wanted to buy his sister with this card. Then, Zhang throws the card, saying it would never happen in his dreams, but quickly someone jumps in front of the man and catches the card. Zhang's sister, seeing this, thinks the guy was so fast that she barely saw him. The chubby man orders everyone there to grab Zhang, and after beating him up, break his legs. Then, the guards rush towards Zhang, but suddenly, a woman yells for them to stop. She asks why they were making all this mess in the Yunding Club. Don't they have any respect for her at all? This woman is named Zhang. She was wondering who he could be. She smiles and says, he is Wu Tiancheng. Then she calls him Boss Wu and asks if he is so free to visit her club. She thinks Wu Tiancheng has never been a good person, so today she should humiliate this guy. Then he comes and says that the young women working there are worthless and do not behave well. He and his friend are not satisfied with the service there. Zhang responds that he is a generous man. Why would he waste his time arguing with just two kids like them? So, it's better to let it go for today. Then, Wu Tiancheng starts to say he will not let it go because she can't even properly control her employees. Clearly, Tianfeng City should find a new leader. Zhang smiles and says, Wu Tiancheng is welcome to have fun in Tianfeng City whenever he wants. But she points her finger and says if he came there to bully the citizens of her city, then he might as well go back to Jiangbei. After that, the people there start to celebrate and say that's right, Jiang is correct. Wu Tiancheng starts to laugh and says they are all fools, because if it wasn't for the donations he makes to help train fighters in the magic domain and prevent monster invasions, they would all be dead by now. In the future, only the strong will be able to enjoy life. Wu Tiancheng points to Xiao Feng and says he will definitely take her with him today. This leaves her very scared. Jiang says that if that's the case, then he shouldn't blame her for what's going to happen now. She prepares to strike him. But again, the same guy quickly steps in front and with extreme ease throws her away. Wu Tiancheng starts to laugh and says, this is the power of the only S rank of the last decade. Wu Tiancheng orders his guards to grab Xiao Feng and take her. Then he asks who there would dare to stop him. Just as they were about to grab her, someone quickly grabs her by the shoulder and yells for them to take their hands off her, hitting one of them with a knee to the face. Cheng, seeing this, gets excited. Zhang repeats that anyone who tries to touch his sister, he would have no mercy. Cheng says Zhang is really fast. Wu Tiancheng asks if he's also a fighter from the magic domain. Zhang gets up and asks what Zhang's agility attribute is because he's very fast. Cheng, seeing all this movement, thinks that he recently raised his agility points to 11, which is infinitely faster than the speed of an ordinary person, but Zhang's speed is still greater than his. Cheng says he wants to introduce himself formally. Then he starts saying his name is Chung, a third-year high school student from Longhu. Chung asks Zhang's name, who replies that he is a third-year student from the fifth high school in Tianfeng City, 
and his name is Zhang. Chung says he didn't expect both of them to be in the same year. Then, he suggests they should compare grades, but Zhang turns away with his sister and says he's not interested. Chung doesn't like this attitude much. Zhang notices something different, turns quickly, and breaks a bottle with a kick that Chung had thrown at him. Chung is surprised, saying Zhang really is very fast. But unfortunately, if Chung didn't give permission, neither Zhang nor his sister Feng would leave there. Zhang shouts that Chung is extremely strong, the weight of his punch is at least 200 caddies, so they should be very careful with him. Zhang hears this and doesn't care, just asks his sister to step back a bit, that they would go home soon, as he was only going to beat Chung first. Chung says he was looking for an opponent of his level at the school in Jiang Bei, but didn't find one. However, Chung says he is very lucky to have found Zhang right there. Chung says he hopes Zhang doesn't disappoint him. Suddenly, Chung jumps with terrifying speed to attack Zhang. Zhang, seeing this, gets worried, as apparently Chung was hiding his real power. This punch at this speed must weigh at least a thousand caddies, but Zhang easily dodges Chung's attack. Zhang thinks his strength is in speed, so he needs to use this as his main attack. Zhang punches Chung, who defends with his arm. Chung says Zhang is quite strong, but still not compared to him. But in the blink of an eye, Zhang disappears from Chung's view, as he was moving with extreme speed. Then he appears behind Chung, and as soon as Chung notices, thinks this speed really is impressive, he manages to defend again with his arm. However, this time, he really feels the strength of the punch and starts to wonder how Zhang is so fast. Zhang disappears again with his speed, leaving Chung wondering how many agility points Zhang must have to be so fast. Tian Cheng, seeing the absurd speed of Zhang, is shocked, as he didn't imagine that there was such a strong talent there, in such an insignificant place. Tian Cheng thinks that this time he was very careless with his attitudes. Zhang lands a punch on Cheng's back, causing him to scream in pain as he is thrown forward. Pan Pan is surprised by this, and says she always thought Zhang was just a very kind person. She really didn't imagine that he had such great strength hidden. Feng smiles, proud of her brother and says he was just being modest. Zhang continues to be apprehensive, watching the fight. Chung realizes he's not at the advantage he thought he would be, so he jumps and recomposes himself. However, he's feeling a strong pain in his arm, as he had defended twice with the same arm. Zhang notices this and says that Chung could no longer lift his arm. Then, he asks if he really still wanted to continue. The two stare at each other for a while. Then, Tian Chung shouts and tells Chung that a wise man would know when to retreat, as they could fight again in the future. After all, this city is theirs. Moreover, they were facing a strong expert. Leaving now might be the best option. Chung starts to say he would remember this day and, especially, the name Zhang. The National Martial Arts Examination would take place in three months. Chung emphasizes that once he is admitted to the Qing Martial Arts Academy, he would personally go after Zhang. Zhang smiles and says that's a coincidence, as he was also planning to enter the Qing Martial Arts Academy. Zhang says they might even be classmates there. Chung gets annoyed by Zhang's calmness and starts shouting that, although Zhang was an extremely fast person, his physical strength and spirit were below standard. Chung also highlights that Zhang's financial life was crap, as if it were good, he wouldn't let his precious sister work in places like that. However, Zhang remains very calm and smiling, asks Chung not to worry about him, but about his arm, which is completely injured. So as soon as the two are in the academy, Zhang asks Chung to give his best and go after him. Tian Cheng starts to take Cheng away. Even so, he turns around and asks where all this confidence comes from. All the people there start to celebrate and yell for them to disappear from there, because just by having money, they thought they were better than others. The people shouted for them never to forget this day, and to stop mocking their town for thinking there was no talent there. The slap in the face they received will be remembered for a long time. Zhang hugs his sister and says it's late, so they should go back home. She smiles and agrees, but before they leave, Zhang asks Zhang to wait a moment, as she would like to thank him for what he had done there today. Zhang asks him to go with her for just a few minutes, so they can discuss some things. Feng smiles and tells her brother that Zhang is a good person. Then he agrees to listen to her. Inside a room, Zhang and his sister are sitting on a couch, while Zhang stands up and starts to thank again. Then, she hands over a payment to Zhang of 500,000, and says that this is a demonstration of the gratitude she felt for what he had done that night. He not only defended his sister, but also brought glory to the city of Tianfeng. Zhang thinks that with this amount, he would no longer need to worry about rent, nor even about his sister's kidney. However, he says that as much as he needs money, he could not accept this money just like that. Zhang says she would be very clear there. 
as Zhang himself had seen before, she also had unfinished stories with Tian Cheng from the Tianqing group, and clearly Tian Cheng had brought Cheng there just to cause problems for the Yunding Club. So, this money is actually for Zhang to help her, because if he hadn't intervened today, things could have really gotten quite ugly. Feng turns to her brother, and with a very happy face, says that he should help Zhang. Zhang sighs and accepts the money, and says that if Cheng causes problems again in the future, then he would help. Then, Zhang and his sister stand up and say that if there was nothing more to be dealt with there, they would leave. Zhang thanks again and says she would ask her team to take the two to their home. Zhang says not to worry, as they would go by themselves. As soon as they leave the club, Zhang says he never wanted to see his sister there inside again, so she would not return there. Feng says she knew she was wrong, but the salary was very high. Zhang gets angry and yells, saying no matter how much the salary was, she should never step in there again. Then he asks if she understood. She tries to change the subject, saying he looked very strong fighting there inside. Then he cuts the topic, saying he doesn't want to know more about this subject. It's very late and tomorrow she had class, so they would immediately go back home so she could sleep and rest. The next day at school, Zhang was about to leave his classroom until he hears someone calling him, and as he turns, sees Yang jumping towards him, crying, saying that they might not have seen each other again, as yesterday he almost got kidnapped in the magical domain. Then, Yang hugs Zhang tightly and says that, if Master Asura hadn't saved him yesterday, he probably could have been dead now. Zhang says that Yang was really lucky, but now he must let him go and continue what he was doing, because Zhang needed to go back to his house to cook for his sister. Yang leaves enchanted, saying that Master Asura was incredibly strong, so he would choose him as his new master. Zhang is a bit disheartened by this, and thinks that Yang's memory was really good. In the corridor, Zhang meets another person who greets him. He introduces himself, saying his name is Hao, and that he had a question to ask Zhang. Then he asks if it had been Zhang who cleaned the martial arts room yesterday after training. Zhang thinks this is the guy who had awakened an A-ranking talent, and immediately remembers that he had left his punch number on the dynamometer, and thinks he might have seen it. Then he answers yes. Hao gets excited and asks if he had seen him use the dynamometer that night, but Zhang just says he hadn't seen anyone use it. Zhang looks directly at them and quickly starts to walk away, saying he had something important to do and couldn't be late. As he ran away from there, Zhang thought he needed to be more careful from now on, as it was not yet time to expose his talent. And by great luck, Hao hadn't seen that it had been him who used the dynamometer. But Hao watches Zhang as he walks away. Hao wonders if it could be him, but a guy next to Hao says that's impossible, as in last month's exam, Zhang hadn't even been among the top hundred. Hao says there's nothing to worry about now, as the truth will always come out in the national martial arts exam. Back at his home, Zhang watches television while his sister washes the dishes. On television, a news report starts saying that recently, a dangerous fugitive had escaped to the city. So, this report was a reminder from the city department for all citizens to stay in their homes, safe and for students, the advice is to try to stay inside their homes during the night. And, if they see a suspicious person, they should immediately call the police. Zhang stands up and tells his sister that he would enter the magical domain, and, as she heard on television, things are not safe out there. So she should be a good sister and not leave the house this time. Feng says it's okay and she would stay inside. Then Zhang, without wasting time, returns to the magical domain. On the third floor, he opens his system and thinks that although he got the Sky Devourer boss, he still had lost many beasts. At the moment, there are five vacancies. So Zhang decides that, before trying to advance further, he would fill the remaining five slots. Currently, Zhang has an elite dark wolf, a sky devouring frog, a venomous spider, a lava turtle, and a violent rabbit. Zhang opens the magical domain guide again to check the monsters on the third floor. On the third floor, there are warrior goblin and launcher goblin. Zhang starts to think that the monsters on this floor are just short and long range goblins, but he still doesn't know which would be better for his team. Zhang decides to collect one of each first to test their strengths and then choose which ones he would put on his team. As soon as Zhang was about to start hunting, he hears a cry for help. A group of three people was being attacked by goblins. One of them screams and warns that the goblins' attack was very strong, so they should be careful not to be hit. Then, the guy with the shield notices that one of the goblins was going to attack and trembles in fear. The warrior goblin quickly attacks and breaks their shield in half with extreme ease, while the launcher goblin from a distance hits them with its attacks. As they ran without knowing what to do, Jang on top of a tree just watched and studied the scene. He thinks that even three short-range experts were not able to defeat a single warrior goblin. 
Apparently, these goblins really are strong. Zhang summons the sky-devouring frog and orders it to attack. Then, immediately, the frog jumps and attacks, causing 310 damage to the warrior goblin. Zhang is impressed with the power of the frog. Then he summons the lava turtle and asks it to join the battle. Immediately, the turtle appears and jumps in front of the warrior goblin, but the warrior goblin blocks the attack of the turtle. This leaves Zhang impressed, as he didn't imagine they could block attacks. But suddenly, the launcher goblin starts to attack the turtle quickly, causing very large damage, which makes Zhang impressed with the strength and attack speed of the launcher goblin. Quickly, the lava turtle dies. Then Zhang starts to focus on the launcher goblin and tells the frog to change its target and attack the launcher goblin. Then the frog attacks again. The goblin looks at this unable to dodge or defend. Then the frog's attack hits the launcher goblin squarely, causing 450 damage. Zhang orders the frog to attack again, leaving the goblin with little life. Zhang calls his elite dark wolf and orders it to finish it off. But as soon as the launcher goblin sees the elite dark wolf, it starts running away in fear, which shocks the wolf, Zhang, and even the other goblin. Zhang is very disappointed, wondering why the launcher goblin was fleeing when it was about to be captured. Zhang says the goblin wouldn't get away that easily. Then, quickly, he calls his violent rabbit, and says now he wanted to see who would be faster. So he sends his rabbit to catch the launcher goblin. Zhang and his elite dark wolf come down from the tree while his violent rabbit chases after the launcher goblin. Zhang looks at the warrior goblin and says it is the only one left there. So, it's better for it to put up a good fight, and he sends his dark wolf and the frog to attack. Then, the bosses begin to attack. As soon as the goblin is defeated, Zhang goes to its body and says it was very brave, as they took ten minutes to defeat it. Then, after the death of the goblin, Zhang summons it so he can analyze its attributes. So, as soon as the goblin is summoned, Zhang opens the system which shows the attributes. Name, Warrior Goblin, Level, 1 out of 5, Experience, 1 out of 10, Health, 450, Damage, 240 to 290, Defense, 300, Ability, None. Zhang notices that the damage and defense of the goblin are really notable. However, this was expected for a monster of the third floor. Although the goblin has no abilities, its attributes are greater than those of the level 3 violent rabbit. As soon as Zhang touches the name of the violent rabbit, he notices that the rabbit hadn't returned yet. So he decides to look in the system, and the system shows that the violent rabbit was dead. Zhang wonders what happened, and how his rabbit died like that. But suddenly, he hears strange noises coming from behind a bush. Then, several goblins appear at once, screaming, chitter squeal, and charge at Zhang who seeing this gets scared and thinks that now the situation was really going to escalate as the goblin that had escaped earlier had called his partners. Zhang decides to run, as this number of goblins would easily kill his beasts, so he stores all of them and starts running towards the altar. But the goblins stop at a distance and stay there. Zhang thinks that these goblins are really very intelligent, as they even know that the altar would kill them if they got closer. The other people who were at the altar began to wonder how Zhang had called so many goblins like that. Zhang, on top of the altar, taunts the goblins. The goblin that he had hit previously shows him the finger. Then they start to retreat from there. After that, Zhang sits on the edge of the altar and thinks that these goblins are different from other monsters. Besides knowing how to flee, they also know how to call large amounts of reinforcements. So, the safest way to deal with them is not giving them the opportunity to flee. Zhang wonders how he would do that, as they are quite fast. Then Zhang remembers something. He quickly stands up and thinks that probably this would work. The people around him even startle. A few minutes later, Zhang was on top of a tree again, watching two goblins standing still. Zhang hides better behind the tree to avoid being seen, while he continues observing. Seeing a pair again, he thinks that the teams are fixed and divided into short and long range. Zhang then thinks it's time for him to show something entertaining. Zhang starts to call his beasts, and orders them to start attacking the short-range goblin. Zhang takes advantage and sends the dark wolf and the frog to attack the launcher goblin. Quickly, the warrior goblin dies. Zhang looks at the launcher goblin and smiles, saying that now he couldn't do anything against them. Then they face each other. Zhang smiles and says he was the last one. The dark wolf growls at the goblin, which is low on life. Then the goblin starts running again, leaving the wolf behind. But Zhang had anticipated this. So he starts to summon his beast, the venomous spider, and orders it to hold him with its web. Quickly, the spider jumps and manages to hold him with the web. Then, Zhang with his beasts surrounds him, and he asks why he is not running now or calling for reinforcements. Zhang orders his beasts to finish him off. 
The goblin trembles in fear, but there isn't much it can do. After a few minutes, Jang is with the system open, looking at the attributes of the launcher goblin and is impressed with the launcher goblin's damage. The system shows the following attributes. Name, launcher goblin, level, 1 out of 5, experience, 1 out of 10, health, 300, damage, 290 to 330, defense, 280, ability, none. Zhang says the attack of the long-range goblin is almost as strong as that of the dark wolf. No wonder their attacks hurt so much. After seeing the attributes of both goblins, Zhang decides that he would catch some more. So he calls his beasts and says they would exterminate the goblins. Then, they start hunting the goblins and easily Zhang goes killing them one by one. Zhang, seeing the spider using its web, thinks that these skills really are very useful. He will have to learn to use them more frequently from now on. Zhang continues capturing goblins. In the last encounter, his level 3 lava turtle dies, but that was what Zhang wanted, as this way he could replace it with another goblin. Currently, Zhang has a small army of beasts, consisting of seven goblins, three of them launchers and four warriors, an elite dark wolf, a sky-devouring frog, and a venomous spider. And with this, Zhang thinks he can take a look at the third floor boss. After a few hours, Zhang finally arrives at the village where the Goblin King resides. As soon as Zhang sees all this, he is impressed and thinks that the Goblin King clearly would be quite complicated to deal with, as he has a whole structure protecting him, plus several Goblin subordinates on guard. So, he thinks fighting alone really would be very difficult. Looking back, Zhang sees a person shouting that they had an S-ranking talent and were organizing a team to fight the third floor boss for free. The team would consist of a hundred people, and was almost full. So there were only a few spots left. Zhang, seeing this, thinks there are many people who take novices to get rewards by killing monsters and defeating bosses. Since there is no supervision there, those who just increase the number without real qualifications get opportunities like these. These scammers are very common around there. Sometimes the people who accompany them can even lose their lives due to the recklessness of the leaders. Zhang thinks they are just a bunch of fools, but the man with S-ranking talent calls Zhang and asks if he had any interest in joining his team, as there were still five spots available. The man says it's all for free, and that the items the monster drops would also be theirs, as he wouldn't want anything. Zhang thinks there are many people there, so it wouldn't be so difficult. He could enter with his summoned beasts. Then he turns and refuses the invitation, saying he would go alone. The people there start criticizing Zhang, saying that even when a specialist personally invited him, he did not appreciate the kindness and wanted to go alone. Some said he was crazy, as if he went in there alone, he would end up dying. After analyzing the entrances, Zhang finds one with few goblins, so he thinks it would be his best chance of victory. Then he prepares and calls his beasts and orders them to attack. Quickly the battle starts, and all the goblins at the entrance are killed with some ease. Consequently, several demonic orbs were dropped. Zhang thinks that finally, he was lucky this time. Then he picks up his book and looks at the map there, but he hears another scream for help coming from inside a huge tent. And with that, obviously, Zhang realizes that the Goblin King would be inside there. The screams continue asking for help. Zhang is a bit confused, as by the time it was impressive that a person was already in there, fighting against the Goblin King. Inside, the people from the previous team were being attacked, and those who remained were running and screaming that the goblins were killing everyone there. The Goblin King attacked along with his subordinates without the slightest mercy. Suddenly, those who remained were surrounded. Zhang takes a look and sees the people being attacked and thinks that it is indeed the group he had seen before. But something was strange, as the man in the purple cloak, who claimed to be the team leader, was not helping them. Meanwhile, the fight continued. The goblins attacked furiously, finishing several quickly and consequently, all those who listened to that man ended up dying there, leaving none of them alive. The Goblin King sits back down, laughing, while the bodies of the novices who were killed turned into orbs. Zhang, seeing this, says he now understood everything. That man before did not have an S-ranking talent. He just led them all there so they would die. After they were all dead, he planned to return and steal the orbs and items left by those who died there. Zhang picks up one of the orbs and thinks that these low-grade orbs were exchanged for the lives of all these novices. Zhang thinks that the man in the purple cloak is a despicable monster. But suddenly, a dagger flies quickly and breaks a pot right in front of Zhang, startling him. Then, he realizes that this is really bad, as he had awakened the Goblin King. As soon as he looks, he sees the Goblin King standing, with his soldiers around him, saying that there was a reckless intruder there. 
The goblins start to run to attack Jang, who quickly calls his goblins and asks them to block the attacks. Then, the warrior goblins begin to block the attacks from the other warrior goblins. Zhang looks at the chief and thinks that if his goblins hold off the king goblin's subordinates, then he would have a chance to fight. Then, without thinking twice, Zhang starts to attack the goblin king, using his venomous spider to hold the king while he prepared to attack with his bow. Zhang also sends some goblins to attack the king, who gets angry and screams that they were nothing much, and starts to spin rapidly, breaking one of the goblin's swords and killing one of them in just one hit. Zhang is impressed with the goblin king's whirlwind fist ability, as it had absurd damage. Thanks to that then, Zhang decides to attack from afar and prepares his launcher goblins and the sky-devouring frog and joins them and orders all to attack the goblin king together. Then, all of them attack at the same time. The goblin king just looks at the attacks coming his way. Then, the goblin king picks up his two swords and defends the attacks, saying that the intruder was reckless and therefore, he should die. Zhang is impressed again, as besides the strong attack, the goblin king could defend with the swords. Besides the fireball from the sky-devouring frog, he can block other physical attacks and weaken their damage by half. The king's subordinates continue attacking Jang, but quickly his goblins defend him from the attacks. Jang thinks that the damage and defense of the king are very high. His beasts would not last much longer if it continued this way. So, he starts to think about what he should do, but while thinking, Someone grabs the dagger again and yells for Zhang to die and hits him from behind, causing 399 damage in one hit. Zhang turns with the wound and realizes that the one who attacked him was the man in the purple cloak. Zhang finds it strange that he hadn't noticed this guy and calls him despicable. The man says that, even with a critical hit, Zhang didn't die. Clearly, his attributes were remarkable. He adds, saying his talent is stealth. As long as he doesn't attack or take damage, he can remain invisible. He asks if that talent isn't really incredible. Zhang responds that the talent is rubbish for fighting monsters and bosses, but for deceiving people, it was quite useful. And based on that, he did what he did with the novices. The man in the purple cloak says that's right, and that if it weren't for Zhang, now he would be with another batch of demonic orbs, and therefore, he should die. At that moment, Zhang was completely screwed, as behind him was the Goblin King, and in front, the man in the purple cloak. Both in front and behind there were enemies. Suddenly the Goblin King kills another one of his goblins and the system notifies that another warrior goblin has been killed, leaving Jang a bit scared, pondering what he should do now since he was injured and surrounded. Jang thinks he cannot be defeated by this guy. He had to think of something. It was his duty. The man in the purple cloak laughs and asks if Jang really still intended to fight. Suddenly, Jang has an idea and calls his venomous spider and orders it to bind the man in the purple cloak. Zhang says, the man in the purple cloak is very inattentive. Quickly, Zhang is standing, looking at the man in the purple cloak, who grumbles and asks if Zhang really thinks he would escape just by binding him there on the ground, as the goblin king was focused on Zhang and not on him. Zhang tells the man to shut up and says he wasn't planning to run. He just had to wait a bit and collect the corpse of the man in the purple cloak from the ground. Then, Zhang calls all his beasts back, leaving the path clear for the goblin king. The man, now trapped, asks if Zhang was going crazy. As Zhang runs from there, he tells the man not to be hypocritical now. Zhang's plan is to remove all his beasts and get out of the field of vision of the Goblin King, thus leaving only one target for him to attack, namely the man in the purple cloak. The man becomes desperate, thinking he hadn't imagined he would fall into this trap. Thus, the king prepares to attack, but the man uses his ability, making the Goblin King stop and become a bit confused. While he was invisible there, he thinks he would never forget Zhang's face, and that as soon as he escaped from there, he would go after him to the ends of the earth. By the man's count, there were 25 seconds left until the venomous spider's web would end, but Zhang returns and stops right in front of them. This confuses the man. He wonders why Zhang had come back there, what he was really planning. Zhang smiles, takes his bow and arrows, and says he had figured the man would turn invisible. Then, Zhang shoots an arrow that hits right in the man's chest, making him visible again. Then he screams, saying he was invisible. How did Zhang hit him like that? But as soon as the man looks back, he sees that the king had noticed him again. Then the king, with eyes red with rage, returns to attack mercilessly, throwing the man to the ground who was trembling. The man says there were only five seconds left for the web to end, but suddenly another web is thrown at him, and the countdown starts at 60 seconds again. 
The man becomes furious, saying he would kill Zhang. Then Zhang starts to laugh and says he doesn't need to see the man, just the web was enough. Zhang prepares another arrow and tells the man to taste his own poison, as he used to watch all the novices die, one after the other without doing anything. So now it's his turn to be killed by the boss. Zhang hits another arrow into the man's belly, then the king prepares to attack again. The man, seeing his death approaching, screams and says that even if he dies there, he would not let Zhang get off scot-free from all this. Then the king strikes the man with all his strength, killing him. Zhang says he who sows the wind, reaps the whirlwind. Zhang decides once and for all that he would defeat the king with everything he had. So he calls all his beasts again. Now only two goblins remained on the king's side, but there were several orbs scattered on the ground and some items as well. Then, Zhang starts to pick up some orbs and items. He ends up finding a glove named White Silk Gloves. It is of grade A, attributes. Damage plus 50, special abilities. None, durability. 100 out of 100. Zhang thinks this is pretty cool, as plus 50 damage points would definitely significantly improve his attack strength. So he decides to test his attack and attacks the king. His arrow is indeed faster, but when it hits the king's head, it does nothing beyond leaving a small mark on his head. Zhang laughs nervously and thinks this was not the result he was expecting. The king attacks again, quickly killing three goblins, saying they were weak. Zhang starts to run out of options and thinks the damage of this boss is terrifying. If he doesn't do something in the next moves, all his beasts could end up dying. The king screams that they are weak, and he will kill everyone and charges at Zhang, who quickly uses his venomous spider and asks it to use its web. This traps the monster on the ground, causing it to miss its attack. Then, Zhang takes advantage of this and removes his short-range beasts and calls all his long-range ones and sends them to attack the Goblin King, who was trapped. Then, all of them start attacking together. The king manages to defend against some of the attacks. Zhang smiles and asks if that is enough. Then, the sky-devouring frog attacks with its flames and hits the king directly, leaving him with just 9% of life. Zhang yells for his beasts to hold on tight, as they were almost winning. He orders everyone to attack again, and as soon as the frog uses its fireball, the goblin king just looks at it unable to defend. Then, the fireball hits the king, causing great damage, enough to defeat him. The system appears, congratulating Zhang for defeating the goblin king. Zhang celebrates with the rest of his beasts, who finally manage to defeat the king. Suddenly, the king's throne begins to crack and a portal forms there. The system announces that the entrance to the fourth floor has appeared. Zhang, seeing this, thinks now it makes sense why he hadn't found it before. It was hidden in the king's throne. Many orbs were scattered on the ground. Zhang picks one of them up and thinks that, as expected of a boss, he dropped a high-grade demonic soul orb. Zhang calls his beast, the Goblin King. As soon as he is fully summoned, he looks at Zhang, who looks back at him with a happy face. The king bows before Zhang, who gives him a knock on the head, saying he was very tough to deal with. Because of him, some beasts had died. But suddenly, Zhang pats the head of the Goblin King and says that all of this is in the past, as now he was part of the family. Zhang opens the system and thinks that now he had three bosses, the Elite Dark Wolf, the Sky Devouring Frog, the Goblin King, and to complete, there was one more venomous spider and a Launcher Goblin. Zhang reviews and thinks that, although the Dark Wolf has the lowest attributes there, it is still of an elite class and will level up soon. Excluding these beasts, there were still five slots remaining. Zhang decides to go back and get three more warrior goblins and two launcher goblins. He reviews all his beasts and thinks it over, and decides to go to the fourth floor, as soon the third floor's boss would come back to life, not to mention that later he could try to summon more bosses and goblin kings. Thus, he would become almost invincible. But before he can enter the portal, someone shouts for him to stop. Several people surround him and yell for him to surrender peacefully. Zhang looks at this and sees that all of them carry a logo on their chests, and this logo is from the Magic Domain's administration team. One of them asks where are the victims who joined Zhang's team, but he simply responds that he hadn't created any team, and possibly they were getting the wrong guy. The man points his sword and says that's a lie, as they had received a report that a person was posing as a specialist and deceiving novices. Right there, in one year, three cases were opened and hundreds of people died because of this. A woman takes the lead in the conversation and says they are the inspection team from the Magical Domain Administration. She says that Zhang wouldn't be able to escape. Therefore, he should throw all his weapons on the ground and follow them peacefully. Otherwise, he should not blame them for the consequences of his actions. 
She gets ready and aims her bow and arrows at Zhang, saying that it would be futile for him to try to move to the fourth floor, as they had also set a trap there. This is his last chance. If Zhang doesn't drop his weapons right now, they will attack. Zhang assesses the situation carefully. On their side, there are dozens of people, and by their appearance, and the fact they are a team from the magical domain, they are not ordinary fighters. Thus, if Zhang decided to fight, the chances of winning would be slim. Zhang drops his weapons and says he has no choice but to surrender because his day was not going well. But suddenly, a person from the back shouts, telling them to wait, because the person they were arresting was not the real culprit. Zhang is happy to see who it was, as it was the agent who had fought with him on the third floor boss. This man is the section chief. He smiles and waves to Zhang, saying it was a coincidence they met again. Zhang asks him if he wasn't just an inspector when he had become the section chief. The agent smiles again and says that all this is thanks to Zhang, because of the case they worked on together last time. The superiors made an exception, and thus he got the chance for promotion. Now he is the section chief of the Magical Domain Inspection Team. He, the agent, thanks Zhang again for his help that day. Zhang is flattered by this but says it was nothing special, so no thanks were needed. The woman from before comes up to her chief and says that when they arrived at the place, there was only Zhang there standing. If it wasn't him, then who else could be the culprit? The chief draws everyone's attention and begins to explain that Zhang is a good friend of his, so he faithfully believes that he is innocent. Moreover, according to the people who made the complaints, the one responsible for deceiving the novices and making them lose their lives is called Kiss of Death. The chief takes advantage of the situation and asks Zhang if he had seen this so-called Kiss of Death and about the victims he deceived. Zhang shakes his head and says they arrived too late. All these novices were killed. The chief is surprised, because if this really happened, they were talking about hundreds of lives lost. The chief gets angry, and cannot believe that more than a hundred lives were lost. Again, he emphasizes that this kiss of death is really very dangerous. They need to catch him as soon as possible. Zhang says that, unfortunately, they will never be able to catch him. This leaves the chief scared and puzzled. Zhang opens his arms and says that he had killed the kiss of death. The whole team crowds around Zhang, saying that according to their records, Kiss of Death claims to have an S-ranking talent, not to mention that he is an expert who has been wandering the magical domain for many years. He is also known as a skilled assassin, an extremely scary and cruel person. Is what you just said really true? Zhang says it is indeed true, and if they do not believe, they could check the death list that Zhang had made. Then he opens his system and shows the death list, which records the names of all the opponents that a person has killed in the magical domain. As soon as they look, the woman is completely shocked by what she sees, as a novice had just arrived on the third floor and killed a skilled expert. Another man said that in addition to all this, it was done alone. The chief sees the list and confirms that Zhang had indeed killed him. Then he asks how Zhang had done it. The members of the chief's team start to cry, as when they were novices, they did not even compare to Zhang's strength. The chief comes closer and thanks Zhang once again, saying that he has once again renewed his hopes. The younger generations really have great potential, the chief says once again. Thank you to Zhang for eliminating a potential threat. Zhang simply says it was nothing special. He turns around and says that if there is nothing else to resolve, he needs to go. The chief asks him to wait a bit, and says there is one more thing he needs to know before he goes. The chief begins to explain that the man who was killed, Kiss of Death, was a member of an illegal organization known as Dawn. The name does not seem so scary, but in reality, the organization is extremely dangerous. Kidnappings, thefts, and murders. They committed all the criminal activities Zhang could imagine. The Magical Domain Administration team has been constantly investigating them, but due to how hidden they are, as well as how powerful and cunning, they still haven't been able to make any substantial progress. The chief emphasizes that Zhang just killed one of them, and possibly, he would become a target for them. So for his own safety, the chief invites him again to join the Magical Domain Administration team. Zhang stops and thinks about it for a while. A few seconds later, he turns around and says there was no need for him to join the administration team. Zhang thanks for the invitation, and says he would remember the name Dawn, and would be very careful. The chief just crosses his arms, saying nothing, and after Zhang leaves, the chief smiles and says that one day he will join their team. On the fourth floor, the scenario is completely different, a desert and some scattered bones. But as soon as Zhang arrives at the center of the altar, he notices that something is wrong. A barrier was surrounding the altar and trapping everyone inside. 
Zhang looks at all this and asks what was going on, while some people, monitoring the population, were shouting that this was nonsense, as the magical domain was for everyone, and they had the right to come and go. Another complained that they had errands and needed to go. Otherwise, they could be fined and fired. One of the men there shouts, saying that only a madman would believe that the death zone appeared out of nowhere on the fourth floor. He accuses the guards of hiding something behind their backs. Zhang puts his hand on his face and thinks that it is always the magical domain administration team that causes this uproar. As the shouting still rolled on within the altar, Zhang begins to think a little about what everyone was talking about and what this death zone really was. He remembers he has an invitation card to the death zone in his inventory. Could it have something to do with all this situation? A man in a black cloak starts saying that the administration team always worked to maintain harmony and stability within the magical domain. They would never lie to the people. He continues saying that the death zone indeed appeared on the fourth floor of the magical domain. Maybe many people do not know exactly what the death zone is. This man emphasizes that, as there were no records of this death zone in the magical domain guide, he himself would explain to everyone there. The so-called death zone is actually another dimension, and they have not yet been able to conduct deeper research on these dimensions. Within these dimensions, there are unknown monsters that have made several victims over time. The only precise thing they know is that it appears randomly on any of the floors of the magical domain, causing victims and problems wherever it goes. Thanks to this event called Death Zone, the fourth floor, currently, in terms of difficulty, compares with the tenth floor, and that is why they are prohibiting everyone from moving through the fourth floor. It is extremely dangerous, the man asks for everyone's understanding. Another man in front of Zhang starts shouting, asking why they should believe him, and even after all this story he still wanted to enter. Then the man in the black cloak decides to let, and says that if he really does not believe and wants to enter, then he would let him. However, he would have to bear all the consequences alone. The man spits something that was in his mouth and runs out, saying he was not afraid of anything, much less of them. As soon as he passes, the man in the black cloak says he was not raised to be a coward. Then he runs out. The man in the black cloak says that if there is anyone else brave enough there who wants to go, he would not stop them. Some people start to discuss whether they should go and wonder if there really was a death zone right there. But suddenly, the man who had left earlier screams from the back, which draws everyone's attention there. He screams that they mutated and that it was completely terrifying. He continues saying that it was extremely scary. The mutant monsters went crazy trying to catch him to kill. However, he managed to run fast enough to escape. Otherwise, he would have died there without being able to do anything. One of the people from inside asks if they really did mutate. The fallen man says that there really is a death zone there. The man in the black cloak asks if now everyone there believed him. He emphasizes that it is better for no one to enter the fourth floor for the next few days. It would be better to wait until the death zone completely disappears before entering again. One of the novices says that since it was going to take so long, he would leave to take a break. Zhang just looks, saying nothing to anyone. He looks around and thinks that it's getting late and, as no one could enter, then he would also go back to his home. And tomorrow was Saturday, so he could relax a little more. While there was a person fighting against a giant zombie, he prepares and grabs his sword. He jumps, and with just one blow defeats the monster. The system opens and shows that the titan zombie is dead. The orb falls to the ground. Then the man goes to it and picks it up. The system notifies that he had a message and asks if he wanted to read it. Then he opens the message, and the message says that the kiss of death was killed by Asura. He smiles and thinks that this Asura would be a pretty interesting guy. A colossal monster appears before that fighter. This was the boss of the 22nd floor. Back at Zhang's house, while Zhang and his sister were having breakfast, Zhang asks her not to go out and to finish her homework. He would have to leave quickly. A message appears on Zhang's cell phone. He tells his sister that Pan Pan's cousin had a suitable job for him. Feng is worried and says that she heard that her cousin's profession is quite scary and dangerous. Zhang, while leaving, tells his sister not to worry, as now she knows what he is really capable of, and emphasizes again that she should not leave the house. She says goodbye to him and says okay, and asks him not to do anything too dangerous and to stay safe. A few hours later, Zhang had arrived at the marked address, a place that looked abandoned. He was walking around lost, as the address was correct, but he had not seen anyone yet, until he notices something and, looking to the side, sees Pan Pan waving and calling him, saying it was that way. She opens a gate and asks him to enter, as her cousin was inside. Zhang says that this place looked abandoned for a long time. The two enter, and apparently the place is a warehouse. 
In the center, there were four people talking about something. Pan Pan draws everyone's attention and introduces her guest, Zhang, whom she had mentioned to them earlier. Pan Pan also introduces her cousin, saying that his name is Kai. After that, Kai says that Pan Pan had mentioned that Zhang had great abilities and needed money. Kai extends his hand and asks if Zhang was interested in joining his team. Zhang puts his hand on his head and says that he really needed a job, but still did not know exactly what they would be doing. Kai sighs and says that they would be going to zones occupied by the enemy, but this surprises Zhang. Kai starts to explain that monsters from the magical domain have been invading and occupying many cities recently. However, in these cities that the monsters attacked and dominated, there are not only monsters, there are also treasures like properties, antiques, rare works of calligraphy, paintings, and so on. Various rich people are interested in these things and wish to collect them. Kai emphasizes that this job is extremely dangerous, as there is always a chance of encountering a monster. Additionally, since the National Security Bureau prohibits ordinary citizens from entering these zones, what we are doing is illegal. However, it's all for the money they need, so they can't be too concerned about the risks involved. Another guy named Steele arrives in ads saying, no risk, no reward. So, Zhang should join them. Madman, another member of the group, says each would earn 300,000 per trip and asks Zhang what he thinks about that amount. Right behind him was the fourth member, Lauba, who just listened without saying anything. Zhang starts to think about it and realizes that 300,000 is indeed a lot of money, not to mention that his sister couldn't wait much longer. All that Zhang had so far was 800,000, 500,000 he had earned from Miss Zhang, and another 300,000 from selling the demonic orbs. However, a kidney is very expensive. These 300,000 would be excellent for his sister's treatment. After a while thinking, Zhang smiles and agrees with the terms and says he accepts. Kai quickly hugs Zhang, happy, and says that he really has courage. Kai says there is more good news. Their boss doubled the payment, so they would receive three million. However, the job would be more difficult. The rest of the group celebrated, as now they would receive 600,000 each. But Zhang was a little apprehensive and asked what they would be searching for this time. Kai replies that it is a scroll of painting and calligraphy from the Five Dynasties period. Kai says this scroll is in the Jiangdong Museum. This museum is probably a reference to the National Palace Museum in the Jiangdong district. After everything was confirmed, Kai says they should meet at 4 o'clock in the afternoon tomorrow. The next day, early in the morning at Jiang's house, he has just woken up and sees his sister already awake and asks why he is waking up so early. She needs to rest as much as possible to get better. Feng tells Jiang not to worry, as she knows he was going to work today. So she prepared breakfast for him to eat in peace. Jiang approaches her to grab a toast, but notices there are two apples on the table. So he asks where his sister got these apples. Feng, smiling, says the neighbor who just moved in gave them some as a welcome gift. Feng emphasizes that he seems like a very nice gentleman. While Zhang eats, he says that, with the current lack of resources, especially fresh fruits and vegetables, two apples must have cost at least a few hundred. The new neighbor was really generous. Zhang turns around and says he needs to leave. He says goodbye to his sister and tells her she could keep the apples, but next time she should not accept things from strangers. Feng agrees with him, says goodbye, and asks him to take care. While walking, Zhang thinks that today's operation is very dangerous, and therefore, before sleeping, he had absorbed the demonic soul orbs he still had. Zhang opens his system window to look at his current status. Name, Asura, number, CV2, 4751176, life, 110, MP120, damage, 4 to 14, speed 15, attributes, strength 14, normal people have 10 points, mentality 11, normal people 10, spirit 12, normal people 10, agility 15, normal people 10, skill, summoning art level 1, ranking SSS, equipment, none, overall evaluation, beginner adventurer. Zhang thinks his current strength has already reached 14 points, and even though he hasn't tested it yet, Zhang is sure he can already surpass 600 kilos. Not to mention his agility, which is already at 15 points. If they encounter a Devil's Cave monster, he could probably handle it. But Zhang is still apprehensive about this and hopes that this mission will be as peaceful as possible. Finally, Zhang arrives at the meeting point. His companions are already there and wave for him to come quickly. Kai offers a dead and plucked chicken to Zhang, saying that at the right time, he would need it. Zhang takes the chicken in his hands and asks why he would need that. Kai begins to explain that the monsters of the Devil's Cave like to eat corpses, 
If Zhang became the target of any monster, he should just throw this at the monster's face and run to save his life. Zhang says he understands and puts the chicken in his bag. Madman shouts for them to hurry up. Kai says they are going, and then they start to climb the wall with a rope. As soon as Zhang reaches the top, he joins his team and sees the tragedy that occurred right in front of him. The city completely destroyed and dominated by monsters. Kai comes next to Zhang and says he is Pan Pan's friend, so he doesn't want anything bad to happen to him. Kai tells Zhang that he just needs to stay close to him and listen to his commands. Then he would return home whole. Zhang says he understands and would try to do everything right. Madman begins to enter the city and asks them to hurry up, as it is getting late. Thus, everyone enters the city and begins to walk through the streets. Laoba turns to Kai and says that, after this, he should find a way to get rid of the boy. It is inconvenient to deal with dead weight. Kai responds that he was thinking about this as well. They reach a point that is all destroyed and with no exit. Kai smiles and says they have arrived. Zhang asks how they have arrived, if there is not even an entrance there. Kai looks forward and asks Madman if he had found anything. Madman, who was on top of some rubble, crouches down and finds a sign under some rocks pointing to the entrance. Kai says it is now time for Laoba to act. He gets ready and asks everyone to get out of the way. Laoba punches with strength that, as soon as it hits the wall, causes a small explosion and throws rocks everywhere, creating a hole in the wall. Kai looks at Zhang and says that Laoba is the strongest among them and that his strength is currently at 12 points. Zhang thinks that, if he has 12 points, Laoba's strength is lower than his. They start entering through the hole in the wall. Kai warns everyone that the monsters of the Devil's Cave like to lurk in dark places. It is pitch black inside, so there could be monsters hiding there. Everyone must stay alert. They continue advancing through a corridor where there are human bone remains scattered around the corners until they find a door. Kai goes ahead and tries to open the door. After opening the door, they finally reach the main exhibition hall. Kai asks everyone to be very careful from then on. Kai starts to look at the paintings on the wall, searching for what they really came for. At the bottom of the paintings, there are some names marked, identifying each painting. After looking at this, Kai realizes that it is not what he really wants. Zhang finds a painting titled, A Gift for the Prince, and asks if it is what they are looking for. Kai goes up to the painting and compares it with the image on his cell phone, and realizes it is exactly what they were looking for. Kai smiles and says they found it. He takes the painting off the wall and stores it in his bag. Everyone gathers. Madman laughs and says it was a great job. As soon as he receives the payment, he would go straight to a yunding club to have fun. Zhang turns around and notices something wrong and asks if they were not missing a person. Everyone starts to look around, and Madman asks where Steel is. Kai takes his phone and tries to contact Steel, but so far there was no response. Lauba starts to get irritated, asking how it is possible for someone to just disappear like that. Kai turns to them and says they could not stay there waiting, as it is very dangerous. Kai emphasizes that he left a message for Steel, and that they should head out first. But while they were talking, something was on the roof looking at them. Everyone starts running towards the exit. Zhang notices something and suddenly, something falls to the ground causing a cloud of dust. Kai turns around, startled, and says that, unfortunately, they ended up finding one. Zhang, not understanding, asks what was this thing that had fallen in front of them. Suddenly, a monster begins to emerge from the midst of the dust cloud. This monster is level two of the Devil's Cave. Quickly, Lauba runs out and jumps to attack the monster, saying the others could go ahead. He would take care of the monster. The monster looks at Lauba, who, without hesitating, grabs his dagger and tries to strike the monster, but it doesn't work. The monster easily breaks his weapon, leaving Laoba surprised, as the monster's skin was extremely thick. As Laoba stood there, stunned by what happened, the monster, without wasting time, turns and goes on the attack. Laoba realizes he wouldn't have time to dodge, so he tries to defend himself using his arms. The monster's blow was so strong that the entire place fills with dust, which leaves everyone there surprised. Kai shouts for Laoba, as he didn't know if he was okay after that blow. The monster remains standing and the dust begins to dissipate and Laoba begins to appear. He is kneeling. Laoba says he's fine, although he has broken both arms. Zhang, after seeing all this, thinks this monster really is terrifying. As Laoba weighs more than 120 kilos and yet was thrown into the air with just one blow, the monster opens its mouth and makes a very loud noise, which completely frightens Zhang. He takes his chicken and throws it to the monster, which gets distracted with the chicken. Kai screams for everyone to run as fast as possible, but quickly the monster turns its attention back to the group and starts to chase everyone there. 
Zhang looks back and realizes that the monster was very close to Madman and Lauba. Then Madman turns around and yells for Kai to get everyone out, as he would stay and fight against this monster with everything he has. Madman's attacks start to have a small effect on the monster. Lauba shouts that, as friends, even if he died there, it would at least be fighting together. Lauba grabs a grenade in his hand and throws it at the monster, shouting for Kai to get out. The grenade gets very close to the monster and explodes right in front of it, creating a dense smoke that covers even Madman and Lauba. As soon as the flash from the explosion passes, Zhang turns around screaming for the names of his companions. Kai, still covering his face, complains about the whole situation. Kai, crying, shouts to Zhang that now was not the time to mourn. They needed to get out of there if they wanted to live. Kai grabs Zhang by the arm and starts running towards the exit, saying that as soon as they could get out of the tunnel, they would be safe. The two begin to exit through the hole they entered. But as soon as Kai looks outside, he is completely scared because the monster was right in front of them. And it was not just one, but several, and from all sides, leaving the two completely surrounded. The monsters begin to approach the two. Kai throws his bag to Zhang and says that the scroll is inside and asks Zhang to get out of there. However, he had one request. Kai says that from now on, Zhang should take care of Pan Pan as if she were his sister. Zhang yells, saying he wouldn't accept that. If they were going to get out of there, it would be together. Kai aims his gun at the monsters while screaming and starts firing several times against the monsters, screaming for them to die. But this isn't being very effective against the monsters that continue to advance. One of them tries to hit Kai, who quickly jumps back, dodging the monster's blow. While Kai moves quickly, he grabs a grenade and throws it at the monsters, causing another explosion, covering his view. Suddenly, one of the monsters appears right behind him. Zhang screams for Kai to be careful, but the monster manages to hit him, throwing him far away, crashing hard against a rock. Kai is still awake but can't move properly. The monster comes running towards him. He wonders if this will really be his end. The monster jumps with everything to hit Kai, who is already hopeless as he can't move. Zhang starts to move quickly and gets in front of the monster in the blink of an eye, standing in front of Kai, who is surprised by this movement. Zhang, at that moment, is angry and yells, starting to move towards the monster. With just one punch, he throws the monster away. Kai, seeing this, is completely amazed and asks how Zhang is so strong, as with just a simple punch he threw the monster away. The monster starts to get up. Zhang looks at his hand and says that, even though this is not a big problem, he is still not used to fighting monsters with his own hands. Zhang points out that if several monsters decide to come all at once, they would have no chance of beating them all. Kai tells Zhang to stay calm, as the monsters from the Devil's Cave have an unusual habit. They do not kill the prey of another while that monster does not give up. The others would not attack. The monsters prepare again. Zhang turns to all of them and says that if that is the case, then it's fine by him. The monster screams and prepares to attack Zhang, who remains calm in front of the monster. He looks at the monster and says it really is strong. But is it fast enough? The monster gets angry and tries to hit Zhang, who jumps and quickly appears on top of the monster and yells for it to die while hitting a punch in the monster's face. One of the monster's eyes gets injured, and green blood begins to flow. The monster tries again to catch Zhang, who is right in front of him. Kai, seeing this, is quite relieved. He even praises Zhang, saying that all this is beautiful to watch. The monster still tries to do something, but simply falls in front of Zhang. He cleans himself and says that his attack was indeed quite risky, but he was fast enough. Zhang looks at his hand and thinks that was one down, now only three left. Zhang looks at them all and says that today, they would all be defeated, no matter what methods he needs to use. The monsters prepare, and one of them starts to advance towards Zhang. He prepares but suddenly feels something. Someone stepped on his shoulder. It was a woman with a flower tattoo on her arm. She delivers a strong blow to one of the monsters and stops among them. One of the monsters tries to attack her, but she jumps again and dodges the attack with some joy. She looks at the monster and lands another blow, resulting in a critical attack, breaking the monster's bones and throwing it away. Zhang sees her movements and thinks she is extremely strong. Her kick easily reaches 2,000 caddies. She stops in front of Zhang and calls him. Zhang tries to say something, but a car appears just in time and stops in front of him. This woman asks him and his friend to get into the car quickly. Zhang agrees and picks up Kai by the arms while the woman pushes one of the monsters that was near away. The man inside the car calls the woman to get into the car as well, because another group was approaching. She agrees and comes running to the car. As soon as everyone is inside the car, she yells to get out of there quickly. Then, they engage the gear and accelerate the car quickly, 
getting out of there as fast as possible. Several monsters are left behind, trying to catch the car, but they can't. Zhang looks back and sees a monster trying to hit the car, but the car manages to pass them without much difficulty. The man driving the car says they cannot head for the city wall, as there are too many monsters behind them. If that number reaches the wall, they could invade Tianfeng, and that would be terrible. The woman thinks a little about this. She looks back and tells Zhang and Kai to do something instead of just watching. Zhang turns around without understanding much of what is happening. The woman begins to open the sunroof of the car and says that if they don't want to die, then they need to help. She takes her bag and throws it to Zhang, telling him to stand up and start working, as she didn't want to have risked saving them in vain. As soon as Zhang opens the bag, he sees that there are several grenades. The woman says they are just flash grenades. He needs to throw them all behind them to scare those monsters. Zhang and the woman climb up to the sunroof while the car continues to flee and start launching all the grenades. The woman then stops Zhang for a moment. Then she takes one more grenade, he takes another, and they throw several at once, which start to explode right in the middle of the monsters, causing a big explosion. They finally manage to escape. Zhang sits down, a bit apprehensive, thinking who this woman could be, and how she has so many weapons and supplies like this. The man driving the car turns around and asks Zhang and Kai what they did to attract so many monsters from the Devil's Cave. Kai takes the lead and quickly begins to say that they did nothing wrong. They just wanted to return home and pay their respects to the deceased, but they did not expect to encounter monsters from the Devil's Cave. Kai thanks them for saving him and his younger brother. Zhang just watches silently while the woman assesses all this without saying a word. The woman turns to Zhang and asks what his name is, because when he was fighting the monsters, he was very agile and brave. It was admirable. Zhang is startled by the question and answers that his name is Zhang. The woman puts her hand on her chin and tells him to listen carefully. In the future, he should not enter areas occupied by enemies, as it is extremely likely that he will lose his life doing such a thing, unless he becomes a fighter from the magical domain. Zhang thinks that, although this woman's identity is a mystery, she seems to have no bad intentions. Finally, they arrive at the wall. The woman says that if they were injured, they should seek help at the nearest hospital. They would leave them there. The two thank her and get out of the car. Zhang, holding Kai, asks him who that woman was. Kai replies that he doesn't know either, but it seems they are fighters from the magical domain. Otherwise, they would not have defeated those monsters so easily. Zhang looks at his bag and notices it was torn. He apologizes and says that, unfortunately, the monsters tore the bag, so they lost the scroll they had taken. Kai sighs and says that, unfortunately, it's fate, but fortunately they did not lose their lives. Later in the hospital, Zhang was walking through the halls, saying that the day had been very long and stressful. Today, as he looked at his phone, Zhang thinks that if that mysterious woman had not suddenly appeared, he and Kai could have died. It is also really a pity that the scroll has disappeared, and they did all this for nothing. As Zhang was going up the stairs, he bumps into a masked man who was coming down. Zhang apologizes, but suddenly feels something and realizes that the man's face was very familiar to him. The man says nothing, just lowers his head and continues walking. Zhang turns back and looks again. Then, Zhang remembers Steel and wonders if it could really be him. Zhang is a bit confused, as he had disappeared mysteriously in the ruins and now simply could be there. Zhang is troubled by this situation and thinks he would like to know where this man was going. Zhang starts to follow this man everywhere until they arrived at an alley. Zhang looks discreetly. The man takes out his phone and starts talking to his boss, saying that he was already in the place and was sure that he was not being followed. Zhang, seeing this, begins to think if all this was his fault. Suddenly, two men start to come. An old man and his bodyguard arrive at the location. The old man asks if he had what the old man wanted. Steel answers yes and takes what was on his back. As soon as he opens the scroll, it was inside. He asks about the money, and the old man replies that he could rest easy, as not a penny would be missing. The old man takes the scroll and opens it to check. While looking at the scroll, the old man says he likes Steel because he was cruel and ruthless. To keep the three million, he betrayed all his friends who had been working with him for ten years. That is indeed a relentless person. Zhang watching this hidden, thinks that Steel was really a bastard, as he was able to leave his entire team behind just for money. The old man closes the scroll and says everything was right. Then, his bodyguard takes a briefcase in his hands, and as soon as he opens it he shows the three million in cash. Quickly, Steel takes the money and says that to survive, one must be ruthless. But as soon as Steel turns his back to leave, 
the guard takes a gun in his hands and points it at Steele, who is puzzled. Steele turns around and sees the gun pointed at him and screams, asking what the meaning of this is. But mercilessly, the bodyguard shoots, killing Steele on the spot. The old man looks at Steele on the ground and repeats the same words he said, To survive, it is necessary to be ruthless, and emphasizes that this was very well said, but the old man was more ruthless than Steele. The old man turns around and says, He despised trash like Steele. The two stop. John quickly hides, covering his mouth with his hand, and thinks that with just one shot, they killed Steele without hesitation. John wonders who this boss Lee could be, but first, he needed to get out of there as soon as possible. Sometime later, John was arriving at his house. His sister runs outside. John was nervous and sighing. His sister smiles and waves at him, asking how his day at work was. John gets close to her and asks them not to lie about it, as it was really a big story. First, they should enter their house. As they were about to enter, the neighbor comes out with a black bag in his hand. Fung looks at him and greets him, calling him uncle. Zhang is confused by this and asks who this uncle was. Fung smiling says, this is the uncle who had given them apples earlier. The neighbor looks at the two and smiles and says hi to them. He asks if the man next to Fing was her brother. As soon as Zhang looks at him, he becomes a bit apprehensive, as the scar on the neighbor's face was extremely similar to that of Li's bodyguard. Zhang tries to disguise it and smiles, thanking for the apples earlier. The neighbor smiles and extends his hand, saying there were no problems, as they were all neighbors there and needed to take care of each other in the future. Fung is happy with this and says that's right, and asks if he would like to have dinner with them. Zhang puts his hand in front of her and screams for her to wait. He looks at the neighbor and says that his day was very tiring, and he was very exhausted. Then, he says they should arrange another meeting to get to know each other better. After that, he calls his sister to enter. Feng looks at the neighbor and tells him to find some free time to have dinner with them any day. As soon as Zhang takes his sister inside, he slams the door while the neighbor is looking. He keeps looking at it without saying anything with a strange face. Feng tells her brother that she would prepare dinner, but he doesn't even respond, as he was a bit worried. Zhang starts thinking that this is very strange. It can't be just a coincidence, as the scars were exactly the same. Zhang remembers something and tells his sister that he would go out for a while. Feng looks at him and says that he just arrived. Why would he go out again? Zhang opens the window and tells his sister not to leave the house at all. He thinks he needs to be sure of what's happening, even if it means putting himself in danger. After Zhang leaves through the window, he jumps between the balconies of the building. As soon as Zhang arrives at his neighbor's balcony, he realizes that there are ashes scattered on the floor but as his agility was at 15 points, it would be easy to avoid it. Zhang opens the window of his neighbor, thinking that an ordinary person would not put ashes on their balcony. Quickly, Zhang enters the room and sees only a simple bed. This makes him think that this guy is definitely not an ordinary neighbor, as putting ashes on the balcony, and such minimalist decoration is not common to see around. Zhang crouches down and looks under the bed, finding a hidden box. As soon as he opens the box, he realizes that there is a paper inside, along with some other things. As soon as he picks up the paper, he realizes it is a fighter authentication certificate from the magical domain. The certificate said, Huang, congratulations on passing the first order of the magical domain fighter evaluation. This certificate is issued hereby. Zhang gets nervous when he sees this because now he was sure of what he was thinking. Indeed, his neighbor was the man who was in that alley. Zhang thinks he is pretending to be a good neighbor and rented a room next to his. What is he really planning? Suddenly, someone makes noise from the other side of the door. Zhang turns around in fright as Huang opened the door, yelling for him to get out of there. But as Zhang had realized earlier that someone was opening the door, he hid under the bed. However, Huang continued at the door yelling for him to come out quickly. Zhang hopes Huang thinks he escaped through the window, because if he really found him there, Zhang would have to face him alone. Huang starts to smile and, with a gun in his hand, he starts to enter the room. Zhang still continues under the bed, sweating cold. Huang, while walking through the room, tells Zhang to come out. Then Huang points the gun and says he knew he was there. This puts Zhang in panic, 
as Huang knew he was there. Huang was a good fighter and was still armed. The clock starts to approach 8 o'clock and suddenly the clock alarms, leaving Zhang not knowing what to do. Huang with a cold look smiles and says he found him. Zhang freezes in fear. Huang turns his gun to the noise of the clock and fires, but the clock started to open the portal, and as soon as the shot was going to hit Zhang, a blue glow lights up the entire room. Huang closes his face and analyzes all this. Suddenly, he kicks the bed up and realizes that Zhang was no longer there. He crouches down and picks up the bullet that was on the ground. He analyzes the bullet and sees that there was no blood on the bullet. Then Huang realizes that the magical domain opens at 8 o'clock, probably Zhang had gone there. Huang smiles and says he would stay there waiting for him to return with a killer face. He drops the bullet on the ground, smiling. Meanwhile, Zhang is in the middle of the portal. Some system screens start to appear for him. Zhang thinks that surely his neighbor would be waiting for him to return, and he could not stay there forever, because after 12 hours he would run out of stamina and would be forced to return. Zhang keeps thinking about what he could do. The system window opens and says, Welcome to the magical domain. To which floor would Zhang like to go? Zhang thinks he needs to get much stronger in these 12 hours, otherwise he will have no chance against that guy. So, he chooses the fourth floor. As soon as he enters the fourth floor, he realizes that the fourth floor is still being controlled and thinks that maybe the death zone had not disappeared from there yet. This is really complicated because with this, Zhang could not leave the altar and consequently would not get stronger. Two people were talking about the death zone. One of them says that the management team said that the death zone would end soon. The other, a little annoyed, says that he had been waiting for more than 10 hours and nothing yet. They continued to talk asking each other how the situation was, if anyone had any new news about the death zone. A group of people next to Zhang starts to comment on the subject. One of them says that the death zone can only disappear after its boss is defeated, and it seems a lot of powerful people are preparing to enter the death zone. Another man says that from what he heard, only those who have an invitation to the death zone can enter it. Another says that's right, only the bosses receive the invitations and it's quite difficult to get because out of every hundred bosses only one receives the invitation. The man emphasizes that they, who are novices, should not think about it. As much as the rewards of the death zone were very good, it still isn't worth the risk because the death zone is a very dangerous place. That's why he wouldn't care if he got an invitation. Zhang opens his inventory and takes his invitation in hand. The system shows that the death zone invitation is grade C. It is used to enter the death zone and can be used only once. Zhang looks at the invitation and has an idea. A notification appears for him, saying that the death zone was already open and asking if he would like to enter. Zhang thinks of all the monsters he has defeated and all the other floors he has passed. It made no sense for him to go back now not to mention that he couldn't even leave the fourth floor. And on top of all that, there was his neighbor, who was a fighter waiting to kill him on the other side of the gate. So he had no choice. Zhang presses the yes option and decides to use his death zone invitation. The system updates and says that the use was successful. Zhang will enter the death zone in three seconds. The system asks him to get ready. A countdown begins. At three, energy begins to envelop the invitation. At two, the energy begins to envelop Zhang. At one, a glow starts below his feet. The system announces that he is entering the death zone. Suddenly, he is thrown into a place where everything is red, a destroyed city, bats everywhere. In front of him, there was a group of people. He looks at all this and wonders what could have happened there. Zhang was confused and wondering if the magical domains were intersecting, as there were people from other countries there. Suddenly, a hand touches Zhang's shoulder, calling him. As soon as he turns around, he is surprised, because who was there was Yue Ying. She was all happy because she had finally found him. Yue Ying says that last time, he had saved her life, and since then, she has been looking for him to return the favor. But she never found him. She really didn't expect to find him right in the death zone. Liu asks if Zhang really saved her with the elite sober wolf last time. Yue Ying goes near Zhang and says that's exactly it. Zhang had saved her life that day. Zhang nods at them and says it was nothing. They don't need to mention that day. Yue Ying introduces her companions. 
The first man in a black cloak is her uncle Liu, known as Killing the Wind. The young man behind him is Yue Ying's younger brother, known as a Midsummer Night's Dream. Liu crosses his arms and says that Feng really had courage, as he came to the death zone alone. Liu points out that this place is completely different from the magical domain, as there are many scary monsters and many foreign adventurers. There are always situations where people fight for monsters and items, and that's why Zhang shouldn't be alone. Liu extends his hand and asks Zhang to join them. Yue Ying's brother says that this is really a great choice, as his uncle Liu is an adventurer, ranked as excellent. So, certainly Zhang would be safer if he went with them. As soon as Zhang hears that he is ranked as excellent, he is surprised, because according to the Magical Domain Guide, the skill ratings of an adventurer are as follows. Novice, proficient, powerful, and maximum level. This man Liu is ranked as excellent. He doesn't seem to be weak. Zhang thinks for a moment and says it's his first time coming to a death zone and it really is quite dangerous. They shake hands and say it's their first time there, so it would be really good if they stayed together. Liu holds Zhang by the shoulders and says he is liking Zhang more and more, because in addition to being brave and strong, he is not arrogant. Yue Ying just smiles beside them. Yue Ying looks at Zhang with a happy face and thinks that she was afraid he would refuse the invitation because if that happened, she wouldn't be able to return the favor. Zhang opens his system and forms a group with them. Liu says that now, officially Zhang was in the group, so they should talk about their skills one by one so they could help each other in the future in case a problem arose. Zhang agrees with this, saying that Liu was right. Liu holds his sword and says his talent is ricochet. Suddenly, a monster attacks them. Liu looks at the monster and strikes it with his sword, throwing it away. The monster falls to the ground. The system announces that the ricochet talent can push the target 10 steps back while stunning it for 30 seconds. A Midsummer Night's Dream says his talent is illusion. With it, he can create an illusion of the target for an hour. He begins to conjure his energy in his hand, concentrates, and creates an illusion of himself, however. This illusion cannot fight. Yue Ying says her talent is Light Slash. She says that Zhang probably saw it last time they met. She asks what his talent was. Zhang feels a little apprehensive but thinks that sooner or later, people would end up knowing his talent, so there was no problem in saying it there. So, he starts to say what his talent is, and a glow starts around his body. Zhang conjures energy in his hand while everyone watches, and a goblin warrior appears there. Zhang says his talent is Summoning Art. A Midsummer Night's Dream doesn't understand anything. Liu thinks that it could be strong. Yue Ying is impressed, thinking that it is very strong. She asks if all the summoned beasts obey his orders. He replies that yes. Liu turns and asks them to join as quickly as possible. Since everyone had introduced themselves, they should run. There were already people in the village, and if the boss was stolen from them, they would have to return empty-handed. As they ran down the road, Zhang asks if the boss in the death zone is much stronger than those in the magical domain, and if that's the case, would it leave much better rewards? Right? Liu replies, That's exactly it. The death zone is equivalent to a separate instance. It will leave things like attributeless demon soul orbs, high-level equipment, rare items, and other good things. But at the same time, the danger is multiplied. Liu says that this time, to have better chances, he had called Yue Ying and her brother Littler. Suddenly an explosion occurs right in front of them. Zhang is impressed and asks what had happened there. Some adventurers were fighting against villagers. Liu says that these villagers must be possessed by something, and that's why they are acting like this. Liu says they need to ignore this and look for the boss first. They start to run and ignore everyone. Liu asks everyone to stay alert and as close to him as possible. He says that this village is built like a maze, and that's why almost everything looks the same. As they ran, Zhang stops and yells that they had already passed by there before. Yue Ying turns around and asks if they were really walking in circles. Zhang notices something else and warns everyone that they are coming. Yue Ying is frightened by this. Everyone stops and stays on alert. Suddenly screams of monsters are heard, and a group of them was coming, leaving Liu and his group surrounded. He asks no one to panic. He takes his sword and says he would take care of the front, Yue Ying would stay at the rear, Littler and Zhang would stay in the middle. 
They would fight while moving, so they couldn't lose focus because of the monsters. They get into formation and the monsters start to run to attack. The monsters scream and jump from everywhere to attack. Zhang summons two goblins, one warrior and one caster. He looks to his side and sees that Littler was trembling with fear and thinks that he must be a novice too. The two summoned goblins die quickly. Zhang is surprised by this, as the attack and defense of these monsters are very strong. Another monster jumps towards Zhang, but quickly Liu jumps in front of him and cuts the monster in half. Liu looks back and thinks that because Zhang had saved Yue Ying, he thought Zhang was very strong, but unfortunately he doesn't seem to be. Suddenly clouds form quickly, someone yells for Liu to be careful, and a lightning bolt strikes right on his head, making him think that someone attacked him. The lightning causes 277 damage to Liu. A person in a red cloak catches Liu's attention, saying that they have met again. This man is called Mysterious Professor. The two stare at each other. The professor begins to conjure his magic on his staff. He points the staff at Liu. A large ball of lightning begins to form. Liu says that he is under the effect of something paralyzing, so he couldn't move. He yells for everyone to be careful. After a few seconds, the red energy explodes above Liu, making him fall to his knees on the ground. Yue Ying screams in fright, asking if her uncle was okay, but without anyone noticing, an arrow was coming towards Yue Ying. Someone yells for her to be careful. She manages to see the arrow in time and defends herself, cutting the arrow in half. She looks up from one of the buildings and sees a person. This person is called Night Spirit. Zhang summons another goblin and asks it to attack, but another person appears in front of them and attacks with great force, throwing the goblin away. This man is called Harrison. Zhang realizes that Harrison's attack strength is really scary. Liu yells that, unfortunately, the three of them met again. Liu says he thought they wouldn't appear again, causing trouble after he let them go last time. They are nothing but ungrateful. The professor says that Liu brought three novices to the death zone. How could they let such an opportunity pass? If they can laugh at the end of it all, what's the harm in being ungrateful? The professor attacks again with his lightning, hitting Liu. This leaves Liu paralyzed again. He thinks that if this happens, they would certainly die there. Liu takes a potion in his hand that can remove paralysis. He thinks that clearly the professor and his companions are eager to kill them. How would he protect the novices like this? He takes the potion. Yue Ying, by the name of her uncle, Liu thinks that Yue Ying is the hope of his family, so he needs to give everything for her safety. A green energy begins to run through his body. The potion takes effect. Now he can move. The professor laughs because the potion that Liu took, activation, nullifies all penalties for 30 seconds. However, it comes at a high cost. The user receives 20% more damage. Yue Ying is worried about her uncle because he really took the activation potion, and that means he is ready to put his life on the line. Liu faces the three right in front of him. He yells for Yue Ying and the others to run away and not worry about him. Yue Ying doesn't know what she should really do because she feels that if her uncle is left alone, he would certainly die. The professor orders Harrison to attack. He goes all out and says that no one would escape from there. Liu says they are talking too much, so this should end now. Liu hits Harrison, throwing him away. Yue Ying just watches the fight apprehensively, unable to do anything. She turns and calls everyone to run away, but the archer Night Spirit aims her arrow at them and says, she won't let anyone leave. She shoots four arrows at once while the three run. Yue Ying is in charge and says for them to hide, but Zhang turns and realizes that these are not simple arrows, but tracking arrows. Yue Ying asks everyone to be careful and says this is the talent of Night Spirit. She takes her sword and uses her talent, but one of the arrows manages to pass, hitting her in the chest, causing 407 damage. Yue Ying screams in pain. She takes the arrow and pulls it out of her body, saying that their target is Liu, so they wouldn't try to get rid of them for now. Littler asks Yue Ying what they should do. She says they need to find a place to hide and, once the boss of the death zone is killed, they could leave. So, the three start running again while they look for somewhere to hide. Yue Ying sees only the professor's lightning falling from the sky. Yue Ying says she had a question. As far as she knows, adventurers can only fight against the monsters of the magical domain of their own country. So how did Liu meet all these foreigners? 
He opens his inventory and says that only two furry goblins and three hidden bosses that have not been summoned yet are left. Yue Ying responds that, indeed, magical domains from different countries do not intersect, but death zones do. Yu Ying thinks that her uncle probably fought these guys before. Littler says it's all his fault, as if he had known that death zones were like this, he wouldn't have insisted on coming, since his talent is completely useless. Yue Ying gets angry at this and asks if he is a man or not, as he has only encountered a small problem and is already crying, trembling with fear. Zhang tries to cheer up Littler, saying that his talent is strong, they just need to find an efficient way to use it. Littler puts his hands on his head, almost crying, and asks Zhang to stop trying to comfort him, as his talent is very strong, capable of summoning monsters and helping, but an illusion is completely useless. Yuang notices something and asks them to stop talking for a minute and asks if they heard something. A loud noise echoed everywhere. They turn quickly and Zhang realizes that it can only be one thing. A huge foot with chains, a strange face with a mouth in the belly, a hook in one hand, and an axe in the other. This is the Butcher of Death. The three look at each other, and Yue Ying is scared, thinking that this is really the boss. Littler thinks they are very unlucky, as they just escaped death and now encounter the Death Zone boss. Yue Ying is worried, thinking what they would do, as without her Uncle Liu, they would have no chance. Zhang asks for silence, as it seems the boss hasn't discovered them there yet. Littler falls to the ground in panic, saying that behind them there are foreigners trying to kill them, and in front of them, the Butcher of Death. This time, they are really doomed to death. Zhang thinks they cannot just wait for death like this. He takes action and says that if there's no other choice, then they will defeat the boss together. He takes his bow. Yu Ying is scared. Littler yells, not reconciling with this, saying that the monster in front of them is the Death Zone boss. How are they going to defeat it? Yu Ying puts her hand on Littler's shoulder and tells Zhang that this time Littler is right. How are they going to defeat the Death Zone boss? Zhang turns to them and says, He really doesn't have a plan for this, but waiting there for death is unacceptable. He prefers to fight for life than to sit and wait for death. Littler goes to him and says that's also correct, but what if the three foreign adventurers decide to attack them while they fight the Death Zone boss? That would certainly be the end of them. Zhang smiles and says that at that moment, Littler's talent will be perfect. Littler doesn't understand and asks how his talent would help with anything. Meanwhile, the professor and his companions were nervous, as Liu had a random teleportation scroll. They would never have predicted such a thing, as that thing is really expensive. As far as they remember, it cost tens of thousands on the platform. Liu is really a very rich guy. Night Spirit, while picking up one of the orbs on the ground, says that Liu was very lucky this time, as she could have taken her revenge tonight. The professor asks her not to feel bad like that, as Liu fled with only 10% of his life. If he is unlucky enough to have teleported to a place surrounded by monsters, he certainly wouldn't come out alive. Night Spirit smiles and thinks it would be even better if he fell straight into the boss. Harrison laughs and says that would be excellent. Suddenly the professor feels something and yells for the other two to look behind. They turn around in fright, as behind them is the Death Zone boss. The three are right in front of the boss at the moment. Harrison starts laughing and thinks they finally won the lottery, as they would earn a lot of money if they killed the Death Zone boss. The professor laughs and says they were really lucky this time, so they would have to quickly take advantage before other people got there. Night Spirit aims her arrow and says that the S-ranking equipment that the monster drops would be hers. She jumps and starts firing numerous arrows at once at the boss, but they all pass straight through and do not cause any damage to the boss. The professor, seeing this, wonders if the boss is immune to physical damage. Then, he conjures his magic again and says that if he doesn't take physical damage, he will take magical damage and uses his technique, fire and lightning arts. Fires and lightning come out of his staff directly to the monster, but they also pass through the monster without causing any damage. The professor yells, asking what was really going on there because he didn't take any damage. Harrison says it's really very strange. He himself had never faced a boss like this. The professor thinks this might be some ability of the boss. He becomes immortal when attacked. Meanwhile, Zhang, Littler, and Yue Ying watched all this through Littler's crystal ball. He asks Yue Ying and Zhang to be quick, 
because he could only keep this up for an hour. Yue Ying turns to Zhang and asks how they were going to fight the boss. He replies that they cannot be careless, and therefore should start with a small test. Zhang summons all his beasts, saying it's their turn to have a little fun. As soon as everyone goes out, Yue Ying puts her hand to her mouth, impressed by the strength Zhang had in his hands. She says he could just summon goblins, but he summoned the bosses of the first, second, and third floors. The dark wolf was drooling, wanting to play. He had just leveled up to level two. Zhang says they didn't have much time, so everyone should attack at the same time. Then, his beasts prepare for the attack. Then, they begin to attack the death zone boss. The boss says they are nothing more than an ant horde. The boss prepares to attack the dark wolf. Zhang notices it and orders it to dodge. The boss hits with great force, screaming for the wolf to die, but the wolf had dodged and counterattacks quickly, causing only 109 damage to the boss. The boss asks if they can feel the breath of death and attacks again, hitting the dark wolf squarely. This time causing 380 damage to the dark wolf, who falls to the ground while the boss screamed for him to die. Zhang realizes that this really is the death zone boss, and what they are doing. There is no joke, as the strength of the monster is something completely out of the ordinary for them. The boss continues to swing his weapons and says that an ant horde can't hurt him. Zhang tells Yue Ying that the strength of the monster is no joke, but she takes her sword and says that the elite dark wolf alone won't be able to defeat the monster. So, they should attack together to try to do something. Zhang uses his venomous spider and orders it to use its web. The monster gets stuck and can't get rid of the webs. Yue Ying leaps to attack and uses her talent, causing multiple damage to the boss. Zhang takes advantage and uses his long-range attacks. The frog and the goblin attack together, causing more damage to the monster, who gets angry, saying he would eat everyone's flesh and drink their blood. Zhang is impressed with the intelligence of the monster, as it seems. The monster knows that it should attack him first. The monster goes all out. Zhang orders his goblin king to defend. The king manages to hold the first attack, but the monster uses its second weapon to attack again, causing 343 damage to the king. Zhang realizes that the monster king uses the skill Bone Crush. The strength of this is terrifying, as the attack, defense, and speed, in addition to the damage of its opponent, is reduced by 20%. The Dark Wolf tries to attack from behind, but the boss turns quickly and strikes the wolf, causing 687 damage to the Dark Wolf. Zhang screams seeing this. His wolf falls to the ground and dies. Zhang gets angry with this because the boss really killed his Dark Wolf. Yue Ying turns and says, It's not time to mourn, because if they don't deal with this situation, soon they would also be dead. Littler starts to feel tired and asks them to hurry up, because he won't last much longer. Zhang takes his bow and says it's time for him to really enter the fight. He asks the spider to use the web again. Zhang asks everyone from a long distance to attack together again. The attacks hit again, causing damage to the monster. Yue Ying takes advantage and attacks again. She notices that the monster is entering its second phase and asks everyone to be careful. The monster's life was currently at 30%. It screams and a red energy runs through its body. Zhang emphasizes once again that now everyone must be very careful, as it is already in the second phase. Suddenly, the monster starts to run, and the two wonder what is going on there. Zhang wonders why it is running away like that. The monster reaches some dead monsters and says it needs to eat meat and starts eating, and its life begins to heal little by little. Yu Ying, seeing this, thinks that now they are really screwed. Zhang can't believe that the monster is really healing by eating meat. Zhang shouts for everyone to attack and disrupt the boss's health recovery. Their long-range attacks strike together while the boss was eating the meats. The frog's attack causes a big explosion, which makes the boss very angry and charges forward. Zhang uses his poisonous spider to trap him, preventing the boss from getting close to the frog. Quickly, the spider uses its web to bind the boss to the ground. Yueng takes advantage and uses her talent once again. Light cut. The Goblin King also doesn't waste time and attacks right after. The boss can even see the Goblin King approaching but can't do anything because he was trapped. The Goblin King lands a strong blow on the boss's back causing a lot of pain. Zhang shouts for everyone to do the same thing again as they were almost defeating the boss. 
Yuan gets excited and shouts that they would finally succeed. Everyone attacks together again, causing great damage to the boss who can't retaliate or defend against so many attacks at once. Zhang grabs his bow and aims his arrow, and while aiming, he says it's time for the boss to die. Then, he fires an arrow that hits right in the middle of the boss's forehead. The boss screams in pain and says he wouldn't accept this, but the boss ends up fainting and falling to the ground with a thud right in front of Zhang. Everyone looks at this without understanding. Littler asks if they really defeated the boss. Suddenly, a huge announcement appears, saying it was an important announcement. The boss of the Death Zone, the Death Butcher, was killed by Asura. Congratulations to him. The monster that was lying down begins to dissolve and leaves several orbs and a bow on the ground. Littler picks up one of the orbs and says, It's really impressive. It's a big adrenaline boost, after all. It's a Death Zone boss. Zhang looks at the items and sees the bow on the ground, then he bends down to pick it up. As soon as he holds it in his hand, he thinks that this is an S-rank weapon. The system says the bow is called Dark Longbow, S-grade, damage 410 to 650, special ability. When used against opponents, 10% of the damage will be absorbed by the user, contributing to life regeneration, durability 300 out of 300. Yue Ying is impressed with the bow saying it's really an amazing weapon, as it has the life regeneration ability. Moreover, the bow is perfect for Zhang. Yueying says it's very lucky, as there are many people who spend decades wandering the magic domain and never even saw an S-rank weapon. Zhang picks up the bow and shoots an arrow upwards to test. A red ray shoots out with great speed from the bow, which surprises Zhang with the strength of the bow. He says he can even feel the bloodthirst that the bow possesses, Zhang opens the system and says the boss dropped a total of 16 demonic soul orbs without attributes, a random teleportation scroll, and four potent regeneration potions. He says he would keep the random teleportation scroll, and the rest they could divide among everyone there. Yueying is surprised by this, and says that Zhang doesn't need to share anything with them, after all he did almost everything alone. But as she was speaking, a notification appears for him saying that Asura had sent items. She needed to check the mail to claim them. This surprises Yueying a lot. Zhang raises his hand and says he had already sent her the items, and asks her not to refuse. After all this, they defeated the boss together. Everyone worked to contribute something. Yueying, a little embarrassed, starts looking at the items and thinks that even though these items can help her in her second grade fighter exam, the one who fought the most, there was Zhang. Suddenly, the professor shouts from afar saying that it seems they were all there all the time. Behind him was his entire team. He said he couldn't believe they were going to deceive him with illusions all this time. Littler gets scared when he sees everyone there. Yuying is outraged that they showed up again. At the moment, everyone stares at each other until Harrison shouts that he wouldn't waste any more saliva or his time on these trash. He charges forward saying he would just kill them and steal all the rewards. Zhang looks back and says, the only summoned beasts remaining were the frog and the goblin king. Thus, their chances of winning would be low. They should leave the death zone immediately. Littler agrees, saying they had already defeated the boss and obtained the rewards, so they could leave. Yuying remains silent with her head down and just says no. She grabs her sword and says the two of them can go ahead if they want. Yuying emphasizes that these people might have killed her uncle. Thus, she wouldn't forgive anyone, let alone let them leave alive. Littler turns to run and says he doesn't care about that, he just doesn't want to die, so he will leave first. Zhang looks at the whole situation and thinks that Yue Ying is very stubborn. She wouldn't leave. He starts to wonder if he should leave her alone there. Yue Ying turns and sees Zhang still standing there. She asks why he hasn't left yet. What she is doing is her personal issue, and he has nothing to do with it especially not with the three in front of them. Zhang starts to gather his energy in his hand again, while saying that even though he has nothing to do with it, he can't just stand there and watch the strangers kill her. Suddenly, an explosion occurs in front of everyone. Zhang shouts for them to taste the power. As the smoke clears, Night Spirit and Harrison can't believe what's in front of them. The Death Zone boss starts to appear in front of them. They start to ask what it is and if it's possible that the Death Butcher regenerated. Another one says, they had never heard of a case where the death zone boss regenerated after being killed. 
They wonder if it's a dream. The professor says it's not a dream. The death butcher is really alive in front of them. Harrison, scared, asks why the death butcher isn't attacking Zhang and Yuang while they are face to face with the boss. Yuang cries and says she would avenge her uncle. Just as she is about to attack, a message appears in her system saying she received a message from Killing the Wind and asking if she would like to read it. At that moment, Yuang starts to tremble and can't believe it. She opens her chat window and starts talking to her uncle. He says he's not dead, so she shouldn't fight to the death against the three strangers. Yue Ying can't believe it and asks if it's really her uncle. He says yes and asks her not to waste any more time and to leave the death zone quickly. Littler had told him what happened. He praises her and Asura, saying they did very well. Yue Ying is happy with that and says she won't waste any more time. She will leave the death zone immediately. She smiles and tells Zhang that her uncle is alive and well and asks them to return. He looks at her and says, That's great news. Yueying starts to retreat and says, they should meet at the altar when they return. Zhang stays there and thinks he doesn't really know what to think about Yueying. She's amazing. While all this is happening, the death butcher was preparing to fight the three. Harrison charges forward, but as he's about to strike, his attack goes straight through and hits the ground. He doesn't understand anything and wonders why the death butcher disappeared again. Back in the fourth floor magic domain, Yueying and Zhang reunite with Liu and Littler. Her uncle comes all happy, saying the two did very well. While Littler quickly looks on from behind, Liu goes up to them and touches Zhang's shoulder, saying he's truly a special young man and that all this proves he was never wrong about his real strength. Zhang says, Liu flatters him. Liu turns to Littler and compares him to Asura, saying he's useless. Littler just stays quiet. Liu hugs Zhang, who doesn't understand what's happening there. He starts saying that their family has blue blood, and that Yue Ying, coincidentally, is single, and as they are the same age, they should talk more. Yue Ying gets embarrassed by this and yells at her uncle. He starts laughing and says he won't talk about it anymore. Zhang cuts off the topic and says he needs Liu's help with something. Liu says he can ask for whatever he needs. Zhang asks Liu how he could defeat a first-level magic domain fighter. Zhang thinks he'll celebrate later, as there's an assassin waiting for him in the real world. Zhang believes that even though Yue Ying's family may not be the strongest in Xia, it is still quite powerful, so its strength should not be underestimated. Liu ponders for a moment and asks Zhang if he's gotten himself into trouble. Liu places his hand on his chest and says, Zhang shouldn't be embarrassed and should just speak up, as he could help him. Zhang smiles and thanks him for the offer of help, but feels he needs to handle this with his own hands. Zhang thinks that the hardest favors to repay in this world are those from true friendships. He needs to do this alone. He remembers he has eight high-level demonic orbs, without attributes. When he absorbs all of them, his abilities will drastically advance. Littler calls Zhang, brother, and says that the magic domain fighters are much stronger than he thinks. Littler emphasizes that Zhang shouldn't underestimate them, as he could lose his life. Yue Ying is worried. Liu steps forward and says that to defeat a magic domain fighter, Zhang will need more than just physical strength. He needs to know the weaknesses of his opponent to fight with strategies. Zhang lowers his head and asks what Liu really means by that. Liu starts to explain that as everyone knows, to become a magic domain fighter, one must pass a series of exams. In fact, the first level of the magic domain exam is quite simple. As long as one's attributes meet the necessary standards, the person passes. However, to stand out more than others, many magic domain fighters focus on strengthening just one type of attribute from the beginning, such as warriors strengthen their strength, assassins strengthen their agility, mages strengthen their advanced spirit. This causes an effect. For example, magic domain fighters who put all their resources into just one attribute will be extremely strong. Their damage will be much more critical than the rest. And the same applies to spirit and agility. Zhang says he now understands the situation better. In summary, this means that even among fighters of the same level, there are differences in their abilities and attributes. Zhang opens his system and notices that among all his attributes, agility is the highest, with 15 points. Zhang thinks that if he continues to add more points and advance in agility, his movements and attack speed will be much higher than other people's. During a battle, this can give him an advantage and help him win. 
Zhang remembers Huang and thinks he still doesn't know which attribute Huang is proficient in. Littler raises his hand and shouts that time in the magic domain is ending. They need to go back. Yuying says if it's not a problem she'll go first. She sends a friend request to Zhang, starts to leave the magic domain, and asks Zhang to be careful. He says he'll be as careful as possible, accepts the friend request and sighs thinking it's time. He collects all the rewards at once. They all start to circulate his body with strong energy around him. Zhang thinks that before returning, he'll absorb all of them. The energy around him begins to expand and become denser. He thinks that with this, he will have a total of 26 skill points after absorbing them. Lightning surrounds his body. He prepares and thinks it's time to give his all in the real world. Inside Wang's room, a blue light illuminates the whole place. It was Zhang who had returned. But as soon as he looks around, he sees no one there and wonders where Huang could have gone. Suddenly he becomes very scared, as there's only one place Huang could be. He runs out of Huang's house, thinking his sister is in danger. He bursts open the door of his house, shouting his sister's name. As soon as he looks into the living room, he sees his sister sitting on the sofa. And next to her, Huang is holding a knife, cutting an apple. Huang greets Zhang, who stands still, looking at the scene. Feng looks at her brother with tears in her eyes. Huang uses the knife to pick up a piece of the apple in his hand and says that Zhang returned earlier than expected and that he wasn't in a hurry, so he invites Zhang to sit for a bit. Huang starts eating the apple while smiling and says he wants to chat for a bit. Zhang yells, saying he should leave his sister out of this. Afterward, they could talk calmly about anything. Huang looks at Feng, who gets scared. He says that, unfortunately, he can't let her go because she has seen his face and, as he is wanted, this could cause a big problem. Zhang starts to get angry and asks what the hell he wants there. Huang starts laughing and holds Feng with the knife at her neck. Feng starts crying and says she wouldn't say anything to the police so he could leave them alone. Huang continues smiling and says that if he chooses to sell their organs on the black market, they would become his greatest wealth. Huang gets very close to Feng's face and says that's why he can't hurt her body too much. Feng continues to be terrified by all this. Suddenly, someone knocks on the door, startling everyone. Huang gets annoyed, asking if Zhang had called the police. Zhang replies that he didn't do anything like that. Huang asks him to open the door and not try any funny business, or he knows what would happen. Zhang thinks that the only thing he did was send a message to Liu Wei, but he arrived too quickly. It can't be him. Zhang starts to open the door slowly. As soon as he finishes opening the door, a woman holding a food package says that the food delivery has arrived. Zhang, not understanding what this was, says he didn't order anything, so the address is probably wrong. The delivery woman says that's impossible. She looks at the door and says that the address was definitely this one and asks if this was some kind of prank. She sees the two on the sofa and asks if they hadn't been the ones who ordered. Zhang gets annoyed with this and slaps her face, saying he didn't order anything, so she should just leave, and he closes the door. Outside, the delivery woman knocks on the door again, annoyed by this, and says that it's not right to do that because delivery people are also human. She turns and starts to leave, thinking Zhang thinks too highly of himself just because he lives in the city, but she starts laughing and takes off her cap, saying that it's right here and that the reward would surely be all hers. Huang gets up from the sofa with the knife in his hand and Feng in the other, telling Zhang to open the door. They were going out. Outside, they go to an all-black car. Zhang asks where they were going. Huang says it's not the time for small talk. He should just get in the car, and that's it. Feng looks at her brother with great fear, but Zhang tells her not to worry, as he would protect her from anything. Huang tells them to get in the car quickly, but something starts approaching them and hits Huang in the arm. He gets annoyed, asking what that was. Huang puts the knife close to Feng and says he should back off or the girl would die. The delivery woman from before starts laughing and says, it looks like she made a mistake. She emphasizes that if he wants to kill Feng, he better do it quickly because it would be easier for her to fight that way. Zhang looks at the woman and thinks she's the delivery woman from before. Huang smiles and asks if she was a bounty hunter. Huang says she's really fast, but she won't be able to catch him. She smiles back and asks Huang not to judge her by her appearance. 
she attacks again and says she'll show what she's really capable of. Huang smiles and says that, unfortunately for that attack, he had Feng as a shield. Zhang starts to lose control seeing this and yells his sister's name. He steps into the middle of the attack, causing one of the weapons to divert, making Huang release his sister. Quickly, he grabs his sister and takes her to the back. He did this so fast that Huang can't understand how it happened. The woman is extremely impressed with the speed Zhang showed, as he was able to catch her darts in the air, divert one of them, and grab his sister in the blink of an eye. Zhang turns and yells, saying that the woman almost hurt his sister. She smiles and says it wasn't her intention, as it wasn't her fault if his sister was in front of her target. Huang starts laughing again, and says that fighting wasn't in his plans for today, but it seems he wouldn't have a choice. The woman prepares to attack, and says that now that no one else was in front of her to hinder her, she wouldn't miss again. Huang looks at her and thinks she must have focused on her speed, but as soon as he takes off his glasses, a power begins to emanate from his eye, putting the woman in a trance. She stands still in front of him. Huang starts laughing, saying that because she had only focused on her speed, the rest of her attributes were just trash and, thanks to that, it was impossible for her to resist his spiritual control, which made her be captured instead of capturing him. Feng looks at this still frightened, as she had never seen strong people fight like this. Zhang also becomes apprehensive and doesn't understand why the woman had stopped attacking like that. Zhang analyzes better and thinks this might be spiritual control. Probably Huang's attribute focus was on the spirit attribute. Zhang sees an opportunity to attack and quickly charges at Huang. He thinks Huang should pay for what he's doing, so he would show the strength of his speed. Huang realizes Zhang was coming at him, but the speed was so great that Huang couldn't do anything and is struck in the belly. As he falls, Huang yells at Zhang not to get cocky and points the gun at him, but Zhang was so fast that before Huang could even fire, Zhang hits another blow to Huang's face, throwing him and the gun away. Huang, lying on the ground, asks how Zhang could be so fast. Zhang sighs and thinks that if Huang had the gun in his hand, he could have died. Feng comes running to her brother, asking if he was okay. He replies that yes. After defeating Huang, they look at the delivery woman from before. Feng asks what's happening with her. Zhang replies that it seems she's hypnotized. Probably, she came just for the money, since she didn't care if she would hurt Feng or not. Feng goes further and asks if they could help her. Zhang asks why Feng wanted to do that, as this woman didn't deserve help since she didn't think twice about hurting an innocent person because of money. Feng turns to her brother and asks if he had one of those pens that don't come off easily. Zhang says he does and runs to get it. Ten minutes later, there were several police officers at the scene and some people filming. While all this was happening, Liu Wei goes to Zhang and says that what he did was very reckless, as he had already warned in a message that Zhang shouldn't do anything alone, and the police and he were going to help. Liu Wei emphasizes that this man named Huang is a serial killer who had already killed seven people. Zhang puts his hand on his head and apologizes to Liu Wei, saying he didn't have time to look at the message. He needed to do something. A police officer comes up to them and tells Liu Wei that this is not the time for a lecture, as now Zhang had become the savior of the city and needed to have his glory. The police officer says that for two whole years, they tried to catch Huang, but he always escaped. The police officer tells Liu Wei that since it was one of his students who captured Huang, he should feel proud of his student. Liu Wei points to Zhang and says that pride is not the most important thing. He was really worried about the safety of Zhang and his sister Feng, but suddenly Liu Wei stops for a moment and asks how Zhang managed to defeat Huang, as he was extremely strong, in addition to being a first-level magic domain fighter. Zhang thinks it's not yet time to tell about his abilities, so he points to the woman from before, saying that if it weren't for her help, he probably wouldn't have been able to defeat Huang. He also says she was hypnotized, as she had been standing there for a long time. The police officer looks at her and says her name is Mengdi, she is a bounty hunter and does anything for money. Feng says her name is quite beautiful. The police officer continues saying that she is very strong and is on the same level as Huang. She has captured other wanted criminals and has caused several problems for the police. The police officer looks closer and asks what happened to her face. Feng sticks out her tongue and says she doesn't know anything. When they saw her, she was already like that. Her face was covered in drawings and scribbles. 
The police officer says he understands and would take them to the police station. As they were putting Mengdi in the car, the police officer says that the reward for capturing Huang was one and a half million. Since Zhang and Feng helped capture him, they could split that. He asked them to go to the station in a few days to collect their part of the reward. Zhang is impressed, as 750,000 raised for him and his sister was a lot of money. His sister smiles and is happy about this. Zhang holds his sister's shoulders and thanks the police officer for this. With this money, they would be able to pay the rent and even buy Feng's kidney. The next day at 8 o'clock at night, Zhang was lying in his bed, thinking that it was time. As he had defeated the death zone boss, the fourth floor should be open now. He activates his watch and decides to head to the fourth floor. At the altar of the fourth floor, everything seems normal. People were organizing into teams as always, and the guards were no longer there. Zhang thinks that his team had many losses in the last fight, but now he has the Death Butcher and the Goblin King, in addition to the Frog's long-range fireball, so he wouldn't have problems with that for now. Zhang picks up the Magic Domain Guide to see the monsters on the fourth floor. The guide shows that there are three types of monsters there. Pighead, Birdman, and the Floor Boss Bullhead. The guide didn't give much information about the monsters' strengths or abilities, so Zhang thinks they seem to be quite strong. He decides to hunt them immediately. Then, he heads alone to the Death Forest, a strange place where there are bones on the ground and some monsters hidden among the trees. Suddenly the hidden monsters start to appear. Zhang crosses his arms and starts calling his beasts to play a little with his guests. The Goblin King and the Death Butcher appear. The monsters look at this, prepare themselves, and charge at the Goblin King. Zhang orders the Goblin King to hold the two without any difficulty. The Goblin King defends the two attacks, but the damage suffered was still considerable. Zhang orders the Death Butcher to take action and attack them. The Butcher starts his attack and hits both monsters at once, causing absurd damage to the two. The first one receives 471 damage, while the second one receives 426 damage. Zhang is impressed with the strength of his beast, the Death Butcher. However, while he was focused on the fight in front of him, a birdman was approaching from behind. Just as the birdman was about to grab him with its claws, he notices and dodges at the last moment. Zhang thinks that the birdman is really fast. He takes his bow and aims at the birdman, saying he would try this S-rank weapon. As soon as Zhang fires, his arrow misses. He gets annoyed with this and calls the frog and asks it to burn this bird quickly. The frog prepares and starts firing its fireballs but the bird starts dodging all the attacks until finally one of them hits, causing a big explosion in the sky and dealing 339 damage to the bird. Zhang starts laughing a lot with this, telling the bird to dodge that. An hour later, the battle had ended. Zhang starts picking up the orbs on the ground, thinking that the defense attributes of these monsters don't seem to be that good. If they were, he probably would have a big problem defeating them. After collecting the orbs, Zhang calls the birdman, saying it was the last one. All the beasts were gathered there now. Zhang opens the system and says it's finally full. Currently, he has a sky-devouring frog, the goblin king, the venomous spider, the death butcher, three pigheads, and three birdmen. With this, Zhang thinks he can move on to the floor boss. As he starts walking, he hears another scream from someone asking for help, saying that someone wanted to kill her. Zhang looks at what's happening and just stays quiet. A woman was running from a man who was yelling at her to stop, saying he would teach her a good lesson today. Zhang stops and starts thinking that this kind of thing happens everywhere he goes. Should he start to mind only his own business? But as he was thinking, the woman throws herself at his feet and grabs his leg, begging him to save her because the man chasing her wanted to kill her. The woman's name in the magic domain is Moonlight Bunny. She looks up crying and begging for help as she would die. Zhang looks at her and says that unfortunately, he can't do anything. She should run to the altar, as she would be safe there. She starts saying that she had completed the task he had given her, and now that they were there, he couldn't just abandon her like that. This confuses Zhang. He asks what she is talking about. The man finally catches up to them. This man is called Fierce Dragon King. He points at Zhang saying that apparently he was the mastermind behind this woman's actions. The man was very angry, saying he despised people like Zhang and, for that reason, he would do society a favor by getting rid of him. 
Zhang asked the fierce dragon to wait a bit, as he was being very aggressive. Zhang thinks he doesn't even know what's happening there, and doesn't know this woman. The man starts yelling while attacking, saying that abandoning his accomplice when things get tough is not worthy of being called a man, so he should die. Zhang says that besides this man having a bad temper, he is also stupid. The woman leaves Zhang behind and says she would go ahead while he takes care of this. The system shows that the woman had stolen three common orbs from him. Zhang realizes that this woman is a thief, and that's why the fierce dragon was angry with her, probably because she had stolen from him as well. The fierce dragon yells at Zhang to return the items that the girl had stolen from him. Zhang says he really doesn't know her, and besides, she had just stolen from him as well. However, the fierce dragon doesn't listen and continues attacking, saying that Zhang just wanted to deceive him. Zhang starts to get annoyed and says this man is really an idiot, and this won't end unless he shows his strength. Quickly, Zhang calls two beasts and orders his venomous spider to trap the man with its web. The fierce dragon doesn't understand what's happening, and asks why there was a venomous spider on the fourth floor. The man turns to Zhang and asks if his talent is to summon monsters. Zhang says nothing, just stares at the man and orders the frog to attack. The frog lands its attack, causing good damage. The man grabs the potion in his hand and says that if Zhang had the courage, he should stop using his monsters and fight man to man, so they would know who is truly stronger. The man takes his potion and becomes stronger. Zhang wonders what potion this guy had taken as he was able to free himself from the web. The fierce dragon charges at Zhang again, who just looks at him without moving and, as the man gets close, Zhang easily dodges his attack. The fierce dragon is impressed with Zhang's speed. The fierce dragon starts attacking again, but suddenly his attack is blocked. The goblin king appears in front of the man, who is outraged by this, and asks how many monsters Zhang can summon. The man is scared of the goblin king, and thinks that although he was the boss of the third floor, it is basically impossible to defeat him alone. Zhang starts laughing and calls another beast, and, behind the man, the death butcher appears. The man looks back and can't believe what he's seeing. At this moment, the man is completely surrounded. He drops his weapon on the ground when he sees the death butcher. He wonders how someone is able to control such a strong monster. The man falls to the ground and asks them to stop fighting. He surrenders. The man takes his healing potion and shows the middle finger to Zhang, who was walking towards him. The man says that even if he surrendered, he still wouldn't accept it and says again that if Zhang had the courage, he wouldn't summon monsters and would fight alone. Zhang asks if what the fierce dragon is saying is really fair, as his talent is the art of summoning and if the fierce dragon doesn't let him use his talent, how would he fight like that? Zhang extends his hand and asks what Moonlight Bunny had stolen from him. The man starts yelling that he can't accept this and asks why Zhang was asking him this. As if the two were accomplices, he knew what was stolen. Zhang opens his system window and says he is not an accomplice of Moonlight Bunny, and says that if the man really doesn't trust him, then he should look with his own eyes, as his items had also been stolen by her. The man smiles and says that indeed he was wrong. The Dragon King scratches his head and apologizes to Zhang, saying that he had indeed misjudged him. Zhang thinks that although the Dragon King has a bad temper, he is still a good person. He corrects his mistakes when he recognizes them. Zhang looks down and sees that the Dragon King was reaching out to him. The Dragon King smiles as he reaches out to Zhang and says that they haven't even met yet due to the previous fight, but now they could be friends. Zhang smiles and thinks that this is the first time he has met someone so well. The Dragon King's personality is really what Zhang is looking for, as he is a fair and correct person, although he has a somewhat rough temperament. Zhang takes the Dragon King's hand and accepts his friendship request. The Dragon King turns and starts to leave, while waving to Zhang and says that if he needs help, he can message him at any time. However, he now needed to go back and find his friends, as they were going to face the fourth floor boss. Zhang waves back to him while thinking that the character of this Dragon King is a bit too simple and rough, but quite interesting. Zhang opens a map and thinks that he has already lost a lot of time. He needs to move forward and find the fourth floor boss soon. He opens a map that shows him and the boss. He realizes that the drawing on the map looks like a maze. If it weren't for this map, it would be easy to get lost inside the fourth floor. Zhang looks ahead and says that according to the map, the right path is the one in front of him. Then he starts walking until he reaches the stone forest. 
As soon as he arrives, he hears a scream for help again. Zhang is annoyed by the situation, as every time he arrives in a new place, someone is asking for help. He never has peace. However, he notices the voice and realizes that this voice is from the moon bunny. As soon as he looks in the direction of the screams, he sees that a giant bull was with an axe hitting an ice wall that protected the moon bunny, while another monster waited patiently behind. The huge bull is called Tauran Commander. He didn't stop attacking and the wall began to break. The moon bunny was trembling and desperate, begging for help. She starts crying while panicking, asking for someone to save her, as she didn't want to die. Zhang continues looking at her while thinking that this was certainly a punishment for her stealing things. However, Zhang begins to look at the pig-headed monster that was behind Torin Chief. He finds this a bit strange. This monster seemed to be aware of what it was doing. Suddenly, the monster starts talking and calls the moon bunny cursed for stealing his things, and that's why she deserved death. Zhang closes his face and thinks that, although it was really wrong everything the moon bunny was doing, still the crime she committed does not match this sentence. A death penalty is too heavy for a person who just steals. This is going too far. Meanwhile, Torin continues attacking and manages to break a part of the ice wall. Quickly, Zhang jumps and grabs his bow and arrow, and without hesitation, hits Torin's head, causing 121 damage. Torin gets angry and looks up, asking who it is that attacked him. The pig-headed gets angry and points to Zhang, shouting for him to stop meddling in other people's business. This woman was a thief, and that's why she deserved death. Zhang jumps on top of one of the stones there and starts saying that he already knew that the moon bunny was a thief. However, this does not give anyone the right to take her life in this way, not to mention that she is a young person. She can try to change her habits. Taran is not interested in Zhang's words and goes all out. The pig-heated sees that Zhang won't convince anyone to be generous just with words, as he hasn't experienced the same pain as them. The pig-headed emphasizes that if Zhang wants to be a true hero, then he needs to show his strength. This one attacking you now is Tarin, the fourth floor boss. Surely Zhang won't win alone. Zhang starts laughing a lot and tells the pig-headed not to worry, that he would take care of the boss alone. Zhang stops and calls his beasts. A small army of monsters appears. The pig-headed is impressed by this and shouts, asking if Zhang really had summoned that many monsters at once. He can't believe that Zhang had these hidden skills. Torin continues attacking quickly. Zhang orders his venomous spider to use its web to trap Torin. He tries to strike the web to avoid being caught. Zhang aims his arrow at Torin again and tells his beasts that they would attack all together, and so the fight begins. Several monsters attack Chief Torin, while Zhang remains in their midst with his bow and arrow. The Death Butcher lands a very strong blow on Torin, throwing him back and causing 419 damage. Zhang orders his Sky Devouring Frog to attack along with him. Zhang wants to finish this quickly, so his monsters all attack rapidly and together, causing extremely high damage to Chief Torin. The pig-headed sees that among the monsters, the floor bosses and even the death zone boss were among them. This shocks the pig-headed with the magnitude of Zhang's force. The pig-headed believes that this man could become invincible. The pig-headed is annoyed, as his skills compared to Zhang's were complete trash. He turns to the moon bunny and says that she was lucky this time to find someone so strong and willing to save her. She is just impressed by Zhang's talent while hiding behind the rest of the wall that remained. The explosions caused by Zhang's attacks light up the whole place. The moon bunny couldn't believe the overwhelming power that Zhang had in his hands. With no chance of winning, the fight, Chief Tarn, is defeated with a crushing defeat. He starts to disappear in front of Zhang. The system appears and congratulates Zhang for defeating the fourth floor boss, Tarn Commander. Zhang bends down to pick up the orbs that the boss had left. Zhang thinks that exactly what was expected happened. Of all his monsters, only one died. The fourth floor boss had no chance against him. From afar, the moon bunny was looking at him, a little embarrassed. She gathers courage and goes to Zhang. As soon as she gets close to him, she starts apologizing. Zhang turns around and starts listening to her. The moon bunny starts saying that she was wrong and wanted to apologize to him and also thank him for saving her once again. She emphasizes that she was really sorry for what she had done. Then, she takes the three orbs that she had stolen and returns them to Zhang. He looks at her face and realizes that she really wanted to return the orbs to him. So, he thinks that all this that she went through, all this fear and terror because of Chief Torin, was enough as punishment for her. Zhang takes the orbs back and the moon bunny turns to go on with her life, happy to have done the right thing. 
As she leaves, Zhang shouts from afar for her not to steal again, as he wouldn't be so nice the next time he saw her going through these things. After a while, Zhang finishes picking up all the orbs that were on the ground. He says that he has already lost a lot of time, so he needs to call his beast quickly and advance to the fifth floor. Zhang calls Torin. Zhang says he will activate the fifth floor and return home earlier. In another house, a portal begins to open. A man appears. This man is called Sunbath. He was complaining that he was so close to seeing the moon bunny dead, and suddenly that brat Zhang came to mess everything up. This is something that annoys Sunbath a lot. He grabs his food while complaining that he really had bad luck. As he eats and looks at his cell phone, he notices an ad. The ad had a picture of Zhang, saying that he was wanted. The ad had the following information. Name, Asura, gender, male, occupation, archer, age, unknown, appearance, masked. Any person who can get any information on Asura will receive a reward. The reward amount corresponds to the information, ranging between one to five million. The client who advertised this is the Dawn Guild. Sunbath smiles and says that finally Zhang was done. Now, the next day, in the school building, the students were in the hallways chatting, while Zhang passed by some of them. He hears them talking about the Magic Domain Forum. The Down organization posted a certain wanted notice for a person. This person was number one in rewards. This will certainly be bad for that guy. Zhang starts to think what this Magic Domain Forum would be. He takes out his cell phone to check and starts to see several news saying that the Magic Domain Forum did not belong to any country and no one has been able to find out where it is from so far. Adventurers from magic domains all over the world can enter the forum, exchange experiences, and practice freedom of expression. Currently, it is the most active and powerful magic domain communication platform. Zhang finds the announcement, and upon reading, he thinks it is true. Someone is offering five million for other people to investigate him. This scares Zhang. He thinks that probably before dying, the kiss of death must have sent a message to the organization, and that's how they found out that it was Zhang who had killed him. Zhang thinks that he will have a lot of trouble ahead. He starts to think that he will need to find reliable allies in the magic domain and thinks about his current companions. With them, Zhang would not need to worry about someone betraying him behind his back. As soon as Zhang arrives at his classroom and opens the door, he starts to hear someone talking about the death zone that had appeared on the fourth floor. People commented that because of this, the entire floor was blocked by the magic domain administration team and no one was able to pass. This news had already spread everywhere, and everyone was already aware of it. Zhang enters the room discreetly, while the students continued commenting. One of them says he was there at the time, and later he heard that the boss of the Death Zone was defeated by a group of great people from Zia. Those foreigners had to go back home disappointed. Just thinking about it, the students felt satisfied, as finally the citizens of Great Xi could finally hold their heads high. A girl asks if her friend knows who killed the boss of the Death Zone, as that person brought glory to the whole country. He deserved recognition and rewards. The man says it was a certain Asura. Everyone who was there at the time received the notification. It appeared three times, saying that Asura had killed the boss of the Death Zone. The man emphasizes that this was extremely exciting. Zhang finally arrives at his desk and sits down. A person calls him. It was his friend Yang, who grabs him by the shoulders and yells saying that his idol Asura defeated the boss of the Death Zone. Yang said that Asura was like a god. He needed Asura to become his master. Zhang just listened in silence and with an uncomfortable face. Zhang pushes his friend away and asks him to stop hugging. If he wants Asura to become his master, he needs to find him and ask. Suddenly someone enters the room and yells, asking who Zhang was. This catches Zhang's and his friend's attention. Yang quickly turns to see who was there. A man arrived, kicking the door in. His name was Crocodile. He started intimidating the students who were closest to him, saying that he was looking for Zhang. The rest could run away from there. The students ran out of the room and said that this guy was the boss of a gang called the Crocodile Gang. He had awakened a B-rank talent. The girl who was there says that Zhang was going to suffer for having provoked this kind of person. Yang says that this guy's name is Crocodile. He's a delinquent. Yang says he heard that he can kill a bull with a single punch. Zhang stands up angrily and says, It's all right, asking Yang not to get involved and just watch. Crocodile grabs a chair and turns to Zhang, asking if he was the real Zhang and apparently he wanted to replace him. Zhang says he doesn't know Crocodile so there must be some mistake. But Crocodile doesn't want to talk and yells that just by looking at Zhang's arrogant face, his hand itches. 
He jumps with the chair and yells for Zhang to just die quietly. The chair was about to hit Zhang. He gets serious and prepares. In seconds, he lands a punch on Crocodile's face, making him spit blood, throwing him away, hitting the wall. Crocodile falls unconscious to the ground. His companions arrive to help him. Zhang just looks at this. He snaps his fingers while wondering what kind of powerful figure Crocodile could be. The students who were outside couldn't believe it. Everyone was amazed at this strength that Zhang had. One of them asks when Zhang became so strong to defeat Crocodile with just one punch. It was so fast that the woman who was there couldn't even see what really happened. She asks if it was already over. One of the students looks at the screen and thinks that Zhang's punch was about 1,016 caddies. He looks at Zhang and wonders what he was doing, how he had become so strong suddenly. As a few days ago, Zhang's punch caddy's points were only 497, according to the school's measuring device. But now it's over a thousand. This man is how. He thinks he can't let someone steal his spot at the Great Qing Martial Academy. Night falls and Zhang was already inside his house. He warns his sister Feng that public safety has not been very reliable recently and therefore she needed to make sure to stay safe at school. The two were cleaning the house while Feng was washing the dishes. She tells her brother not to worry like that. Because at the girls' school she studies at, all the security guards were fighters from the magic domain. Zhang is more relieved and says that this is really good. He points out that it's almost time to enter the magic domain. Feng says she has been noticing that every day her brother Zhang enters the magic domain to fight monsters and is getting stronger and stronger. Feng asks what his true talent is. Zhang turns around and smiles, saying he would tell her as soon as she awakens her own talent. She turns away sulking and continues cleaning the plate. She asks what is so special about his talent, so it wouldn't take long for her to awaken hers too. Zhang enters the magic domain. The system asks him which floor he would like to go to. Zhang chooses the fifth floor. Soon he appears at the fifth floor altar, which is extremely different from the other floors. It's like a world on a floor. Zhang takes his magic domain guide, but before looking he notices that there are way more people on the fifth floor than on the fourth floor. Zhang notices that there are several people looking at him. With this, he deduces that the wanted notice is really having an effect, and, with the absurd value they put on his head, those people who were there would have no problem coming after him. Zhang thinks that if he leaves the altar now and alone, he would clearly be the target of several people, and this would be a big problem for him. So, he thinks a little, and decides to flee to the fourth floor to get more bosses, and form a team of bosses only. This way, he would get a better force to protect himself from possible future attacks. He simply disappears from the altar in front of everyone. No one expected that. The hunters complained about it. One of them says he must have felt their presence there. The other says they can't know which floor he went to, and it will be quite complicated to catch him like this. Back on the fourth floor, there was no one waiting for him. So, he hurries and quickly goes to the middle of the forests. As he walks through the forest, he thinks that this time he escaped, but the hunters would not stop. So, his priority is to collect the bosses. Zhang realizes that there is someone spying on him. Suddenly, he turns around, ready to fight, but before he noticed, the moon bunny was clinging to his leg again. He looks at her and asks why she was doing this again. She starts to scream, apologizing, saying that she knew it was wrong to steal, but she had no other choice. She needed money. She says she needs to reach the 30th floor and begs for help. Zhang, awkwardly, tells her to calm down and let go of his leg first. She starts to cry and yells, saying that if he didn't promise to help her, she wouldn't let go. Zhang says that if she continues crying like this, she won't get anything. Just cry unnecessarily. He promises to listen to her and help her. She asks if he was telling the truth. He says yes. The moon bunny gets up and takes all her items and says that there was everything she had of value with her and she would give all this to him. Zhang refuses to take the items and asks her to keep them all well stored. He points out that he was going to fight the boss and she could come with him. Zhang makes it clear that he is just a beginner too and therefore he doesn't know how far he can help her. However, he promises to do his best to make sure everything ends well. The moon bunny says that's okay. She thanks him again for the help he is giving her. Zhang creates a team, and the Moon Bunny joins the team. As the two walked, Zhang asks the Moon Bunny if her ability helped her steal. She answers yes. Her ability is called Slithering Snake. Although she doesn't like it, she had no other choice. 
Zhang stops for a bit and looks at the moon bunny and says he had an idea for him to understand her ability better. He says he would control the bosses so she could use her abilities and steal. He wanted to see what she would be able to take from the bosses. She agrees, but points out that she had never stolen from a boss before. Zhang says that wouldn't be a problem. He also takes the opportunity to ask why she was wanting to reach the 30th floor. She answers that her father had disappeared on the 30th floor, and she wanted to find him. Zhang lowers his heat and thinks that there are only two reasons to explain. A person's disappearance inside the magic domain. The first is death by some monster. The second is death by some adventurer. Because even if a person gets lost inside a floor of the magic domain, after a certain time, she is automatically expelled from the magic domain and returns to the real world. After some time walking, the two finally arrive at the fourth floor boss. The boss was fighting some people who were losing. Some were already dead. The Toren, as always, attacked without hesitation, killing all the other adventurers nearby. After everyone on the team was defeated by the Toren, Zhang says they should go now, as everyone there was already dead. The Moon Bunny agrees with this, so they start the fight. Zhang calls all his beasts to play a bit. Zhang tells the Moon Bunny that he would attract the boss to him so she could use her abilities freely. He emphasizes that he would protect her from anything so she could be at ease. She looks at him and agrees, saying she was ready to attack. Zhang takes his bow and arrow and tells his beast to attack. The Death Butcher attacks, causing extremely high damage, much higher than the first time. His total damage was 684. The rest of his beasts don't waste time and all attack at the same time, causing again absurd damage to the boss. The boss gets angry and enters berserker mode and advances furiously towards Zhang. He in turn remains calm and motionless. He calls the venomous spider and asks her to use her web and hold the Torin boss. As soon as the spider uses her web, he yells at the moon bunny to act now. She quickly goes near the boss and says she's going to start now. She starts to use her ability, and a pink aura starts to come out of her hand and reaches the boss. The system announces that she got a stiff bullhorn. She is impressed with this. She turns to Zhang and asks what this item she just got is for. The boss, still trapped in the webs, notices her standing there and lets out a very strong roar. The moon bunny crouches down and screams in fear. Zhang walks over to her and asks her not to be afraid. As with him by her side, it's impossible for that boss to touch her. She stops screaming and calms down. The Torin boss was very angry about this, but Zhang didn't care about anything, and just looks at the moon bunny and says that she should continue taking the boss's items without worrying about anything. She gets very excited about this and asks if she can really continue taking the items. Zhang says yes, she gathers courage, closes her eyes, and continues using her ability. Zhang, behind her, is very happy with the result. This time, she manages to get cowhide. The boss lets out another roar of anger, but this time she is calmer and taunts the boss, saying that he can't touch her, so she would continue stealing until there is nothing left. While she continues taking things, Zhang takes his magic domain guide and says that the horn she had taken is definitely a material, but there is nothing in the magic domain guide about its use or what product it would serve. Zhang says he would keep it with him for now. She turns and says, that's fine. Zhang closes his book and says, that's enough. Probably there won't be any more items. He orders the death butcher to take care of the rest. The butcher goes and delivers another blow, causing 434 damage to the boss, causing his immediate death. As soon as the boss was killed, the portal opens again. Zhang says the moon bunny should go to the fifth floor and wait for him there. He would go back to the third floor and get more bosses. The moon bunny agrees with him and says she would wait for him at the fifth floor altar and goes to the portal. He waves to her and as soon as she leaves, he summons his new beast. He opens his system window and says he can't waste too much time, so he must go back to the third floor as quickly as possible to get another boss. On the third floor, already at the boss's house, we hear some explosions. Inside was Zhang with all his beasts. He had already defeated the third floor boss without any difficulty. Zhang crouches to pick up the orbs that the boss left and says he was lucky because no one tried to steal his boss. After he captures the Goblin King again, it will be complete. He opens his inventory and looks at the beasts he currently has. After checking, he thinks that's enough. Even if he faces other adventurers with the current strength he has, he feels confident. So, he decides to go back to the fifth floor. A portal opens and takes him to the fifth floor. As soon as he arrives on the fifth floor, the moon bunny comes running to him. 
She points out that there are many people there who saw the wanted notice and they want to get him, so he needs to be very careful. He looks at her and says, not to worry, as soon as they see his real strength, no one would dare to do anything. Suddenly, from afar, Yuang shouts the name of Asura and says that they have finally met again. The Dragon King sees the moon bunny and points to her, calling her a thief. Yuang doesn't quite understand what's going on. He goes to Zhang and questions him, asking why he was walking with that thief and if they were really working together. The moon bunny gets scared and hides behind Zhang. He responds that it's not what the Dragon King was thinking. The moon bunny had changed her thoughts and promised not to steal anymore. She comes out from behind Zhang and returns the three orbs she had previously stolen from the Dragon King. She apologizes and says she really didn't want to steal anymore. The Dragon King scratches his head and says that real men don't fight against women, so he would forgive her this time. Another man comes from behind the Dragon King, calling for Zhang. He introduces himself and extends his hand to Zhang. His name is Titan. He says he heard from Yue Ying that he had saved her from the attack of the elite Shadow Wolf. He says he intends to make friends with Zhang, but Zhang says it's not a good time to make friends with him, as there is a group of people waiting to try to kill him for a reward. Another person who was there has her eyes shining and is impressed to know that Zhang now had a bounty. Her name is Liddy, Princess. She runs and grabs Zhang's hand, asking what the value of the bounty is. She emphasizes that she wouldn't let anyone take it, as she wanted it for herself. The Dragon King comes close to her and scolds her, as she only thinks about money. He points out that it's not worth betraying anyone for money, and that not long ago, Liddy had already received a bounty of one and a half million. She gets irritated and says that the bounty she had received she had to split in half with a boy named Zhang, and that's why her savings were misaligned this month. And that makes her very upset. As soon as Zhang hears this, he remembers the hunter named Mengdi. He really didn't expect that a rich princess like this would be the hunter Mengdi. Titan comes close to Litti and touches her shoulder, saying that it's enough to play like this, as Asura had saved Yue Ying and was a friend of the Dragon King, so they should be obliged to get along well. She agrees with this and says she already knows that. The Dragon King goes to Zhang and says that his talent is really amazing. He can summon monsters to fight and even bosses, all under his personal command. Another man introduces himself named One Autumn Knight. He asks if Zhang can really summon monsters. He says that if Asura can summon monsters and command them, then his talent is S rank. Zhang, awkwardly, says it's a bit higher than that. The Dragon King is impressed that he is seeing a person with a talent higher than S rank. He points out that there are no more than 500 S rank adventurers registered in Great Shia. Titan says he never imagined that they would have the luck to meet an adventurer with SS rank talent. Zhang feels embarrassed, thinking that his talent is actually higher than that. His talent is SSS rank, but he says nothing and just says he is flattered, but he is still a beginner and therefore they should focus on taking good care of each other. Titan says that now that everyone has introduced themselves, they should add each other as friends, as he had never had contact with an SS rank person before. The Dragon King is also excited and says that having an SS rank friend is enough for them to win against others without problems. Zhang decides to add everyone as a friend. The Moon Bunny is impressed and with shining eyes looking at Zhang. She thinks that she was all this time with a guy with SS rank talent by her side and didn't know. As soon as Zhang accepted everyone as friends, he looks at the Moon Bunny and says that if they are going to form a team, they should put her in the middle, as he had promised her that he would help her reach the 30th floor to reunite with her father. He says he would take responsibility for her and that she wouldn't steal from anyone there. She is impressed with this, as even surrounded by strong friends and with a talent given by the gods, he still didn't abandon her, even though he had nothing in return for it. The Dragon King says he wouldn't mind having her on the team, but he doesn't know about the other members. Suddenly, Liddy screams, drawing everyone's attention there. She turns and says, they won't say anything, pretending to be the good guys, but he should pay for their help after all. They were in front. The Dragon King doesn't like this at all, and says that all she does is think about money. The team captain, Titan, says that's enough. They shouldn't fight over this. If the problem is that, he himself would pay the work fee. She turns and says that if that's the case, as he is the captain, she wouldn't charge anything, but she wouldn't give anything in return either. Yue Ying goes to Zhang and says he shouldn't be offended by this. Liddy is the only healer on the team. Her character is very important for the team. Although she has a bad temper, 
Zhang thinks that Liddy really only has eyes for money. The leader, Titan, calls everyone and says it's time to depart. Their goal is to defeat the boss of the fifth floor. Last time they couldn't do it, but this time, they have plenty of healing potions and on top of that, they have the help of Asura so he believes they will definitely defeat the boss. The Dragon King is happy and agrees with that, saying that's right, they were definitely ready. Zhang looks around and thinks that it now seems much calmer since the assassins wouldn't attack him in broad daylight. Yue Ying warns Zhang that from the fifth floor, the little monsters and bosses are much stronger than before, and the requirements for adventures have recently become higher. Thus, only their teamwork can make the goal easier and safer for everyone. Zhang agrees and says he understood. They begin to leave the altar. Zhang points out that there were still quite a few people behind him, so they shouldn't let their guard down along the way. Zhang emphasizes that they should make quick and smart decisions. Not far from the altar, the group of adventurers already encounters a group of monsters in front of them. Quickly, the monsters begin to attack. Titan takes the lead of his group and uses his shield to protect everyone. He uses his skill, and a magical circle appears on the ground. This ability is called Defensive Aura. It is at level 1, experience 857 out of 1000, cost 10 MP, cooldown 60 seconds. The effect within 3 meters improves the defense of all team members by 50% without a time limit. Zhang is impressed, thinking that this ability is extremely strong. He didn't imagine that Titan had an S-rank ability. The monsters continue their attack, but soon the Dragon King jumps from behind the shield and lands a very strong blow on the monster, causing 428 damage. However, another monster, a magic user, begins to use healing magic on the first monster, which astonishes the Dragon King. Yue Ying shouts that she would try this time and leaps to attack, using her Light Slash ability. Easily, she defeats one of the monsters, causing 443 damage. The magic-using monster is astonished by her strength. The Ice Fighter, called Autumn Knight, begins to use his magic and says that they should finish this quickly. He traps all the monsters, using ice magic and freezing the feet of the monsters. Zhang is impressed with their teamwork, as everyone was fighting perfectly. Moonlight Bunny is astonished by the strength of everyone, as she had never seen so many strong people fighting together. The group takes advantage of the monsters being frozen and begins to attack them all. Zhang looks at the fallen monsters and thinks that being part of a team as powerful as this is beneficial for him. Then, he decides, and says that from today, he would not fight alone. However, Zhang feels a bit out of place, as he is new to the team and everyone is performing their roles very well, which makes Zhang unable to find a place where he can get involved. Quickly, all the monsters were defeated, and the team of adventurers continues on their way. Ahead of them was a huge stone. Titan approaches it and touches it, causing a blue glow that envelops his body. He asks everyone to put their hand on the stone. As soon as everyone receives the blessing of the water deity, they would enter the water. Zhang is confused and asks what all this was about. Yueying begins to explain that they need to do this because the boss of the fifth floor is at the bottom of the ocean, and therefore, they need to enter the water to fight the boss. Basically, that's why they need to receive the blessing of the water deity. After hearing the explanation, Zhang approaches the stone and puts his hand on it. A few seconds later, a notification appears in his system, saying that he had received the blessing of the water deity, and it would last for an hour. With this, he would be able to stay underwater for an hour without needing to breathe. Zhang is impressed, but alert, as they would have to enter the bottom of the ocean and had to finish the fight before the hour was up. The Dragon King looks at Zhang and says, that's exactly what he's thinking. They need to defeat the monster within an hour. Otherwise, they would enter a drowning state and lose 10% of their lives every minute. The Dragon King emphasizes that last time they failed, but he hopes that this time they would finally defeat the fifth floor boss, Blackfin. Everyone starts to enter the water. Zhang comments that, in the Magic Demon Guide, it only states that Blackfin is a monster that casts magic, but there is no detailed description of it in the book. Liti says that Zhang is a bit slow sometimes. She explains that few fighters are able to fight against Blackfin, which is why the books that detail its abilities are extremely valuable. Only a fool would give this information in the Magic Domain Guide. Zhang begins to think that the Blackfin boss must be extremely strong, as Yue Ying's team is strong and very good at teamwork, but they still failed last time. Zhang starts to think that he needs to get in there at any cost. Already at the bottom of the ocean, all the adventurers were walking normally.
The Dragon King begins to laugh and asks Liddy if she is still afraid of water, as he heard stories that there are still several floors that will have underwater battles. What would she do? Liddy gets angry at this and tells him that if he continues to talk nonsense, she will not heal him. Liddy sees some people ahead of her and asks Titan if they were there to fight Blackfin as well. He asks the man in front of him how he is, but the man interrupts him and says that they failed again, as the Blackfin boss is very difficult to deal with. This man is named Whirlwind. He emphasizes that they did not reach the third stage before two waves of attacks almost killed them. If they hadn't retreated at that time, probably his entire team would be dead by now. Titan sighs and says that Blackfin's ability in the third stage really is something terrifying. He had also been defeated by it. Whirlwind wishes good luck to Titan. He says that he would go back to land with his team and that they had hired someone to help them. Otherwise, it would be impossible for them to get through Blackfin. Whirlwind and his group begin to leave. Titan tells Zhang that Whirlwind is also an S-rank adventurer. However, he has been stuck on the Blackfin boss for about a month, and only now they decided to hire someone to help them get through. Titan emphasizes that this is why Whirlwind would spend millions. Zhang asks Titan, what is so special about the Blackfin boss that no one can defeat him? Yue Ying takes the lead and begins to explain that Blackfin is different from the bosses of the previous floors. The battle against him is divided into three stages. During the first stage, Blackfin is not the one who attacks, he summons monsters to protect himself. If, after three waves of attack from the monsters, there are still adventurers alive, Blackfin will finally make a move and advance to the second stage. In the second stage, Blackfin will use a skill called Charge of Darkness, which causes heavy damage to the adventurers. If the adventurers manage to withstand this and continue the fight with Blackfin, as soon as his life falls to half, the final stage, stage 3, will finally arrive. The final battle phase finally begins. This is the hardest part to complete. In this part, Blackfin uses his ability called Sacrificial Death, which causes damage to the team as a whole and has a stacking effect. The first hit causes 20% damage to life. Each subsequent hit increases the damage by 20% until it reaches 100%. If this happens, the entire team dies at once. Zhang starts to think and says that he understood the situation. It really seems to be something completely difficult to deal with. Titan says again that the first and second stages are not a problem for them as they have done it other times. The real problem lies in the third stage. That's where they were stuck. However, this time they would allocate roles. Titan says that he would be responsible for directly countering the boss. Yue Ying would act as the team's damage dealer. Autumn Knight would be the team's control, paralyzing anyone with his ice. The Dragon King and Zhang would be responsible for keeping the monster spawn area under control during the third phase. As long as they can prevent Blackfin from using his monsters effectively, they could defeat the boss to death. Everyone shouts that they understood. Titan is very confident in his team and shouts to Blackfin that they have returned to resolve the issues that had been left behind. They stare at each other from a considerable distance. Blackfin begins to use his magic to summon his monsters. Quickly, Titan begins to prepare to be his team's shield. He yells for everyone to stay behind him for now and asks Autumn to use his magic to control the monsters that would come. The team begins to prepare for the tough battle. Everyone positions themselves behind Titan. He uses his ability to protect everyone. Soon after, Autumn freezes the approaching monsters. Yue Ying doesn't waste time and uses her ability to start slashing the monsters that were there. The Dragon King begins to control the advance of the monsters. Zhang also positions himself and summons his beasts, saying that it's better for them to defend from there instead of making precise attacks. Everyone agrees and stays within the range of Titan's ability. The monsters continue to attack, going after the Goblin King, and quickly the King is defeated. Zhang is impressed with this and says that the monsters on that floor are really terrifying, even the normal monsters have high damage. Meanwhile, Blackfin continues to call more and more monsters, sending them all to attack. Yue Ying fights bravely, cutting several monsters at the same time. She asks everyone on the team to be careful, as it was almost time to enter the second stage. Suddenly, Blackfin moves quickly, appearing close to the group. Titan is impressed with this. Yue Ying shouts for the Dragon King to be careful, as Blackfin was right behind him. However, the Dragon King doesn't understand very well and asks what Yue Ying was saying. She tries to shout again, saying that Blackfin was behind him, but Blackfin was already ready to attack. He uses his magic and hits the Dragon King directly, causing huge damage. 759. Zhang is worried about this and shouts to know if the Dragon King was okay. 
Liddy runs and begins to use her healing, Green Blessing. The Dragon King begins to get up and says that Blackfin is as annoying as ever. The Dragon King gets angry with this and jumps, with hatred in his eyes, to attack Blackfin. While he is in the air, he asks why it is always him who suffers the first attack. However, Blackfin disappears again, and the Dragon King's attack goes straight through. In the blink of an eye, Blackfin ends up behind Yuying. As soon as the Dragon King realizes this, he shouts for her to be careful, but she is attacked and can't avoid the blow. While she was falling, Blackfin was already casting his magic to hit her. Zhang notices this and quickly jumps and catches Yue Ying, holding her in his arms. He looks at her and asks if she was okay. Yue Ying is very embarrassed and averts her gaze, saying that she was fine. Autumn steps forward and uses his magic. A strong wave of ice comes towards Blackfin, managing to freeze him. As soon as this happens, Autumn shouts for the Dragon King to attack now. Quickly, the Dragon King jumps to attack. He manages to hit his attack squarely, breaking the ice and causing 698 damage to the boss. After that blow, Blackfin disappears again, returning to his place. The team regroups again within the range of Titan's ability. Blackfin begins to concentrate a large amount of energy. Titan notices and shouts for everyone to be very careful, as they have finally reached stage 3. From then on, everyone needed to constantly check their life, otherwise they could die. Titan emphasizes that now is the time for everyone to prepare for the formation they had discussed before. The Dragon King begins to run ahead and shouts for Zhang to follow him, as now it was their turn to shine. Zhang begins to run along and says that he understood. He begins to summon his beasts. He summons three bosses. The Taran, the boss of the fourth floor, the Frog, the boss of the second floor, and the Death Butcher, the boss of the Death Zone. He stands in the middle of them and says that he hopes they can handle it. Titan shouts that the third stage has begun. A huge portal appears in front of Zhang, and several monsters start to come out from there. The monsters begin to head towards Zhang. Quickly, he orders the Death Butcher to attack. With this, he defeats several monsters quickly. He opens his arms and says that, to win this battle, they would have to use the resources obtained during the battle. Zhang says that it's time to show the true strength of his summoning art. The monsters he just killed, he summons and sends them to attack the other monsters that were coming. The Dragon King is impressed with Zhang's strength and says that this is what is expected of an SS rank talent. The Dragon King notices something on his back and turns quickly to see. As soon as he looks, he realizes that the monsters ignored him and went directly to Blackfin. He begins to kill the monsters to use his ability, Sacrificial Death. After he absorbs the energy of the monsters, a dense aura begins to emanate from his body. This aura begins to hit the people. The first is Zhang, causing 815 damage. A notification appears for him, saying that he was under the effect of the Death Curse. It is at level 1. Its effect, when active in the body, increases each of the magical attacks by 20% in damage. Zhang thinks that this ability is the strongest he has seen so far. Titan begins to take the front line and coordinate his team. He asks Autumn to freeze the monsters. As soon as everyone is frozen, Yue Ying should finish them all off quickly. They cannot let Blackfin charge his magic again using the monsters, as this would be extremely dangerous. Autumn begins to use his magic, freezing the monsters around him. As soon as Yue Ying notices that the monsters have started to be frozen, she prepares and uses her ability, quickly cutting the monsters. The Dragon King was attacking with everything he could to prevent the monsters from going to Blackfin. Zhang looks at his team and thinks that, at this moment, they were out of ideas to deal with the real problem, which is time. If they continue wasting time with the monsters instead of killing the boss, the blessing of the water deity would end. And that would be a problem. And for that reason, he needed to think of something as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, Blackfin begins to accumulate his magic again. After a few seconds, he uses his power again, causing 1,147 damage to the group. Liddy begins to heal them immediately, but their situation was not good at the moment. They were cornered by the overwhelming power of the boss Blackfin. The Dragon King was with less than half of his life and shouts for Liddy to heal them as quickly as possible. She says that she is doing what she can, but it is getting complicated to keep up with the damage. The monsters did not stop coming. They were being pressured at every moment of the fight. Yue Ying continues to kill the monsters that appear, but she realizes the mistake and shouts that they could not continue like this. While they waste time defending the attacks of the monsters, Blackfin was charging his next attack, 
absorbing the energy of the remaining monsters around him. He was almost ready for another blow. After finishing absorbing the last monster, he uses his magic again, which was even stronger, causing 1,566 damage to the group. As soon as everyone is hit by the magic, the group is one step away from death. Autumn says that if they continue there like this, they would die. Yue Ying kneels before the pain she was feeling. Meanwhile, she thinks if this is another failure of theirs, because if they die in the magic domain, they would die for real. The monsters begin to use their healing magic and, with this, heal the entire team. Yue Ying can't understand what was happening to them. The Dragon King celebrates because their lives were getting full again. He looks ahead and shouts for everyone to look too. This healing magic was the collar tied, used by the monsters, but the monsters were under Zhang's control. He looks at his partners and says that his talent is really amazing. The Dragon King smiles and says to Zhang that if he hadn't done that, probably the whole team could be dead right now. Titan also smiles and says that Zhang is always surpassing his limits and surprising everyone with good ideas. This is what is expected of an SS rank talent. Liti is also happy and thinks that with the help of the monsters healing, they would now have enough power to truly win this battle. Titan encourages his group like a true leader, saying that they just need to hold on a little longer. Then, they could win this tough battle and not have to spend all their money on someone to help them. With Zhang's healing and these words, the group rises again and begins to see a way out of this battle that was lost minutes ago. Everyone prepares again to face Blackfin. Yue Ying shouts for everyone to join their forces again. The battle starts again. Autumn begins to use his magic, causing a large dust curtain with the amount of ice he was creating. Yue Ying wastes no time and begins to attack, cutting everything in front of her while shouting for everyone to attack at once. Zhang grabs his bow and starts to aim. He calls the frog and says that now is the time. He was thinking that he needed to deliver the final blow to be able to summon Blackfin. Meanwhile, the boss continued to absorb the energy of the monsters to attack once more. However, he realizes that he was in trouble. As soon as he looks up, it's too late. The frog's attack causes a huge explosion and devastating damage. The frog's attack dealt 1,977 damage. Everyone was impressed with this destructive power. With this, the boss was defeated. As his body was decomposing, a light begins to emerge behind him. Liddy looks at this and starts to laugh, while shouting that it's the portal. They finally manage to win. The Dragon King also begins to celebrate, saying that he couldn't believe they really managed to get through. Titan says that they finally got the key. Now, they could advance to the sixth floor. The system notifies, congratulating them for having defeated the Blackfin boss. Moonlight Bunny starts to look at Jang, who apparently was thoughtful. The Dragon King comes close to him and calls him. On the ground, there were many orbs. Titan says that the boss was finally defeated. Moonlight Bunny is impressed with the number of drops the boss had left. Yue Ying says that all this was thanks to Zhang. He saved the team and contributed with the attack power with absurd damage, and for that reason, he could be the first to choose the rewards. He agrees and says that it's okay with him, so he bends down to check what he would pick up. As soon as he bends down, he notices that there was an invitation card to the death zone. He thinks that last time, he managed to get the powerful Death Butcher, so it would be good if he went there again. He holds the card in his hand and thinks about what more he could find there. Zhang turns and says that they could keep all the rest and share it among themselves if he could keep this invitation card to the Death Zone. Titan agrees with this and says that he could take the invitation card for himself. The group says that, because Moonlight Bunny didn't help with anything, she couldn't take rewards. She says that it was okay as she would never be able to reach the sixth floor alone. The Dragon King is very excited and asks everyone to hurry up, as he wants to enter the sixth floor and see what it's like. Titan says that they can't wait any longer, due to the time they have left underwater, and for that reason, they should enter the sixth floor right away. According to the Magic Domain Guide, the sixth floor is a mine, and the monsters consist of miners with dog heads. The Dragon King puts his hand on Zhang's shoulder to thank him, but they hear someone shouting, impressed. As soon as they turn around, they see the same group from earlier. Whirlwind was impressed, shouting and asking if they really had passed the Blackfin boss. He continues to approach, saying that he couldn't believe it, as they had been trying for a month and couldn't get through, and had to hire someone to help spending a huge amount of money. Titan puts his hand on his head and smiles, saying they were lucky. He wishes Whirlwind good luck and says he has to hurry because of the time. He asks Whirlwind to meet him on the sixth floor once he gets through as well. 
Whirlwin says that's fine, as soon as he gets through, they will meet again. The specialist hired by them complains, as Whirlwind did not check how the fifth floor boss was. Now that he's dead, it would take 24 hours for him to come back to life. He emphasizes that this is a complete waste of time, and he will not refund the money for it. Whirlwind is startled by this and apologizes, saying the man was right. They should have checked before summoning him there. Zhang just watches this from afar, saying nothing. Yue Ying heads towards the portal and calls Zhang to come with her. He keeps looking at the others who were there, saying nothing. After that, he tells her he's coming. Yue Ying enters, and soon after her, Zhang begins to enter the portal as well. As he enters, he wonders if, when he becomes a magic domain specialist, people will ask him to carry them like this too. After everyone crosses, they appear inside a mine, where there are various minerals on the walls and an altar in the center. In the middle of the altar, everyone was already there. Zhang says that, according to the Magic Domain Guide, the sixth floor is a labyrinth. It seems the paths are really complicated. Titan confirms this, saying the fact that it's complicated comes from the labyrinth constantly changing, so there is no exact path. They all must remain alert, avoiding getting lost, otherwise they could be stuck there forever. Lidi stops and starts looking around, saying she doesn't see the Dragon King anywhere. She asks if anyone knows where he went. Zhang looks ahead and says that, apparently, he was really not there. Suddenly, someone comes screaming from a cave, asking for help. Zhang turns quickly to see who it was. As soon as he looks, he realizes it was the Dragon King running and shouting that there were many dogheads there. He continues running to the center of the altar. The monsters stop as soon as they see the altar. The Dragon King throws himself on the altar and falls face down on the ground. Autumn goes to him and asks what he did to provoke so many dog heads like that. The Dragon King shows a red stone in his hand and says they started chasing him because he took this stone from them. Liddy comes running as soon as she sees the stone. She quickly grabs the stone from the Dragon King's hand and raises it, asking what kind of stone it was and if it was valuable. The Dragon King just looks at her with an angry face. A man looks at them and asks if this is their first time on the sixth floor of the Magic Domain. He starts smiling and says the materials there were extremely valuable, and the most valuable was the black gold ore. He says a stone like that could be worth 500,000. This makes Litty's eyes shine. The man continues saying exactly that, and this is because these ores can be used to improve weapons and equipment. Suddenly, the stone in Litty's hand disappears. She doesn't even see what took it from her hand. Suddenly, Zhang appears with the stone in his hand and asks the man if these are the minerals used to improve equipment and how they would use this to improve. Behind him, Liddy was angry, asking him to give the stone back to her. The man there starts explaining that to improve weapons and equipment, they must head to the forge of the dwarven blacksmith on the tenth floor. The higher the level they want to increase their equipment, the higher the grade of their ores must be. The man emphasizes that the stone in Zhang's hand was a common ore, and, therefore, it was valued at about 10,000. Liddy rushes and grabs the stone again and says that 10,000 is also good. If she gets a few dozen of those, she would be reaching her goal. While Liddy was there playing with the stone, Zhang thinks that his bow is S rank and has very high damage, but its level is still the lowest, and it's time to change that. Autumn suggests they could collect some stones while fighting the monsters, as they could be quite useful in the future. Liti celebrates, saying they would indeed be useful to her. Liti asks what they were waiting for to leave. She calls them to explore at that very moment, as she was very eager to explore more. Titan smiles and says it's already late and they spent a lot of time and energy fighting the Black Finn monster. It's probably almost dawn. He emphasizes that they need to go home, rest well, and take care of their bodies, as that was the priority. Litti is a bit sullen and says it's too early. They should at least get one black iron miner before going back. The Dragon King smiles and says she usually is the one who wants to go back as early as possible. He asks why she had this change of attitude. Suddenly he points out that the power of money really is an incredible thing. Yue Ying touches Liddy's back and tells her they need to go back and rest. Tomorrow when they are rested and their energies are full, they will come back there. She agrees with this and says it was fine. Jang says he would also leave. He says goodbye to everyone there. He was thinking about his sister, as it was already very late. She should be sleeping at this time. The Dragon King looks at him and says, it's okay. Then, everyone says goodbye and leaves the magic domain. The next day, 
In the real world at the police building, Zhang went to collect his reward. A policeman hands him an envelope with money inside, while next to him was a woman leaning against the wall. He takes the envelope and thanks the police officer. The woman turns and tells Zhang that she would keep him in mind. She approaches and says that besides him, taking half of her reward, they also drew a turtle on her face. Zhang turns to her and says she doesn't need to be careful with what she eats, but she has to be careful with what she says. He says it wasn't him who drew a turtle on her face. She gets even closer to him and points her finger at him, saying he had the nerve to lie in front of her like that. She emphasizes that even though she was in a state of hypnosis, her consciousness was still awake, so she was sure it was him and his sister who did that. She complains that it took her a long time to get all the ink off her face. Zhang says they didn't even come close to what she had done for money. She didn't care about anyone's life, attacking without thinking twice about who was in front. She turns and says that the most important thing for her is money, as only those who have money have an important position in society. Anything other than money didn't matter to her. Zhang says nothing, just thinks she must have gone through something in her past because she loves money so much that it can't be normal. As they leave the police building, several reporters start to arrive from everywhere, shouting that they were the heroes who captured the criminal Huang. From what they heard, the one who really managed to knock him out was Zhang. They run and ask him if he had anything to say and if he could describe what happened. The reporters surround them, leaving them a bit scared. The questions don't stop coming. They start to say that Zhang was still just a student. They ask which college he was thinking of applying to. They also point out that from what they heard, Zhang was in a moment of great urgency, as if he hadn't acted quickly. Miss Mengdi, who was also there, could have been killed by the criminal Huang. They ask what Zhang was thinking at the time how he faced fear to save her. She steps forward and shouts, saying she didn't need him to save her. The reporter says they saw the CCTV footage. At the time, she was under the criminal's hypnosis and was frozen. After all this, Zhang finally arrives at his home. As soon as he gets there, his sister picks up her phone and looks at the news, and it was written that the city's hero, named Zhang, bravely fought a criminal and eliminated a threat. The city rewarded him with a reward of one million. His sister says there's more news and asks him to listen to the title. She starts reading. A young man helped the police arrest a criminal, achieving a great feat and spreading his name throughout the city. Zhang turns and says he didn't do anything special. It's just a common arrest of a criminal. After some time, everyone would forget about it. It's better for them to stop with this, as normal people like them getting deluded. Feng asks her brother if he doesn't know. She emphasizes that he needs to become famous as quickly as possible. He turns and asks her what she has learned. He tells her to hurry up and, as soon as she finishes dinner, she needs to do her homework. He would enter the magic domain again. She puts down her phone and says it was okay. She would do it now. Back on the sixth floor of the magical realm in the middle of the altar, Zhang was looking at his system while thinking that he had picked up four tide callers to act as healers. With this, he probably wouldn't have big problems in the future. Currently, Zhang has a total of three bosses, namely the frog, the Death Butcher, and the Black Fin, three melee monsters, and four healing monsters. As he looked at his team, Liddy appeared right in front of him. She waves and winks at him, saying she's surprised to see him there before everyone else. He looks at her and wonders what she was doing there at that time. He's thankful she hasn't discovered his real identity yet. Yue Ying also appears behind Zhang, saying that the bounty on him has just gone up. She points out that the bounty on him is now five million, Yue Ying asks what Zhang did to provoke the Dawn Guild like that. She says they want his life. Zhang looks away and puts his hand on his head, saying he didn't want to draw their attention, but problems kept coming to him. Yue Ying says the reason doesn't matter now. She asks Zhang not to walk around alone. He should stay with them as much as he could, so everyone would be fine. Yue Ying looks directly into Zhang's eyes and says that whenever he needs help, he could call her, and she would come running to help him kill the monsters. That way, they would be fine. A message arrives in Zhang's system with Yue Ying's name. As soon as he opens it, he realizes it's her real phone number. He looks at her and says that sharing her personal number like that is a risk to her privacy and security in her life outside the magical realm. He questions her, asking if she really thinks it's safe to do that with someone she doesn't truly know outside the magical realm. Yue Ying lowers her head and closes her eyes while saying that Zhang didn't hesitate to put his life at risk to save hers against that elite shadow wolf. And for that reason, she believes he's not a bad person and wouldn't harm her. Zhang thanks Yue Ying for the trust she has in him. 
but he refuses and says he wouldn't save her number. Yue Ying gets a little irritated with that and starts to leave, saying that now it's up to him. Zhang looks at her as she leaves angrily, but he doesn't know why she's angry. The rest of the team also arrives. Titan asks how everyone is doing and if they're ready because he wants to leave immediately. The Dragon King laughs and points his staff forward, telling the dog-headed miners that they're there again. They would enter a mine and kill everyone in their way. The group begins to advance inside the mine while Zhang thinks that the monsters of the magical realm are getting stronger and stronger, because at the time he thought the lava turtle on the first floor was extremely powerful. But after a quick comparison, he realized that now the lava turtle is extremely weak. As they walked through the mines, everyone starts to hear a noise as if something were hitting the walls nearby. They look up to see where the noise is coming from. Suddenly, they see a monster mining right in front of them. Titan yells for everyone to be alert, as right in front of them there are some monsters mining. The monsters realize they're there and quickly stop mining. The monsters go after them. Titan yells for them to use the same strategy as always. He would stay in front, being the shield of the team, while Autumn controls everyone who was there. Liddy would focus on healing, while the rest of the team is responsible for eliminating the monsters. The battle begins, and the monster hits Titan, causing little damage, a total of 79. Zhang is impressed with the strength of the monsters because, at a quick glance, it seems to be little damage, but Titan's defense is really incredible. Being able to lower his life, even a little, is just something fantastic. Right after that, Titan uses his ability to give armor to everyone, while Autumn pushes the monsters away with her magic. Titan warns everyone to be careful not to let them get too close, as their damage is quite high. Autumn continues using his magic to help everyone. He manages to trap and attack at the same time, causing a total of 2,031 damage to the two monsters. The Dragon King takes the opportunity and advances for the attack, hitting one of the frozen monsters, causing 399 damage. Yueng also advances, using her Light Slash ability, striking the monsters three times quickly, causing a total of 3,871 damage. However, the monsters were still standing. Zhang begins to summon his beasts again, but he thinks that for now, he would avoid summoning the Blackfin boss, as monsters that use magic have low defense. And if the Blackfin is killed there, it would be a considerable loss for his beast army. The monsters that were there, frozen, managed to break free and quickly go after the Dragon King, landing a blow on him, causing a lot of pain and good damage, totaling 496 damage. The Dragon King complains that it hurts a lot. Autumn shouts that he doesn't understand what's happening, as his freezing spell should last 60 seconds. But the monsters manage to get out before that. He asks if the monsters could have some kind of resistance to this type of spell. Zhang thinks that the spell Autumn used is rank A, and even so, it still wasn't enough to hold the monsters for a considerable time. This surprises him. While the Dragon King was trying to defend himself from the monster, he turns and shouts for Liddy to heal him, as fast as she can, as he was starting to lose the fight. Zhang, seeing this, thinks they need to improve their weapons and equipment as soon as possible, because if they don't, their abilities would be the same as trash on the next floors. Liddy begins to use her healing magic. Zhang also calls some of his healers and asks them to help the Dragon King. With this, the Dragon King manages to hold firm in the fight against the monster. Yue Ying takes the opening and jumps to attack, using her Light Slash ability again, causing huge damage to the monster, defeating it instantly. She looks back as the monster dies and says that they finally defeated the monsters, but there was still one attacking Titan, who was already with less than half of his life, as he was holding all the blows one after another. He screams asking for help and asks his team to attack the monster as fast as they can. Zhang looks at this and calls the frog, takes his bow and says that now it was their turn. The two attack the monster, causing an explosion and throwing the monster away. The Dragon King and Yuying run away not to be hit. As soon as the explosion passes, everyone attacks the last monster at the same time, killing it without difficulty. The monster dies, leaving the orbs on the ground. The whole team gathers. Zhang bends down to check the orbs, while Titan says they underestimated the strength of the monsters on the sixth floor. With this battle, he fears they won't be able to get past the sixth floor boss. He suggests they stay there for a while, killing the smaller monsters and improving their battle skills before taking the next step. Zhang says that the common monsters of this floor already had high damage and a large amount of life. Based on this, 
He can't even imagine how terrifying the sixth floor boss is. While they were there talking about what they should do, Titan hears a noise. He quickly looks back to see what it is and realizes that there were more monsters there. He shouts for everyone to be alert again, as the monsters have returned. Quickly, the monsters attack again, starting another fight. Quickly, Autumn controls them. The Dragon King begins his attack right after, as the freezing wouldn't hold them for long, but this time it was worse than before. The monsters broke free with extreme ease. With this, they managed to catch the Dragon King off guard and end up landing a counter blow on him, throwing him back. Zhang tries to provide cover for the Dragon King and uses the Death Butcher to attack the monsters, and it really works. The Dragon King manages to retreat behind Titan. He complains of pain and says he can't do this anymore and wants to go back to the fifth floor. Titan asks everyone not to be discouraged as he has heard that it is common for adventurers to get stuck there for a month, fighting against the smaller monsters. Lydia is shocked when she hears that they would stay there for a month. Yue Ying goes over to Zhang and asks what he was looking at so intently. He replies that he just discovered something that could help them defeat the monsters more easily. Yue Ying is impressed by this and asks what he had discovered. Zhang asks if they hadn't noticed anything in common among the monsters. He begins to explain that all of them were carrying the same thing, and those things were candles. Yue Ying looks at the monsters to confirm this and points at them, saying that Zhang was correct. They all had candles. She asks if they use them to see things better. Zhang looks at a monster that was running towards them and says that's exactly it. He takes his bow and aims at the monster. Zhang says that in the other fight, he accidentally knocked off one of the monster's candles. Right away, the monster stopped attacking and started walking in circles. He fires his arrow, saying that the candles are the weaknesses of the dog-headed monsters, and he would prove it now. His arrow pierces one of the candles, cutting it in half. At that moment, the monster stops advancing and becomes desperate, looking for the light of the candle on its head. Yue Ying is surprised, and says it's true. With that, the monster seems unable to see anymore. The Dragon King smiles and says that the candles really are their weaknesses. He tells Zhang that he did a great job, as always. The Dragon King takes advantage of the fact that the monster Zhang used as an example was blind and attacks the monster, landing a very strong blow on its head, causing 2,231 damage to the monster. Yue Ying advances soon after, using her ability again, causing high damage as well. With that, the monster was killed with extreme ease. The Dragon King, who was previously discouraged and demotivated, now smiles seeing the dead monster. With this, the whole team is happy. Titan says that after they get past this floor, he wants to meet Zhang in life outside the magical realm, because what he was doing for the team was something they had never seen. A fighter being so versatile. Zhang is able to contribute to the attack, defense, healing, and even strategies for the team. Liddy is excited about this and asks them to meet at the last restaurant they went to because she loves the fish from that restaurant. Zhang just looks at her with crossed arms. Zhang turns to Titan and says to leave that meeting for another time as he still had a bounty on his head. He stresses that he is afraid that his real identity will spread and with that, he will bring problems to everyone around him. Titan apologizes and says that he had forgotten that small detail for a moment. He agrees with Zhang and says they would talk about it later, as they first had some things to sort out. While Yue Ying and the Dragon King were looking at the rewards, Zhang was looking at his new monster. He thinks that according to the Magical Realm Guide, on the sixth floor, there is a special mine where the boss is located. He is the owner of the mine with a dog head. Zhang takes a look at the boss's statistics, which in his system was saying that the boss's level is 1, experience 1, life 56,000, damage 1,220 to 2,050, defense 3,500, skill, dynamite explosion. Titan tells the whole team that they were now clear about the weakness of the dog-headed miners. With that, all battles would be much easier from now on. He asks everyone to act quickly and always give their best, so they would look for the sixth floor boss as soon as possible. Everyone smiles and agrees with that. They continue to advance deeper and deeper into the mine. Suddenly they come across a huge cavern. A noise comes from inside. They stop in front of the entrance. Zhang says that this is probably the cave where the boss lives. The Dragon King smiles and says they finally found it. He calls everyone to enter and take a look inside. Titan goes in front of them and asks again for everyone to be twice as careful. 
as the boss is extremely stronger than the monsters they had faced so far, in addition to having a very powerful ability called Dynamite Explosion. He stresses that it's not just high damage, but it also causes dizziness in those hit, so they must be more careful than ever. As they enter deeper into the cave, they spot another group fighting against the sixth floor boss. The boss's life was almost at its end, which impresses Titan's group. Zhang says that it seems they were one step behind, as there was already a team fighting the boss before them. They look to the side and see a red-haired woman leaning against the cave wall. Liddy asks how she was already there. The woman looks at Liddy and says, She was wondering who was making all that noise, but it seems it's Miss Liddy. This woman's name is Celestial Fairy. She continues mocking and says that the magical realm is really too small, as she didn't expect to find Miss Liddy there. She asks if Liddy's family has managed to pay off all the debt she had made. Liddy gets angry and yells at the fairy, asking how she can be such an arrogant person. She stresses that although her family rejected a parvenu like the fairy, she had no right to talk to her like that. The fairy smiles and continues mocking, saying that she is very rich. The group of fighters fighting the boss are her subordinates. The fairy asks Liddy to take a good look at the group, fighting to see how strong they were, while Liddy's group looked like a bunch of incompetents. Liddy gets angry again and tells the fairy to shut up and curses her as filthy. She shouts that her companions are not subordinates, but her friends. Zhang turns to the rest of the group and asks who this woman arguing with Liddy is, as it seems there are many resentments between the two. Yue Ying says that it seems to be someone Liddy knows in the real world, but it doesn't seem like they need to intervene in this situation. The Dragon King smiles and asks them to stay calm, as if Liddy needed help she would speak up without any doubt. The two continue arguing. The gunman from before approaches the two, calling the fairy. He says that the boss would soon be defeated. He asks her if she knows these adventurers who were there. The fairy shouts and points to Liddy and says that she does know her. She would never forget the person who humiliated her in every possible way. The fairy says it was because of Liddy that she swore to recover all the honor she had lost. The fairy starts talking to Liddy's whole team and asks them to leave her and join the fairies team. She promises to pay a million a month to each of them, not to mention that everything the boss drops would be theirs. Liddy starts to tremble with anger at this. The Dragon King shouts at the fairy to save her dirty money, as he might be poor, but he would never abandon or betray a friend. Titan agrees with the Dragon King and says he doesn't know exactly what happened between the two in the past, but now they were friends with Liddy, and there is no money in the world that can buy that. The fairy says they are all just fools, but if they want to be poor with Liddy, it's fine. But she just wanted to make it clear that the boss of this floor was only hers. The Dragon King gets furious at this and shouts that she doesn't own the magical realm, so she has no right to do such a thing. The gunman points his gun at the Dragon King, but the Dragon King continues saying that it's wrong and says he's not afraid of them, so they could look up. Zhang touches his shoulder and says that the gunman was covered in S-grade Gauss equipment. How could they defeat someone like that? The fairy smiles and tells the gunman that he's very good. The gunman tells Zhang that if he already knows he can't defeat him, then they should all leave quietly. The Dragon King asks Zhang why he intervened like that. Zhang tells them not to worry, as he found a better way to deal with everyone there. Titan asks what that way would be. The first group of adventurers continues to fight against the sixth floor boss and is almost finishing the job. However, in the midst of all that fight, Zhang quietly shoots an arrow. This arrow destroys one of the bomb barrels that were around. A great explosion occurs, leaving the fairy frightened. She screams and asks what was happening. Zhang keeps at it and attacks other barrels nearby, causing another explosion. The explosions start becoming a problem, hitting the adventurers fighting the floor boss. They begin to run away from the explosions. The fairy shouts at them as they run, wanting them to come back immediately to finish off the boss. Liddy looks at all this and laughs heartily at the havoc Zhang is causing on his own. The Dragon King looks at Zhang and says he did a great job. The fairy hears this and points a finger at Zhang, asking if he really did that. She becomes very angry and calls him poor. Meanwhile, the boss was low on health, but everything starts shaking. Yuang screams, asking what was happening, as the whole cave was collapsing. The Titan tries to calm everyone, asking them to stay calm. Suddenly, the adventurers fighting the boss realize the ground is splitting and try to jump away. The fairy and the gunslinger start falling too. As they hit the ground, the gunslinger is fine, but the fairy fell awkwardly and struggles to move. Normally she screams for help, but as she manages to get up, she looks up and sees countless monsters staring at them. 
The gunslinger says there are too many monsters there and that they are completely surrounded. The monsters start advancing. The fairy shouts at the gunslinger to do something, as if they died there. They would die for real, and she didn't want that. The monsters keep coming and are getting closer. The gunslinger looks at the fairy and says, Unfortunately, there was nothing he could do as there were too many monsters. He yells that he didn't want to die either and uses a random teleportation scroll, leaving her alone with the monsters. She can't believe it and screams that he was an ungrateful bastard. The monsters finally get close enough and jump to attack her, and she can do nothing but close her eyes and scream in fear. However, at the last second, Autumn manages to freeze all the monsters with her magic. The fairy is left baffled by what was happening, as she was expecting death. As she looks up, she sees everyone from Liddy's team there. Liddy says hi to her. The fairy starts begging for help, pleading desperately. Liddy says she would love to save her, but they were very poor. Liddy asks the fairy to give five million to each of them. The fairy screams, asking if it was really five million for each, because that was a lot of money. Liddy turns around and crosses her arms, saying that if that's too much money for her, then they would leave. The fairy, seeing she had no other choice, agrees to this desperately and screams, saying she would get Liddy's bank details and ask her butler to make the transfer. But they needed to get her out of there quickly. Liddy smiles and begins to use her magic, saying that since Miss Fairy is so generous, they would help with the rope. They managed to get her out before the monsters thaw. Ten minutes later, the transfer was made to Liddy. She smiles and says that now the fairy was free to go wherever she wanted. The fairy starts to leave and says they don't need to worry, as in the future she would remember everyone and would repay them for saving her life. The Dragon King looks at Liddy and says she really is an amazing person, as she managed to earn 35 million at once. She smiles and says, the fairy is very rich. This money in exchange for her life is nothing to her, not to mention they couldn't do it for free. Everything was very nice, but Zhang interrupts them and points downwards, asking what they were going to do with the boss that was stuck there, because if they didn't defeat it, they wouldn't be able to move forward. They decide to finish the job, but there were many smaller monsters around the boss. The Dragon King looks at Zhang and says he was the only chance they had to kill the boss, as he was the only long-range damage they had. The Dragon King says the rest of the team would descend to deal with the small monsters there, while Zhang should focus only on the boss and try to kill it as quickly as possible. Zhang agrees, and they quickly spring into action. While Zhang stays at the top, the rest of the team descends rapidly. As they descend, they say that everything would depend on Zhang now. Liddy says his last arrow was beautifully shot. At the bottom of the hole, their team forms the same formation as always. Autumn would control the approaching monsters. The Dragon King would be responsible for attracting the monsters, while Yue Ying finds an opening to attack and eliminate all the monsters. Liddy would focus on supporting and healing the team, as always. With that, they were ready to start the battle. The Dragon King looks at a monster and asks why there were so many candles on one monster's head. He starts counting and sees that there were a total of ten candles on the boss's head. Zhang says they didn't need to worry about that. He would take care of the candles. He shoots some arrows and manages to hit one candle, but the boss notices this and starts defending against the arrows using its weapon. This surprises Zhang, as he didn't imagine the boss would know to protect the candles on its head. Meanwhile, Autumn was fighting bravely. He says there were many monsters around, so he would try to freeze as many as he could to relieve some pressure on them. He begins to use his magic and freezes several monsters at once, without wasting time. Yue Ying uses her skill and starts cutting down all the frozen monsters quickly, but her damage wasn't enough to contain everything. The floor boss throws a bundle of dynamite at them. The Dragon King shouts for Yue Ying to be careful, as if it exploded on her, it could cause big problems. The explosion's damage was significant, she is scared by it. However, an arrow hits the explosives, throwing them aside. He calls one of his beasts, the Toad, and orders it to target only the boss. They both shoot at the boss together and manage to hit, causing an explosion. The Dragon King celebrates, saying that was a great job. As they continue to whittle down the boss's life, they would be able to conquer this floor as well. However, the boss gets up angry and roaring loudly. The Dragon King is shocked, as he didn't expect the boss to still have so much strength. The boss gets irritated and starts throwing several bombs one after the other. The bunny and Zhang protect themselves at the top of the hole. The Dragon King takes a good hit and starts to fall. The Titan protects him and Liddy. He asks her to heal everyone quickly, but she says it's not good for them, as the boss was starting to attack again with the bombs. The boss roars loudly with the bombs in hand. 
When the monster was about to attack, an arrow comes and hits another candle. The titan from behind says it was a precise shot and at the right time. Jang shouts for them to attack the boss as quickly as possible, as he would keep hitting the candles and trying to prevent it from igniting the bombs. Liddy starts healing her team. Yue Ying says they really need to be fast, as the boss's bombs were extremely dangerous. If they continue to delay, they could get into a huge problem. She jumps attacking the boss several times with her skill. The Dragon King gets irritated and says he doesn't care anymore. He would attack with all his strength, as either he would come out alive or the monster would. He attacks the monster with his staff with great force. The Titan continues to use his abilities to defend his team. He shouts for everyone to attack at the same time. Zhang orders his beast to attack with him. Thus, the two shoot again. The attacks begin to hit the boss, causing damage and explosions. An arrow from Zhang comes right after, finishing off the boss. The Dragon King celebrates, saying it's finally over. However, the Titan notices something strange and shouts for everyone to run, as the monster was going to self-destruct. Everyone is completely scared by this. To save his whole team, the Titan acts like a true leader and takes the lead. He jumps towards the monster and uses his shield to corner it against the wall, saying he wouldn't let this happen. Liddy and the Dragon King shout for the leader to come back, but he doesn't listen, and a huge explosion occurs. Zhang starts descending, thinking that this boss is really dangerous, as it even has self-destruction. With the explosion, a curtain of dust rises, leaving everyone unable to see clearly. They were worried because they couldn't see their leader anywhere. As the dust begins to settle a bit, they see pieces of the Titan's shield lying on the ground. Zhang finally reaches the bottom of the hole and comes face to face with the Dragon King and Yue Ying crying, as everything indicated that the Titan had been killed in the boss's explosion. Suddenly, someone starts coughing and asks why they were crying. The three who were there are surprised by this and look in the direction of the voice. As they look, they see a hand behind a pile of rocks. The hand pushes the rocks aside, and the Titan emerges, saying they don't need to cry as he was still alive. His body was injured, and his clothes destroyed, but he was okay. Quickly, everyone runs to him. Liddy was angry and worried. She scolds him, saying he was very reckless to act like that. The Dragon King says he was very scared thinking that the worst could have happened. Autumn says that if the Titan does that again, they wouldn't be friends anymore. The Dragon King helps their leader to stand up. The Titan says that unfortunately, this was a big loss, as all his equipment was completely destroyed by the force of the explosion. The monster begins to disintegrate, leaving many orbs as a reward. Among the orbs, there was an item that he had left. The Titan tells them to see what item it was. Liddy was intrigued by this. Ya Ying kneels to try to see what it was. Liddy bends down to pick it up, and says it could be a black gold ore. She says it was really different from the others they had seen before. The Dragon King asks if it's really worth more than a million. He smiles and says it's no surprise that the fairy had taken her adventurers to fight this boss. In the end, it was all for her personal profit. To everyone's surprise, Liddy takes that item in her hands and extends it towards the team leader, Titan, saying all of that was for him, as he contributed more than anyone else to this fight. Autumn agrees with this, he emphasizes that if the Titan hadn't risked his own life to save everyone there, they would be dead at that moment, especially Liddy and Autumn, as both were low-life mages. The Titan says he can't accept this alone, even though he did it. He wouldn't be a match for the monster alone. Everyone fought bravely, and so they should split everything equally among everyone. The Titan points out that the real hero there was Zhang. Besides stopping two direct bomb attacks, he managed to quickly extinguish the candles, giving everyone a chance to fight. Without him, they would all have been wiped out by the boss. Zhang tells his leader that he should accept everyone's sincerity. Moreover, all of his equipment had been destroyed, so he should take the ore to buy new equipment. The Titan accepts the ore and says that for his equipment, he would accept it. He says they should stop there for today. They would explore the seventh floor. As soon as he gets his new equipment, everyone smiles and agrees to it. They continue walking a bit more there. As they walked, Liddy approaches Jang with a smile and asks if he was going to do anything after leaving there. He replies that it's still early, so he would be free. She says that's great, winks at him, and says that she, the Dragon King and Jang should meet at the sixth floor altar to earn some extra income together. He starts to leave the magic domain and says that's a good idea. He would be out for a while, but in half an hour he would meet them at the altar. She waves to him and says it's a deal. Meanwhile at Jang's house, he was in his room sitting on his bed looking at his phone. He thinks he has half an hour until he returns to the magic domain. 
he decides to use this time to take a look and maybe buy some equipment from the trading platform. He thinks that, in addition to the five million he got from the ferry, he had also received another five million from the bunny. This should be enough for an S-grade equipment, or even two. He starts looking at the equipment and thinks that, even though he has a good amount of money, the equipment is still extremely expensive. Looking at the items, he sees a pair of boots. He thinks these boots would be perfect for the bunny. He thinks it's not fair for her to give all her money to him, even though it was her choice. He should buy things for her too, so she can be a little safer. He looks at a silver necklace. This necklace gives an additional five spirit and has an effect that permanently increases talent by 10%. The durability is 500 out of 500. He thinks this is very useful, as it would increase his talent by 10%. It seems like almost nothing. But for him, the ability to summon his beasts gains an additional monster. He buys the item without a second thought. The system notifies him that he successfully purchased two items, awaiting the seller's confirmation. After the purchases, he checks the time and realizes it's almost time to return to the sixth floor altar. So he goes back to the altar with the bunny. As soon as they arrive there, they see the Dragon King and Liddy. He asks if everyone was already there. The Dragon King asks Liddy how she was planning to make this extra income she had mentioned before. She begins to explain that they would steal from some miners. She asks the Dragon King if he remembers where he had picked up that stone the first time. He pauses for a moment to think and says he remembers perfectly, but he asks if that wouldn't be a little dangerous for them. As the last time he did that, several monsters started chasing him to the edge of the altar. Zhang thinks he was right all along. He already imagined that Liddy would try to steal ores to get more money. They start walking while Liddy says it wouldn't be dangerous, as the first time the Dragon King had gone alone. Now he would have her help to heal everyone, and Zhang's protection with the arrows extinguishing all the candles. The Dragon King agrees with that and says that if that's the case, he would be willing to try. Liddy emphasizes that she would make one thing very clear there. Everyone should believe in their fighting skills, as only those who help in the fights would earn money. The bunny says it's no problem. She wouldn't want to earn anything from them, but all the items she gets she would share only with Zhang. Suddenly, they hear some rocks falling to the ground. As they look, some monsters were coming directly towards them. Zhang starts extinguishing the candles and asks everyone to prepare for battle. The Dragon King starts advancing fearlessly as he was receiving all the healing from Liti. The bunny moves quickly behind the monster. The Dragon King gets annoyed by this and asks her to keep her antics away from him, as he wouldn't try to protect her if the monster started focusing on her. However, the bunny says he doesn't need to worry about her, as she was capable of protecting herself. She starts running around the monster quickly, leaving it confused. After that, the bunny returns to Zhang's side, smiles, and says she managed to steal quite a lot. Zhang continues aiming at the monsters and says it's not a problem. She just needs to be careful not to get hurt or put herself at risk. One of the monsters was already dead. The Dragon King says he was already finishing off the other one. He says that further ahead in this cave would be the place where he got the stone for the first time. After the end of the first battle, Liddy runs ahead shouting that they should walk quickly so they wouldn't take too long, as time is money. The Dragon King asks her to take this a little more seriously, as once they get to the place, she would see that it wouldn't be as easy as she was thinking. As they arrived at the place, Liddy becomes extremely excited and impressed, as there were several miners in several different ways. She looks at the miners and says there were many of them. She emphasizes that if they could get everything, they would become rich. The Dragon King asks if she's being deliberately stupid, he said that last time, he could only manage to carry one, and it felt like he was carrying more than 10 kilograms in his hands with just one oar. Liddy gets annoyed at this and says it's too heavy. She asks if they couldn't at least carry a few each. While the two were talking, Zhang begins to think a bit. He thinks that in the magical realm, the higher the strength attributes, the heavier the items he can carry. Now, Zhang's strength was at 16 points, and one of his punches equals about a thousand caddis. According to the Dragon King, a miner's bag would weigh at least 2,000 caddis. So, he alone cannot carry a miner's bag. He asks everyone to check their attributes and inventories so they know how much they can carry. Zhang starts speaking first. He says he can carry about 60. The Dragon King says he can carry about 50. However, he finds it difficult to walk with that weight, let alone fight with it all. Liti says all her points are focused on spirit, and that's why she can only carry 18. Zhang grabs his bow and says they need to lure one monster at a time, otherwise they'll be in danger. The Dragon King says that's a great idea, 
as he didn't want to die just for the sake of some oars. Zhang jumps, saying he would attract the monsters to them. He asks the bunny to hide somewhere where she would always be safe. She tells him she understands and says he doesn't need to worry so much about her. While one monster was mining, an arrow flies past him quickly. He turns and looks up, seeing Zhang. The monster doesn't hesitate to attack Zhang. As it lunges, the Dragon King takes advantage of the monster's lowered guard and attacks it from behind. An hour later, they had killed all the monsters they saw there. The Dragon King says it's very tiring to kill them one by one. Litty tells him not to complain anymore. They just need to endure a little longer. And once they get out with the miners, everyone would be safe for a while. She says that as soon as she sells everything, she would invite him to a party. They start collecting the ore. Liddy says they need to sell these oars quickly. The bunny tells her to stick with them. Zhang notices this and asks where she had gone. She said she had wandered around a bit and later wanted to show him something good. She's happy about it. Zhang asks what it would be. She blushes and says it's a surprise. She can't tell him yet. After they collect a good amount, they start heading back to the altar. As they arrive at the altar, Liddy says she hopes they sell these oars for a good price. The people there are astonished as the amount of ore was quite large and of high quality. Two people in the middle of the altar shouted that they were selling high-quality black gold ore for over 500,000 on the trading platform. They shout for people with stock to hurry and withdraw theirs. Liddy approaches them and says they don't have black gold ore, only common ores. He asks if they would be interested. One of the men responds that they were not interested in common ores. Liddy gets angry and asks why they wouldn't want them, as her ores could also be sold for a good value, she says they were being very inflexible. Suddenly, another man arrives at the altar. He asks how the two sellers were doing, as their young master was getting impatient with this. They say they had been shouting there for over an hour, but they had only received one so far. The man gets irritated and shouts at the two, saying that young master Chung had been stuck on the seventh floor for days and urgently needed black iron ores to forge equipment. He says that if the two of them delay young master's admission to the Qing Martial Academy, then they would pay with their lives. The two are scared by this and say they will do their best to make it possible as soon as possible. The Dragon King, seeing this, says that the other guy is very bad, as it's horrible how he threatens others. As Zhang hears this, he remembers that he had a fight against Chung at the Yunding Club. He thinks that it wasn't over yet. Now that Chung was ready to enter the eighth floor, he should hurry and get stronger than Chung. Liddy starts to leave the magical realm and says that since they couldn't sell the ores there, they would sell them directly through the platform, and as agreed before, the profit would be divided among the three of them. The Dragon King agrees with this and says he would leave too, as it was late and he still needed to make food for his father. Zhang says goodbye to both of them. As soon as the two of them leave, Zhang thinks that it really was getting late and he needed to go back home. However, the bunny approaches him a little shyly and says she wanted to send him a gift, and it was something good. She takes his hands and shows him. As he looks, he sees that she had some black gold ores. He is astonished by this, and asks where she had managed to buy these. The bunny starts to explain that while they were fighting the monsters, she was wandering around and managed to steal these from one of the monsters. She smiles and says that at first, she thought these materials were junk. She didn't imagine they were black gold. Zhang smiles too and says she's really lucky. He says she had already given him a lot of money, so she should keep these ores for herself. However, she moves closer to him and smiles, saying no. The bunny says these materials could help him quickly improve the fighting skills he had. She emphasizes that the stronger he becomes, the faster he will be able to take her to the 30th floor so she can find her father again. So she begs him not to reject this gift. He says that if that's the case, then he would accept, but he would reward her for it. She says that's perfect says goodbye to him, and says she hopes to see him tomorrow. He says he would also leave and bids her farewell. She hands the oars to him and starts to leave the magical realm. He looks at the oars in his hands, and thinks that although his weapon is of great S, it still has many skills to be improved. Its grade and damage are still very low. He thinks this could hinder him from killing bosses once he enters higher floors, and therefore he should use these oars to improve his weapon. That way it would be extremely more useful. The next day at a large hospital, a doctor attends to Zhang. He asks him to sit down. The doctor asks if his sister was okay and if she was feeling any pain. Zhang responds to Dr. Yang that he was there to acquire the permanent right to use an artificial kidney. The doctor is extremely surprised by this. He turns to Zhang 
and says that the permanent use of both artificial kidneys for his sister is a bit expensive. The total cost of this is 10 million. The doctor asks if he managed to get all that money. Zhang smiles and says he was borrowing from a friend who is richer than him. However, now he only had 7 million there. He asks the doctor if he could buy the permanent use of just one kidney for now. Within six months, he would have the money for the other kidney. The doctor says that would be perfect, but he has a small suggestion. The doctor starts to say that next month, they would have a new stock of artificial kidneys. These new kidneys were much better in terms of capacity and human compatibility. However, the costs were a bit higher. The doctor asks if he wouldn't want to wait one more month. Jang says he would wait one more month then, because he wanted to give the best of life to his sister. The doctor is happy with that. Suddenly, someone opens the door of the doctor's office. The two inside are puzzled as to why someone opened without saying anything and was coming in. This man says he had an extremely urgent matter to discuss with Dr. Yang. Quickly, the doctor taps Jang on the back and smiles, saying he could go back home, that as soon as they had any updates, he would be the first to know. Zhang looks at the doctor with a serious face and says that if anyone causes trouble for him, he just needs to ask for help, and he could take care of it. The doctor says he doesn't need to worry, as this was nothing. Zhang starts to leave, and for a moment, the two cross paths. Yang asks the man why he was in such a hurry to see him. The man calls the doctor chief and says they had a message from the HQ about an important task they needed to do in the magical realm tonight. Meanwhile, Zhang was walking inside the hospital. He thought he still didn't have the money he needed. He had to find a way to get more money to provide the best for his sister. He thinks he needs to find a way to earn more money in the magical realm. In the magical realm, seventh floor, inside the giant's cave, people were scared, saying they were killing everyone they saw. It was terrible. Yue Ying's uncle was there. He tries to calm the people, telling them not to panic. He turns around and sees that Zhang had just arrived. He says it had been a long time since they last saw each other. Zhang is surprised to see Liu there. He says he didn't know he was also on the Magical Realm Administration team. He asks if something was happening, as no one was going out to fight the monsters. The Dragon King begins to explain that out of nowhere a crazy group appeared and started killing all the adventurers they saw. This group is very strong, so normal fighters can't fight against them. Liu says that the Ministry of State Security joined forces and formed a Magical Realm Administration team to send a large number of Magical Realm fighters to maintain order. Now there are assassins on every floor targeting solo adventurers. Liu suggests that they all stay away from the Magical Realm for the next few days and come back once the problem is solved. The Dragon King says there's no way around it. It seems he has no choice but to stay out of the Magical Realm for now. Suddenly, a person is caught outside the altar. People scream that there was an assassin there. On the other side, another person is caught, and people scream again, saying there was another assassin. One of the assassins smiles while holding the sword near the face of one of the adventurers. This assassin is known as Devil. He yells at the Magical Realm Administration team, saying that's what happens when they care about their businesses. The adventurer who was captured starts screaming and panicking. They kill the two they had caught and start to disappear. Liu is angry about this and says that these people are members of the Dawn, how dare they do this in front of everyone? Liu can't take it and runs after them in anger. Yue Ying is worried about her uncle and runs after him. Zhang, seeing this, starts running after them without thinking twice. As he runs, he says that this Dawn group was really full of themselves. Zhang shouts that he wants to see what they are really capable of. The people at the altar point and shout, saying the three of them were really fearless as they left the altar to catch the assassins. Other people shouted, asking them to come back, as it was extremely dangerous, they could be running straight to their deaths. However, none of the three hesitated in the choice they made and continued to advance quickly. They reached a place that had two entrances. Liu turns around and asks why the two were coming with him. Yue Ying simply ignored the question he had asked and asked which way they should go. Liu says there's no time to think about it. They would simply enter either one of them. Liu emphasizes that the two should stay by his side at all times. The three prepare for the possible fight ahead. They begin to walk through one of the entrances. As they walked, a monster looked at them. The monster starts laughing and turns into smoke. Suddenly the devil emerges from within and says that today the three of them would be his prey. The ability the devil was using is called shape-shifting art. It is ranked A level 2, with an experience of 1,704 out of 3,000, consuming 30 points of energy, with a cooldown of 60 seconds. The effect can transform into a monster and improve all attributes by 10% for 60 minutes. 
The three notice something behind them, and quickly turn to confirm what it could be. Liu takes the lead and yells for Yue Ying and Zhang to stay behind him and be very careful, as these monsters are known as barbarian giants. They are one of the monsters from the seventh floor. Although they are slow in body and mind, they are extremely strong, and their attacks cause a lot of damage. In front of them, there were two giants. One of them was called Amit. Liu says he didn't expect there to be giants around, especially not this type. Quickly, Jang opens his system and looks at the statistics of this giant ogre. The system shows that it is a giant ogre at level 1 max 5, with an experience of 1 out of 10, 7,550 life points, 350 to 550 damage, and 700 defense. Zhang says that from what he was seeing, the abilities of the giant ogre are incredibly heavy. Liu says that's right, the silent spell of the giant ogre can seal talents. Zhang is truly amazed by this. Liu rushes towards one of the giants, catching it by surprise. As he attacked, he shouted that if they wanted to pass through there, they should clear the entire area. Seeing Liu advance, Zhang and Yue Ying also prepare to fight. Zhang takes his bow and begins to shoot his arrows, while Yue Ying quickly advances with her light-cutting ability. Zhang calls some beasts to heal his team while attacking with his bow. Liu notices that he was being healed and tells Zhang that his beasts are really incredible at healing, as the amount they can heal is excellent. With this, he advances quickly and cuts one of the giants, causing huge damage. Quickly and with some ease, they manage to defeat the giant that was alone. The three regroup. Liu says that, in a way, it was easy to deal with that one, as it was alone. Zhang says that the remaining two will not be as easy as that one, as they were together. With that, they move closer to some rocks and, analyzing the situation, Liu begins to say that these two giants are very close to each other. Fighting one would alert the other. They should focus on dealing with one giant ogre first. Although they can seal talents, their life and defense are not high. They could deal with this first before dealing with the barbarian giant. After deciding this, Liu begins to advance and yells for Yue Ying to come with him. She quickly begins to advance with him. Liu also tells Zhang that he would leave their lives in his hands. Zhang says they don't need to worry, as on his turn nobody dies. With their advance, the giant Amit notices this and yells, Enemies! The barbarian giant is on alert and shouts, Kill! preparing to hit them. With this, Amit also prepares for the fight, conjuring a spell in his hands. Amit notices Yue Ying above and decides to attack her first, using the spell he had conjured in his hands. This surprises Yue Ying, who was not expecting this attack. She was hit by the spell and screams, saying she couldn't use her light-cutting ability anymore. A system window appears for her, warning that she had been hit by the silent spell of the giant ogre and could not use her abilities for 180 seconds. Liu takes advantage of the distraction and advances with his sword, which was charged with energy. The barbarian giant sees him approaching and starts shouting, Strong enemy, kill enemy! The barbarian giant and Liu clash their weapons in the air. He shouts to Yue Ying, asking how much time was left for her to be able to use her ability again. She says there were still about 40 seconds left to be able to use her light cut, while Liu was holding the barbarian giant so he wouldn't advance. The giant Amit begins to conjure his magic again. Yue Ying shouts for her uncle to be careful, as Amit would attack again. Amit's attack comes quickly towards Liu, who cannot dodge it, as he is holding the barbarian giant. He just accepts that he will be hit. Zhang notices this and acts quickly, putting his body in front of the attack. Liu is surprised by this gesture, as Zhang stepped in front of the attack without hesitation. After having his talent sealed, Zhang turns to Liu and says that he is their team's main damage dealer, so they cannot afford to lose him. Zhang emphasizes that he attacks from a distance with his bow and arrows, so he will be able to bear the weight of the giant Amit's silent spell. Liu is even more surprised by this, as even in a situation of despair and danger, Zhang did not stop to think for a moment, not to mention his extremely fast reaction time. Zhang shouts for them to quickly attack the giant Amit, as they cannot let him attack again with his talent. The three focus their attacks on the giant and quickly deplete his life, killing him. The monster screams and falls to the ground. With that, Yue Ying goes after the other giant without fear, causing several attacks and damage to the giant. While she attacked, Liu says that now there is only one left, victory is certain. Zhang pauses for a moment and says that something seems wrong. Liu starts running to help Yue Ying and asks Zhang what he meant by that. Zhang says that there were three giants there, one more isolated and two together, blocking the passage. If the giants were still there and with full life, 
How had the assassin passed through there before? As Zhang explained the situation, he notices something and shouts for Liu to be careful, as there was a monster behind him. Liu quickly turns to see what it is. As soon as he sees the monster, he wonders what it is, as this monster was known as that. Liu wonders how it was possible to have a lizard on the seventh floor, but suddenly the lizard transforms into the devil. With that, Liu is confused and says that this is not right, as this rascal can assume another form. The devil returns to its lizard form and manages to land an attack on Liu, causing a good amount of damage. As he takes the hit, Liu screams, saying that the damage from this bastard is really high, they should be careful. The devil stops in front of him and starts laughing, saying that, unfortunately, he had realized this too late. Today all three of them would be his prey. Liu shouts for Zhang and Yue Ying to run to him as fast as possible. The three quickly regroup, each facing a different direction. Liu tells them that the assassin has transformed again into a lizard, and this is allowing his skin color to change rapidly, so he can easily camouflage himself in things, and therefore everyone there should be careful of the stealth attack. Yue Ying says that indeed the assassin is dangerous. Zhang says that unfortunately, he had no choice. Since it had come to this point, he would no longer hold back. He would show his true power. Zhang begins to call his beasts, the Toad, the Death Butcher, and the Black Fin. The devil was looking at Zhang and thinks that he is just an archer with not many attributes, so with two strikes he could kill this archer. However, he sees Zhang calling his beasts first. He sees the toad and wonders how that toad could be on the seventh floor. After that, he sees the death butcher and is impressed by it. He wonders if the archer was really summoning all these bosses. Zhang orders the toad to attack from all sides and force this cowardly assassin to reveal himself. With that, the toad begins to shoot several times from all sides and manages to hit one of the attacks, revealing the lizard. Zhang quickly sees and alerts his team that the lizard was there. He prepares to attack with his bow. He sends the death butcher to attack along with him. The two manage to hit the blow and cause a great deal of pain to the assassin. With that, he reverts to his human form and falls to the ground, in pain. The devil gets up, sweaty and wounded, and tells Zhang that he really is a very strong person and a better teammate than anyone else. So today, Zhang could say that he was lucky. The assassin begins to use a random teleportation scroll. A magic circle begins to open around him. The devil starts laughing a lot, saying that Dawn never gives up on their targets. They just have to wait and see. Liu shouts and advances, saying that this is not good because the assassin was trying to escape. However, Liu's attack was not able to hit him in time, and so he managed to escape. Liu was angry because the assassin managed to use a random teleport and escape. Yue Ying says that this assassin really was terrifying. Liu says that they are an organization that should never be underestimated. In the past, the administration team dispatched a small squad to suppress them. However, everyone who was part of that small squad simply disappeared. Liu emphasizes that all the members of that small squad were strong and capable for such a thing, but they didn't even have a chance. Yue Ying asks her uncle if Zhang was their target, then he would have to be more careful. Liu sighs and says that's exactly it. Zhang should be as careful as possible so that nothing bad happens to him. Zhang agrees with this and says he will act accordingly. The three start to return to the altar. Liu says that whoever knows where that guy went, they should quickly return to the altar and stay out of the magic domain first. They could meet and discuss things once everything calms down a bit. Zhang agrees with this and says that this is the only option they have at the moment anyway. They would need to wait a little to avoid bigger problems. Elsewhere, a portal opens and the devil appears. He sits on some rocks and opens a system window. He says that Zhang is not easy to deal with. Anyone who underestimates him will end up dead, as he is extremely strong and versatile. Therefore, he needs to report this to their boss in the team channel within the system. The devil begins to report everything that happened. He warns that Zhang's talent is summoning art. He asks everyone to be careful. Another member called Knight asks if this isn't the same guy they were looking for. The devil says yes, it was him who killed Death's Kiss. The devil emphasizes that he was not alone. He was also with two people, one called Liu Yue Ying and the other was killing the wind, Liu. Another member called Violent Blade gets angry at this because the Liu family always gets in their way. He asks their boss to let him lead a group of people to take care of this. Knight asks if Violent Blade is going crazy. Knight asks him if he knows the history of the Liu family. They are descendants of the ten founding fathers of the Great Shia. If Violent Blade dares to touch them, he will not be able to see the light of day. 
The next day, the group's boss appears and says that the Liu family is not something they can deal with at the moment, so Violent Blade should know his place. Their task is to cooperate with the main headquarters to gather information in Xia, so no one should mess things up. Everyone says they understand, and thus the conversation ends. The next day, suddenly, a large explosion occurs in the city. People start running desperately. From afar, inside their house, Zhang and his sister see this. Zhang says that the sound seems to be coming from the city wall. He asks his sister to change clothes. He was going out to take a look. His sister asks what was happening outside. Suddenly Feng sees a monster and screams to her brother that there was a devil's cave monster there. She says she was getting very scared. Zhang runs to her and tells her to calm down, that he was there, and nothing would happen to her. Quickly, the monster reaches their house, entering through the window. He shouts for his sister to run, because they would go to the emergency shelter, where they would be safe. The two start running through the streets. As they ran, several monsters were scattered throughout the city. People were screaming for help, as the monsters were invading the entire city. Zhang sees a monster approaching a little child who was alone and crouched in fear in the middle of the street. He thinks that this is not good. Quickly, he manages to pass by the monster and pick up the child in his arms, hitting the monster with a kick and throwing it aside. He shouts for his sister to come faster so they can reach the shelter as soon as possible. However, they are surrounded by three monsters. Zhang asks his sister to stay close to him with the little boy, telling her not to be afraid. He says that, to defeat all these monsters at once, he would need to use more. Suddenly, a strong blow comes out of nowhere and hits one of the monsters. A female voice is heard from afar, shouting for the monsters to try to catch her. As Zhang looks to see who it is, he realizes that it is the same woman who appeared in the enemy-occupied zone last time and also saved him. She shouts for attention. One of the monsters tries to hit her, but she manages to dodge quickly. Zhang analyzes the fight and thinks that she is really very fast. She counterattacks the monsters. Zhang realizes that besides being fast, she is also strong. The monsters scream in pain. She finishes off one of them easily, standing on top of her weapon, which was stuck in the monster's abdomen. Some other men come running to her, calling her commander. She gets off the monster and tells her men to take the monster and bring it to Professor Wu Yang. They say they will do it immediately. She starts walking and reaches Jiang. She begins to say that, as he lives there, he should run to the emergency shelter right now and only leave when the monsters retreat. He looked at her with a somewhat embarrassed look and says that everything is fine. After that, she jumps through the buildings quickly to continue containing the monsters. Feng asks her brother if he knows her, because she seems super strong. He doesn't answer and just watches her jumping through the buildings while he looks at her enchanted by her form. He asks her to give him some time, that he would quickly surpass her. The next day, the damage was great. Several buildings were broken and cracked, stones and debris were scattered on the streets. On a giant screen, a news report was saying that so far all the monsters had been eliminated. But the recent invasion by creatures from the Devil's Cave had seriously impacted transportation within the city. For safety reasons, citizens are advised to stay in their homes. Zhang was lying on his bed in his room. He was looking at his phone while thinking that the Dawn organization was killing people in the magic domain, and then there was an invasion of monsters from the Devil's Cave. He thinks it could be the Dawn organization that was linked to the Devil's Cave. He was looking at some messages on his phone. He sits on his bed and thinks that things are definitely not as simple as they seem. He should enter the magic domain tonight and find out what is really happening on the seventh floor magic domain. In the center of the altar, there were some people standing. Zhang's whole group was there standing. Suddenly, he also arrives and meets everyone. Titan says that this time the invasion was incredibly serious. He heard that more than 10,000 people died. Yue Ying says that her uncle Liu also said that the National Security Bureau and the Magical Domain Administration are taking this incident very seriously. They are currently recruiting a large number of Magical Domain Specialists. The Dragon King gets angry, saying that it's a shame he is too weak, otherwise he would definitely wipe out all the monsters. Titan turns to him and says that he is right, they should focus on getting stronger first. He says he heard that the members of the Dawn organization are no longer around, so they could figure out how to defeat the next boss now. Zhang begins to say that according to the Magic Domain Guide, only a maximum of three people at a time could fight the boss on this floor. The Dragon King doesn't understand and asks what that means. He says that only three people can fight at a time. This is ridiculous. Titan says that this is true, so they should discuss their strategy while they walk. Everyone starts walking and agrees with that. Already outside the altar, 
Titan begins to say that the cave where the boss resides only opens once every 12 hours. After the opening, only a team with a maximum of three people can enter at a time. Litty asks how they would combat this. Each of them has a necessary role to play. It's not good if they are even one person short in the team. Titan stops and says he had an idea in mind. They could split into two groups of three people. The first group would consist of himself, Autumn, and Liddy. He says he would be the tank, Autumn would be the control, and Liddy would be responsible for healing, while the second team would consist of Jang, Yue Ying, and the Dragon King. Titan says that Jang is versatile. His fish monsters can heal everyone's life. The Dragon King and Yue Ying are the main damage dealers. With the two attacking, the battle will be very efficient, so the three of them can pass this floor faster than the first group. The Dragon King pauses for a moment and says that this is definitely not bad. The bunny asks what would be left for her. Zhang puts his hand on her shoulder and says that as soon as he manages to pass, he will come back and help her pass too. She is relieved and says that if that's the case, then it's okay. Titan takes the lead and says they would need to try it this way first. The cave where the boss is located is right in front of them, so they should continue immediately. Zhang emphasizes that he understands, but they don't encounter monsters on the way there, so this means that other people were ahead of them. With that, they continue walking towards the boss's house. As soon as they arrive, they can't believe what they were seeing, as there were about 50 people in front of them, and that was a lot. Two people were near the gate. As soon as Zhang sees them, he recognizes Chung, that arrogant kid from the club. Titan begins to say that they can tell that this layman is an expert, or at least of excellent level. Layman says that today it is crucial for young Master Cheng to fight the boss of the seventh floor, so everyone should stand aside and wait. The adventurers don't like it and begin to complain that he doesn't have this right. The boss is for everyone to fight. They can fight whenever they want. He doesn't have the power to control this. After that, Layman begins to draw his sword and says that the words of this young boy should be trusted in his strength. If they do not listen to his advice, then they will not be able to complain about the consequences. Layman strikes his sword on the ground, causing a strong wind, throwing people away. Zhang is impressed by this. Titan says that this elder is really strong, they should observe everything first. Zhang agrees with that, but without them noticing, the Dragon King jumps angrily to attack Layman. The Dragon King shouts, saying that the old man is an idiot and asks him who he thinks he is to act like that. He lowers his staff with great force to hit Layman, but Layman, with just one hand, manages to defend his attack without much difficulty. Layman smiles and tells the Dragon King that he overestimates himself too much. The Dragon King steps back a bit because he lost some life. He thinks that Layman is truly strong, even though he held the blade with one hand and just defended himself, the impact was still able to lower his life. Zhang tells the Dragon King to stay calm because Layman was able to injure him with just one sword and still has another one on his back. Autumn says that Layman's skills have unforgettable depths. He doesn't even need to look to feel an attack coming from behind, which means his spirit is extremely high. Chung starts laughing and says that in the magic domain the strong always dominate the weak, so if they didn't have the ability for such things, they should just sit down and obey until they pass the boss of the seventh floor. This irritates the Dragon King a lot, so he tries to attack again, but Titan holds him back this time, shouting for him not to be impulsive. Yue Ying asks the Dragon King to listen to Titan, they should observe them first, and besides, wasn't he curious to know what they were waiting for? Zhang says that Yue Ying was right, because Layman is really strong, but they are still not fighting the boss. Chung asks Layman when the smaller monster would be there, as they had been waiting for half an hour. Layman tells Chung to be patient. This smaller monster does not have a defined regeneration time. However, as soon as it appears, the cave door will open, and they can enter immediately to deal with the boss. Liddy is a bit confused and asks what this smaller monster would be, what kind of monster it would be, and why they were waiting. A man who was there smiles and says that Liddy is a silly girl. This should probably be her first time there. He begins to explain that the boss's door on this floor is usually closed, only opening when the smaller monster comes to deliver food to the boss. Zhang adds that since the legger monster's regeneration time is not fixed, this means they can fight the boss depending on their luck. The man behind them says that's exactly it, that's why Layman is forced to occupy this place. After hearing this, Zhang says he had an idea. Yue Ying asks what it would be. Suddenly a monster comes with a plate of meat in its hand. As people start to see the monster, they begin to shout for everyone to move away. As soon as Layman and Chung finish with the monster, it will be their turn. The smaller monster continues to advance with a pork plate in hand. Chung points to the monster, 
asking if it was the smaller giant. The doors open, and they can enter immediately and defeat the boss. Layman says that's right. Very soon he could enter the eighth floor. Suddenly, an arrow comes towards the monster, defeating it. Chung shouts, as he would not be able to fight the boss that way. Chung turns around and asks Chung if he was going crazy, because he had attacked the smaller giant. Until he defeats the boss, he will never have a chance. Zheng says he doesn't care if he can fight the boss today, but he must take down this smaller giant. Chung gets angry and asks if Zheng is a lunatic. How dare he cause trouble for him like this? He takes a crossbow in his hand and points it at Zhang. With that, Zhang begins to say that Chung did not want to let them fight the boss, so they would not let anyone else in. Zhang says he wants to see who can waste more time there. The Dragon King agrees with that, and says that if they were upset, they could come at them. Titan says that Zhang is right. Besides, he is part of the team, so if things go down, everyone will fight. Chung starts screaming and says he will show how strong he really is, but before he goes up, Layman tells him he should not fight anyone. Cheng is a bit confused as to why. Layman explains that recently Dawn caused major problems in the magic domain, and so the domain's management team and the National Security Bureau are still conducting investigations. If someone dies in there, it would probably be a big problem, not to mention that Chung's family would have big problems because of it. After that, Chung screams again, telling them that they were lucky today, but he emphasizes that as long as he can't defeat the boss, no one else will fight, so everyone there will just wait. Zhang asks people not to worry because, even if he kills the smaller giant, he could still make everyone fight the boss. Chung starts laughing and says that Zhang is a complete arrogant. How will everyone fight the boss? Chung asks him to wait until next year. Maybe then what he says will come true. Another smaller giant appeared. Zhang killed it again. Everyone stands there looking at it while the monster dies again. This drives Chung crazy with anger. He shouts that he will remember Zhang, and when things calm down, he will demand retribution. Layman tells Chung that now that the smaller giant is dead, it will take another time for it to regenerate again, so they should go back and rest for a while. After a while, they would return to the magic domain. As soon as the smaller giant comes back to life, Layman promises that as soon as it happens, the boss will be his. Chung says it was unfortunate for them to encounter fools like these. Chung tells two of his men to stay there while he and Layman go out for a short break. People sigh and start saying they would also leave, as no one knows how long it will take for them to pass. Zhang raises his finger and tells everyone that he had already said he would let everyone fight the boss. He asks them to wait just a moment. People start getting irritated and say that he had already killed the smaller giant earlier. It would take at least four to five hours for it to regenerate, and after that, Chung would already be back, so they would be unable to fight the boss again. They say that everyone there knew he had only spoken here to try to comfort the people there. One of them turns around and says that instead of standing there wasting time, he would rather fight some common monsters, collect some demon soul beads, and make some money. The two guys who were there say that that group of idiots doesn't know what's good for them, as they even dared to oppose Boss Chung. The other man says they did it for their own dignity after losing their lives, but they still couldn't fight the boss. Titan turns to Jang and says he definitely admired his act, but he still didn't understand why he did it. Zhang just smiles and says he will answer that question right now. He begins to call a beast, and the smaller giant begins to appear, shocking everyone. Yue Ying smiles and says she now understands his plan. The Dragon King also smiles and says they are so stupid they forgot that Zhang's talent was summoning art. Finally, he understood. He says that, as always, Zhang was smart and one step ahead of everyone. Zhang orders the smaller giant to open the cave doors. With that, the smaller giant starts walking towards the cave door. People are amazed by this. As soon as the smaller giant reaches the door, they begin to open. People turn around frightened, shouting and asking what the hell was happening with the doors. With the doors open, the Dragon King says it's thanks to Zhang's intelligence. Yue Ying begins to say that as soon as the battle ends, they will return and have their disagreement. They begin to enter the boss's cave. Inside, a two-headed giant was sitting. He notices there were three people there and looks directly at them. The Dragon King quickly jumps to attack, shouting for the boss to meet his death. Yue Ying tells the Dragon King to be more patient. The boss's two heads begin to argue with each other. One of them asks where the food was, as he was hungry. The other shouted, saying the horned head was an idiot, that there was no food because there were intruders there. The horned head says the idiot was him. They should kill the intruders right away. While they argued, the Dragon King managed to hit one of the heads. It screams that it hurts a lot. 
The other head shouts to attack the intruder. The boss grabs a giant axe that scares the Dragon King, as it was really huge. The Dragon King manages to dodge the attack directly, but he is still hit by the impact on the ground. Zhang is impressed by this and says the boss is really strong. They should be careful with that. Zhang calls his monsters to heal the Dragon King while Yue Ying fights him, but she can't cause much damage to him. Suddenly, the boss manages to grab one of Yue Ying's legs, leaving her frightened. The boss holds her up and then slams her to the ground with great force, causing a cloud of dust. The Dragon King runs screaming that he will help her, but the boss uses her body to hit the Dragon King, causing a shock between the two. Yue Ying starts bleeding, unable to do anything to free herself. If you enjoyed this video, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell icon, and like the video. Thank you.